Section number 58, A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book Number 8, Chapter 14, Part 1, Spheres of Action, Bigamy. From an early period, the Church assumed jurisdiction over marriage, derived from the function of the priest for its due celebration, and when, in the twelfth century, matrimony was erected into a sacrament, its control became absolute. Monogamy was a distinguishing feature of Christianity, and marriage was declared to be insoluble. The sacrament could be enjoyed but once during the life of both spouses, and its repetition was invalid, all of which naturally came within the province of the episcopal courts. The infraction of the ecclesiastical law, however considered as an offense against society, was subject to secular penal statutes, and, under Partius, it was punishable with regulation to an island for five years and confiscation for the benefit of children, to which penalties Juan I, in this Cortes de Briviesca, in 1387, added branding in the face. In 1532, the Cortes de Segovia petitioned to have it made a capital offense, which Charles V refused, but added half confiscation, and in 1548, the Cortes of Valladolid substituted the galleys in term for which Philip II, in 1566, defined as ten years with public vernusia. Thus, there was ample provision for the trial and punishment of the offense by the spiritual and secular authorities, and there was no necessity for the assumption of jurisdiction by the Inquisition. Presumably, it obtained a foothold through the laxity of the marriage tie among Moors and Jews, so that bigamy, like abstinence from pork and wine and change of linen on Saturday, created a suspicion of hearsay. This showed itself first in Aragon. As early as 1486, the Saragossa Tribunal burnt in effigy the fugitive Dionys Guinot, a notary, for marrying a second wife during the lifetime of the first. A number of other cases followed in which bigamy is conjoined with Judaic practices. For simple bigamy, the penalty seems to have been perpetual prison the punishment indicated for two culprits in the auto of February 10, 1488. It also involves confiscation for a letter of Ferdinand, October 22, 1502, to his receiver at Saragossa, orders him to deliver at certain parties 94 head of cattle confiscated on the bigamous Dorman Morale. In some way bigamy was construed as hearsay for in the Barcelona auto of February 3rd, 1503, Père de Centillonia was required to abjure for marrying two wives, and that in the July 2nd of the same year, Père Ubac abjured for marrying in Rhodes and in Barcelona. This was one of the grievances of the Catalans, which they thought to remove in the Concordia of 1512, where it was agreed that bigamist, male and female, should be tried by the ordinaries and not by the Inquisition, but they unwarily allowed the insertion of a provision, unless they become erroneously as to the sacrament of matrimony or suspect in the faith. As for this practically left it to the discretion of the inquisitors, Inquisitor General Mercadier, in his instructions of 1514, was safe in telling the tribunals that they were not to try cases of bigamy unless there was presumption of erroneous belief as to the sacrament, 
and this was the answer sent in 1515 to the Sicilians when they made complaint of inquisitorial abuses. Leo X, when in 1516 confirming the Concordia of 1512 in the bull Pastoralis Officii, was careful to make the same reservation, but in this, as in everything else substantially gained by the Concordia, the subjects of the crown of Aragon found themselves deceived, and when the Cortes, about 1530, complained that the inquisitors assumed jurisdiction over bigamy, the curt answer was that they observed the provisions of the law. A case occurring in 1513 suggests ample justification for this struggle to prevent the Inquisition from acquiring cognizance of bigamy. In 1477, Don Jordi de Bardaxi betrothed himself by words de presente to Leonor Olinza, but, learning that she was pregnant or had borne a child, he never married her in the face of the church or consummated the marriage. He remained single, but she, in 1497, married Antonio Ferrer. In some way, the Sarasoga Tribunal got wind of the betrothal twenty years previous and prosecuted her in 1513. In her defense, she alleged that Pardaxi had previously been married to Donna Juana de Luna, whereupon the tribunal commenced proceedings against him for the betrothal in 1477, and would have thrown him into the secret prison had he not been too infirm. He was a man of consideration and appealed for protection to Ferdinand, who ordered that he should not be arrested, that every care be taken to culminate perjured testimony, and that, on conclusion of the case, the papers be sent to Inquisitor General Mercadier. The result is unknown, but Bardaxi was at least exposed to the terrors of an inquisitorial trial on a vague assertion of an indiscretion committed thirty-six years before. Whether there was any formal opposition in Castile, it would be impossible to say. There was a decided assertion of escopial jurisdiction in the Council of Seville, held in 1512 by Archbishop Deza, the former Inquisitor General, which opposed a fine of 2,000 Maravides on bigamists, in addition to the penalties provided by law. Long absence of a missing spouse was not to be accepted as an excuse, and the death must be notorious or be duly proved before the ordinary, before he could permit a second marriage. Still, there was no special reclamation on the subject by the Cortes of Valladolid in 1518, nor any provision in the reform attempted through the Chancellor Jean le Sauvage. As in Aragon, the question turned theoretically upon the presumable hearsay of the bigamist. About 1534, Arnaldo Albertino devoted an elaborate discussion to the matter, but all this was academical rather than practical. In 1537, Dr. Giron de la Soya, in his inspection of Toledo, reported that he had found everywhere many bigamists. They were so numerous that the inquisitors prosecuted them without distinction as to belief, and he suggested that special orders should be accordingly issued as the offense was so evil and so frequent. This would have been superfluous, Symmachus admits that, if the culprit says that he knew that he could not have two wives, and thus did not err in the faith, it would seem that the Inquisition was estopped from proceeding. But custom had prevailed, though it would appear wiser to leave them to the episcopal courts. In a later work, however, he says that the Inquisition prosecutes them as thinking wrongly of the sacrament and impiously abusing it. Thus it became settled, and otherwise the Inquisition would have been obliged to abandon its jurisdiction for about 1640. An experienced inquisitor tells us that the accused never admitted hearsay, 
but always professed consciousness of guilt. He was always asked whether he regarded a bigamous marriage as lawful, and, if he answered in the affirmative, he was to be punished as a heretic. To keep up this fiction, the formal accusation by the fiscal asserted hearsay or at least suspicion at first in a simple form but subsequently with much amplification stigmatizing the accused as an apostate heretic or at least gravely suspect in the faith for thinking ill of the holy sacrament of matrimony and its institution and adopting the error of the heretics against the prohibition of polygamy with the same view he was always required to abjure for subsistion of hearsay in the earlier time de venemy but later de levy the flimsiness of the pretext however is exposed by the fact that in the suprema bigamy cases were always considered in the afternoon sessions at which assisted the two lay members of the council of castile and where public pleas and other secular matters were discussed still when the jurisdiction once was acquired it was asserted to be exclusive and was defended with customary aggressiveness the civil magistrates were unwilling to surrender their immemorial cognizance of the crime and assumed that it was mitzi forti leaving to frequent collisions the tenancy with which these contests were conducted is illustrated in a sardinia case in 1658 where the royal court arrested michel fori for bigamy when the inquisitors heard of this they demanded the accused and the papers but three hours after the demand was made fiori was paraded through the streets of cagliari receiving two hundred lashes and was sent to the galleys the indigent tribunal refused conference and compensia and promptly excommunicated the vigueur and his assessor then the quarrel was transferred to madrid where the suprema and the council of aragon alternately for two years pelted the king with consultas the former assuming that the crime was purely one of faith and that the jurisdiction of the inquisition was exclusive there could be no compensia because the inquisitor general was a sole judge of what constituted cases of faith in october sixteen fifty nine the king ordered the excommunication of his judges to be lifted the suprema replied that it had commanded this in the previous february but the inquisitors had given reasons for not obeying it had repeated the order in august and presumed that it had been complied with but it had not been and in november the king reiterated his commands he decided however as usual in the favor of the inquisition and the judges were summoned to surrender the prisoner and the papers but they replied that fiori had escaped from the galleys and that the papers had been sent to spain the suprema regarded this as an evasion and the utmost it would do was to suspend the excommunications for six months at a time especially as the offending judges refused to present themselves before the tribunal and beg for absolution the time-honored episcopal jurisdiction over begamy was treated with similar imperiousness in sixteen fifty the suprema ordered the valencia tribunal to demand from the ordinary the case of joanna arras charged with bigamy because it was a matter of faith pertaining exclusively to the inquisition so in sixteen fifty eight when the bishop of salamanca arrested domino moreno on the same charge as soon as the valedoid inquisitors heard it they claimed and obtained and tried him yet notwithstanding this the episcopal authority over the sacrament of matrimony was acknowledged and in all sentences there was a clause referring to the ordinary the question as to the validity of the marriages the roman inquisition was less aggressive than the spanish 
for while it claimed jurisdiction, it was willing that bigamy should be regarded as mixi forti between the secular, the spiritual, and the inquisitional tribunals. If the civil magistrate was the first to take action, he could carry a case to its conclusion and punish the delinquent according to the municipal law. But the episcopal ordinary or the inquisitor ought to demand the culprit for examination as to his belief in the sacrament and then after making him a juror and imposing appropriate penance return him to the secular court offenders were treated with somewhat greater severity than in spain the abjuration was always divinity and torture was freely employed for intention. The penalty was the galleys. Five years in ordinary cases and seven or more when justified by circumstances. End of section 58. Recording by Linda Ray Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 59, A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book Number Eight, Chapter Fourteen, Part Two, Spheres of Action, Bigamy. In Spain, as we have seen, the secular laws provided penalties, but these were disregarded by the Inquisition, when it secured exclusive jurisdiction, and in practice the tribunals exercised a wide discretion. Ordinarily, men were punished with one or two hundred lashes and from three to five years of galleys at the oar, though these of gentle blood were exempt from scourging and were sent to presidios or to military service in the galleys. The Seville Auto of May 13, 1565, may be taken as an example where there were fourteen bigamists. Ten of them were scourged with an aggregate of seventeen hundred lashes, and five, in addition, were sent to the galleys with an aggregate of twenty-nine years. A woman had two hundred lashes with prohibition to leave Seville for ten years, and two others were paraded in Vergenza. The other heaviest punishment was that of the bachelor Crisobel de Ordaz, a physician who was fined in two hundred ducats, provided that this did not exceed half his property, he suffered two hundred lashes and was sent to the galleys for six years irremissibly, after which he was banished for life with a threat of perpetual galleys in case of infraction. Full allowance was made for extenuating circumstances. If husband or wife had been absent for years and reasonable effort had been made to ascertain their fate, or false news of death had been received, the accused was acquitted or the penalty reduced. This is illustrated in the case of Anton de Cuba, a peasant of Simpo Zulus, before the Toledo Tribunal in 1606. Both his wives were of his native place. He left it for a while, and on his return found his first wife absent. Then news came of her death in the hospital of Anton Martin in Madrid. He went there and verified it, returning with a certificate, on the strength of which, and of public notoriety, four years afterwards a license for a second marriage was granted. Then the first wife returned, and he was placed on trial. All this was carefully verified, and the case was suspended. There can, indeed, be little doubt that honestly misguided bigamists fared better at the hands of the Inquisition than they would have done in the secular courts, while the thorough organization of the tribunals enabled it to collect evidence through the land, whether for severity or mercy, 
in a matter impossible to either the civil or episcopal authorities its unwearied perseverance was sometimes severely taxed in the case of soldiers removed from post to post and it's fairly illustrated in that of joseph antonio ferro a private in the regiment of castile accused in seventeen sixty three to the barcelona tribunal his corpse shifted its quarters and he was transferred to the regiment del rey his movements were followed up for years the tribunals of barcelona seville and valladolid were successfully employed on the case and in seventeen sixty nine that of madrid was charged with its conduct discretion could be used to sharpen as well as to mitigate penalties as may be seen in the case of the most accomplished bigamist in the records antonio who appeared in the Valladolid Auto of October 4, 1579. He confessed promptly and freely that within ten years he had married fifteen wives. It was the profession by which he earned a livelihood, for he wandered through the land marrying and running away with whatever he could secure. He must have been a most plausible scamp, for his favorite device was to personate someone who had disappeared, after gathering information sufficient to enable him to maintain the deception. This plan he repeated eleven times, in some cases establishing claims to considerable property. His sentence was to appear in the auto with a mitra bearing the insignia of all the fifteen marriages, usually the figure of a woman for each two hundred lashes and the galleys for life in view of the latter clause it seems slightly superfluous to remit to the ordinary as usual the question as to which of the women he should live with as the eighteenth century advanced the inquisitional claim to exclusive jurisdiction was called in question in the new granadian case of alberto maldonado of santa fe de bogota the accolade resisted the interference of the inquisition with his prosecution of the culprit the matter was brought before the royal audiencia which decided in favor of the tribunal on grounds of expediency appeal was made to the home government resulting in a decree february fifteenth seventeen fifty four to the effect that bigamy was mixi forte and that cognizance belonged to the jurisdiction taking first action. Against this the Suprema presented a consulta, March 18th, but to no purpose. The decree was enclosed to all viceroys in a royal cedula, commanding that in no case should a compensia be admitted, for no custom could prevail against the regalias without the royal consent. If the Inquisition desired to take action for the suspicion of hearsay involved, it could do so after the culprit had served out the punishment imposed by the royal courts. The Inquisition was irrepressible, and, in spite of these positive commands, a compensia arose in New Granada, which induced Carlos III to reconsider the questions. Consultas were called for and were presented by the Suprema in April 1765, and by the Council of Indies in April 1766, resulting in a decree of July 21, 1766, by which Carlos restored the exclusive jurisdiction of the Inquisition. This was sent to the viceroys September 8, and we find it ordered to be duly obeyed in Mexico by the Marquis de Croix, February 26, 1767. Carlos soon saw reason to change his views. The auditor de la Guerra had tried and sentenced an invalid soldier, when the Inquisition interposed and demanded the papers. This aroused him to a sense of the incongruity of the position, and he ordered the royal council to consider the matter. It presented an unanimous report january tenth seventeen seventy in conformity with which he decreed february fifth 
that the case belonged exclusively to the Auditoria de la Guerra. He utilized the occasion, moreover, by adding that he had ordered the Inquisitor General to instruct Inquisitors that, in cases of this kind, they must observe the laws of the kingdom and not embarrass the royal judges in matters appertaining to them, but must limit the use of their facilities strictly to hearsay and apose and not dishonor the royal vassals by arrests without manifest preliminary proof. All the royal tribunals were ordered to try and punish bigamists according to the laws and to be zealous in preventing any contravention of the decree. This was a bitter rebuke, suddenly resented by the Inquisition. There were many pending cases in the tribunals, and they forthwith suspended proceedings. This led to a royal letter of September thirtieth, 1771, in which authority was granted to proceed with all cases not on trial in the royal courts, and all that might be denounced to the Inquisition, but subject to the condition that, when the culprit was not redu de fait, through belief that bigamy is lawful, sentence could not be rendered or punishment be inflicted, but that the case should be then handed over to the courts having jurisdiction. Although this conceded only the power of trying without convicting, it was an entering wedge which the Suprema lost no time in turning to an advantage, by stimulating denunciations and making the people believe that it still held jurisdiction. In the Edict of Faith for 1772, therefore, bigamy was included, with the cautious formula, so that the Holy Office may prevent the offenses against God committed in this crime. The royal decree was sent around to the tribunals, with instructions that, when denunciations were received, care was to be taken to see that the accused was not on trial elsewhere. In that case he was to be regularly tried and convicted and made to appear in an auto particular with the insignia of bigamy and double-knotted halter indicating scourging. He was to be made to abjure and be remanded to prison for two or three weeks of penance, and then be handed over to the secular court, so that his subsequent punishment may have the appearance of being merely the execution of a sentence by the tribunal. While these devices doubtless had the effect designed, the offensive decree of 1770 remained in force and was a standing humiliation which the Suprema strove earnestly to remove. In 1777 it presented a memorial representing that the decree was printed and sold and published in the journals, causing infinite prejudice to religion and giving immense impulse to profligacy and infidelity. It debarred the Inquisition from acting in any cases save those of hearsay and apose and even in these it could make no arrests unless guilt was conclusively proved. Since that year, it says, how many have abandoned themselves to solicitation, sorcery, and other crimes, believing themselves secure from the Inquisition? How many have allowed themselves to utter propositions impious or heretical, believing that, even when denounced, they could not be arrested until their offences were frugally proved, a thing which could rarely or ever happen. It is in vain that the Inquisition publishes its yearly edict of faith. The impression produced by the cedula is uneffaced, and it ought to be called in and suppressed. The appeal led to a royal declaration of September 6, 1777, to the effect that the cedula of 1770 did not impede the jurisdiction of the Inquisition in cases of which cognizance was reserved to it. As to bigamy, the offense was partitioned between three jurisdictions. The deceit of the women and the injury of offspring were subjected to the secular courts. The validity or invalidity of the marriage to the 
episcopal courts and hearsay as to the sacrament when it existed to the inquisition the three jurisdictions should cooperate by each imposing the penalties belonging to it and delivering the culprit from one to another in order that his offensives might be verified this subdivision of a crime into three was too clumsily scientific to be reduced to practice in appearance it only defined the existing method but in a shape which enabled the inquisition to encroach on the secular jurisdiction as early as seventeen eighty one we find that the bigamist after trial was handed over to the royal court with a certificate designating him not merely as a convict but expressing the punishment of exile and presidio thus showing that the tribunal presumed to sentence him to temporal as well as to spiritual penance in seventeen ninety one a case indicates that it even went further for the toledo tribunal held an auto particular for gabriel delgado in which his sentence was read prescribing not only abjuration de levi and spiritual penance but exile for eight years from toledo madrid and royal residences the only difference between this and the practice of a century earlier was a clause that his person was to be delivered to the secular justice under the restoration the inquisition assumed full jurisdiction over bigamy the tribunal sentenced the culprit as of old usually to scourging and presidio or exile and the suprema in confirming the sentence ordered the scourging omitted on some pretext nothing was said about handing the culprit over to the secular courts they might if they saw fit exercise cumulative jurisdiction and entertain cases that came to them but after they rendered judgment the inquisition tries the culprits over again and modified the sentence at its pleasure either to increase or diminish the penalties thus in eighteen eighteen the granada criminal court sentenced escubio rulin to six years of presidio of which one was to be in africa then the tribunal took hold of him added spiritual penances and perpetual exile from certain places and increasing the presidio to ten years but when this went for confirmation to the suprema it cut down the exile to eight years and the presidio to two the sentence of the criminal court was treated with the utmost contempt an exception to this seems to have been made when the army was concerned in eighteen seventeen eladio de aragon was tried by the marid tribunal and convicted of having three wives his sentence comprised only abjuration and spiritual penances after the performance of which he was to be handed over to the captain-general with a copy of his sentence and recommendation to mercy in view of his long imprisonment his confession and the hopes entertained of his amendment evidently in dealing with the army the inquisition felt constrained to obey the laws bigamy formed a portion by no means inconsiderable of the current business of the inquisition in the toledo record from fifteen seventy five to sixteen ten the number of cases is fifty four ranking next to those of Morisco's. In the same tribunal from 1648 to 1794 there were 62 cases, being next in number to solicitation. In the 64 autos held in Spain from 1721 to 1727 there were 34 cases, the only crimes exceeding this being Judaism and sorcery in the latter period owning doubtless to the interference of the secular jurisdiction and the decadence of the inquisition the number falls off the total in all tribunals from seventeen eighty to eighteen twenty being one hundred and five end of section fifty nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c
Section number 60 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book Number 8, Chapter 15, Spheres of Action, Blasphemy. Blasphemy is a somewhat elastic term, but for our purpose it may, in a general way, be defined as imprecation derogatory or insulting to the divinity. Punished with lapidation under the Levitical law, it was, during the Middle Ages, the subject of infinite legislation, both on the part of secular and ecclesiastical lawgivers, and savage punishments, such as boring the tongue with a hot wire, were frequently imposed. Enrique IV, in 1462, prescribed cutting out the tongue, together with scourging or banishment, and in 1476, Ferdinand and Isabella confirmed this. Jurisdiction over blasphemy was cumulative, belonging both to the secular and spiritual courts, and was also within the cognizance of the old Inquisition, provided it was heretical, but the distinction between non-heretical and heretical was not easy. Emmerich tells us that imprecations reviling God or the Virgin, or expressing ingratitude to him, are simple blasphemy, with which the Inquisition has no concern. To give it cognizance, there must be a denial of some article of faith, and the repetition of this definition by the Repertorium in 1494 shows that this continued to be accepted as the rule in practice. The Spanish Inquisition, at its inception, thus found itself possessed of jurisdiction, and in Aragon, at least, where the institution had the traditional of centuries, there was no hesitation in exercising it immediately after the reorganization. In the Saragossa Auto of December 17, 1486, there appeared a Christian punished for blasphemy, his tongue being pierced with a stick, and a Jew with a bridle in his mouth, a mitre and a straw espuria. In this field, as in so many others, inquisitional zeal outran discretion. There was little attention paid to the distinction between heretical and non-heretical, and, in the instructions of 1500, inquisitors were told that they made arrests for trifling matters, not directly heretical, as four words uttered in anger that were blasphemy and not hearsay. In future, no one was to be arrested for such things, and if there was doubt, the Inquisitor General was to be consulted. This warning was all the more needed, as the secular courts were not ready to abandon their jurisdiction, for a pragmatica of Ferdinand and Isabella in 1502 provides lashes, prison, and other penalties for blasphemies so evidently heretical as discreto de Dios, I disbelieve in God. The bishops likewise continued to assert control, for the Council of Seville, in 1512, under ex-Inquisitor General Diza, imposed a fine of three gold florins and imprisonment at discretion on clerics, while for laymen, in addition to the legal penalties, the ecclesiastical judge was directed to prosecute for swearing, blasphemy, or insults to God, the Virgin, and the Saints. The caution enjoined in the instructions of 1500 was lost on the inquisitors and their abuse of power, in the respect suggested one of the complaints of the Cortes of Monazon in 1510. In the Concordia of 1512 it was provided they should not have the cognizance of blasphemy, unless it manifestly savored of hearsay, such as denying the existence of God or his omnipotence. 
Inquisitor General Mercadier embodied this in his introductions of 1514, and Leo X confirmed it in 1516 in his bull Pastorius Officii. The Aragonese Suprema accepted this, and in the Edict of Faith of 1515, it was specially stated that denunciation of blasphemy was not required, except when it was contrary to articles of faith. As we have seen in bigamy, however, no attention was paid to this, and among the grievances of the Cortes about 1530, there is complaint that the Inquisition threw into prison orthodox persons for blasphemy and for words merely uttered in the heat of passion to which the imperturbable inquisitor-general replied that the inquisitors acted only in accordance with the law, and if the parties had been aggrieved, let their names be given, where due provision would be made. These troubles were by no means confined to Aragon. In Castile, a royal pragmatica of 1515 recites a supplication to the king, asking that inquisitors should not have cognizance of blasphemy wherefore it was ordered that they should only hear cases which they could and ought to hear and a special charge was given to the inquisitor general not to permit them to do otherwise and to provide that abuses if such there were should cease this ambiguous utterance naturally provided no effect and in fifteen thirty four the cortes of madrid represented forcibly the hardship that a blasphemy uttered in the excitement of gambling or in the passion of a quarrel should expose a man noble and pure blood to arrest by the inquisition when as the cause was not known the whole lineage suffered infamy they asked therefore that the offence should be remanded exclusively to the secular courts which should punish it rigorously to this Charles evasively replied that the judges would execute the laws and the inquisitors would not exceed their powers, and he contented himself with reissuing the Pragmatica of 1515. It is easy to appreciate the feelings underlying these remonstrances, where there was no function of the Inquisition which brought it more fully in contact with the mass of the old Christian population, thoroughly orthodox at heart, strict in observance, proud of purity of blood, and dreading nothing so much as the nota incurred by the slightest suspicion of hearsay. The Spaniard was chloratic, and not especially nice in his choice of words when moved by wrath gambling was an almost universal passion and in all lands and ages nothing has been more provocative of ejaculations and expletives than the vicissitudes of cards and dice what to women in the humbler walks of life were the prosecutions for sorcery those for blasphemy were to men of all ranks trivial as this portion of inquestorial activity may seem to us we may feel sure that in no other way was the influence of the holy office more keenly felt or more dreaded by that great body of the nation which zealously welcomed its persecution of the jewish and moorish new christians it is true that in theory the jurisdiction of the inquisition was confined to heretical blasphemy and if the older definitions were observed only a moderate self-restraint was required for the most invertate gambler or hot-headed ruffler to keep on the safe side but definitions were malleable and could be molded to suit the temper or the aggressiveness of a tribunal anxious for business and for fines the doctors found it no easier to agree upon the delimination of heretical blasphemy than upon the thousand other questions suggested by moral theology. It was easy to say in general terms that heretical blasphemy consisted in affirming or denying of God that which the faith requires to be denied 
or affirmed or in attributing to the creature that which pertains solely to the creator but when it came to applying these abstract principles in the concrete there were apt to be discordance and it is easy to imagine how ample a field for causatory was afforded by the variety figure and picturesqueness of the blasphemy of the southern races as a rule the suprema was inclined to check the readiness of the tribunals to discover hearsay in expletives which were it is true blasphemous irreverent and indecent but not indicative of lack of faith there was a class of these which seemed to have been in the mouth of every one ineradicable by the most severe legislation such as malgrado adios may in spite god pes adios may god regret renio ados i renounce god descrio de dos i disbelieve in god etc for which ferdinand and isabella in their laws of fourteen ninety two and fifteen o two provided penalties ranging from a month's imprisonment for a first offence to piercing the ton for a third and in fifteen twenty five charles v added por vida de dios by god's life to the list in fifteen sixty six philip the second in his desire for naval recruits added ten years of galleys to the penalties for blasphemy and six years of galleys to the tongue piercing for the third offence as provided by his predecessors when these offences were so fully covered by secular law the suprema deemed it unnecessary that the tribunals should be diverted from their legitimate functions to take cognizance of them in fifteen thirty seven dr giron de la Sea, in his visitation of toledo writes for instructions concerning these expletives he regards them as heretical but he understands that the suprema does not wish the tribunals to take action on them as they are so common and they are already judges enough for them it was probably in response to this that in the same year fifteen thirty seven the suprema decided that utterances such as these were not within its jurisdiction because they were conditional being merely explosions of wrath or disappointment a decision which it repeated in 1547. It had already, in 1535, construed the instructions of 1500 as implying that sudden ejaculations of anger were to be handed over to the Episcopal courts, and, in 1560, it included por vida de Dios among non-heretical blasphemies. In 1567, however, among the charges against Estevan Pollo in Valencia is included his exclaiming Pes adios, and the tendency of inquisitors to widen the definition is seen in the rebuke by the Suprema of the Inquisitor Moral, because in San Sebastian he had punished for saying such as God cannot do me more harm, and in this world you will not see me suffer unless indeed it sagely observes the last expression is used with disbelief in the final judgment this latter remark illustrates the ingenious causatory with which hearsay could be discovered whenever desirable of which we have already seen an example in the case of antonio perez for one of the charges against him was his swearing that if god the father interfered with his defence he would cut off his nose in which fray diego de chavez found savour of the hearsay of the vadoi who attributed human members to god it is possible that the successful employment against perez of the jurisdiction over blasphemy may have led to a more liberal definition of hearsay for in the seventeenth century we find a consensus of opinion that such expletives as reno de dio or de la fee or de la crisma or de nuestra senora or de creo de dio were heretical 
whether this applied to renouncing st peter st paul and other saints was a more doubtful question on which the doctors differed there were even strict constructionalists who held that to call god all wise or all beautiful as a lover might address his mistress was blasphemy in sicily the exclamation sanctus diabolus was usually admitted to be heretical but it was not prosecuted because it was so universally used that it was more convenient to class it as simple blasphemy it will readily be seen how elusive were the questions arising from the variegated ingenuity of blasphemers and what scope there was for the indulgence of temperamental idiosyncrasies among inquisitors in the region so full of doubt where there were three claimants of jurisdiction the secular the spiritual and the inquisitorial much clashing might naturally be expected but i have not met with any compensias with the royal courts arising from this source in his anxiety to suppress blasphemy philip the fourth in sixteen thirty nine assembled a junta to consider whether the jurisdiction of the inquisition could not be enlarged so that it could punish the utterance of a single por vita when the outcome of its deliberations was a comprehensive decree punishing all swearing save in judicial procedures with a graduated scale of penalties and those addicted to the habit were incapacitated for holding office under the state of course this was ineffective and in sixteen fifty five and sixteen fifty six he ordered the rigid infliction of the punishment in order to disarm the divine indignation manifested in the public misfortunes neither did the episcopal courts surrender their jurisdiction and it proves the ineradicable character of the offence that it continued to flourish in spite of persecution by all three a case illustrative of their cumulative action and of susceptibility of spanish piety was that of diego cabeza of manzanal de la punte who about sixteen twenty in quarrelling with a man said that he did not know what god was about when he made him the local magistrate francisco prieto exacted of him a fine of forty ducats by threatening to denounce him to the inquisition but the episcopal court heard of the matter arrested tried and punished him then some ten years later in sixteen thirty he was denounced to the valladoid tribunal the calificador's duty pondered over his utterance and pronounced it to be a heretical blasphemy but when the inquisitors learnt that it was ten years old and that he had already been punished by the episcopal ordinary they wisely suspended the case presumably it was the worst cases of blasphemy that came before the inquisition and as a rule its moderation offers a favorable contrast to the savage ferocity of secular legislation it is true that as suspicion of hearsay was inferred the accused was thrown in the secret prison which in itself was a severe infliction but torture was not employed the penalties prescribed were abjuration de levi appearance in an auto gagging scourging and galleys according to the gravity of the offence while frails were recluded in convents of their own orders these however were reserved for aggravated cases of habitual blasphemy by offenders of low degree nobles and gentlemen had their sentences read in the audience chamber were excused from abjuration and were recluded in a monastery for some months outbreaks of passion in quarrels or gambling and even drunkenness were held to entitle the accused to acquittal or to merely nominal penalties a writer of about sixteen forty indeed assumes a role that the culprit was only reprimanded in the audience chamber without abjuration except in very scandalous cases 
deserving of scourging and the galleys, but even in those such punishments were no longer inflicted. There was no sequestration of property, and repetition of the offense was not regarded as relapse. A later writer, however, holds that such heretical blasphemies as Reino de Dios, Discreto de Dios, and the like are punishable with verguza or a hundred lashes. It may be assumed, in fact, that there was a wide discretion in these matters. We have seen the severity with which the wild outbreaks of rage of Antonio Perez were treated, yet in 1624 a young soldier who, when put in the stocks, exclaimed, I renounce God and the saints. Devils, why don't you come and carry me off? When duly tried with all formality by the Valladolid tribunal, was discharged with a reprimand and without a sentence. So, in 1630, two girls in the Dominican convent of Valladolid, on being confined in a room by the prioress, in a burst of rage, re repeatedly renounced God and the saints. Naturally, on trial, they expressed extreme repentance and were discharged with a reprimand. This wise moderation did not exclude severity when the case seemed to demand it. In 1669, Antonio de Hero, for heretical blasphemy, in grando superlavato, was sentenced in Toledo to appear in the auto of April 7th, to abjure de Levi, to hear mass as a penitent, to receive a hundred lashes, and to serve three years in the galleys. Considering the prevalence of the vice and the energetic efforts for its suppression, the number of cases in the Inquisition is less than might be expected. In the Toledo record from 1575 to 1610, there are only 46. In that same tribunal from 1648 to 1794, the number is but 37. In all the tribunals from 1780 to 1820, the total is 147. It is evident that, in this matter, the activity of the Inquisition diminished greatly as time wore on, whether from an increase in popular reverence or from a growing disclination to denounce the offense. End of the section number 60. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 61 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Chapter 16, Part 1, Spheres of Action, Miscellaneous Business. In the undefined and widely extending jurisdiction of the Inquisition, there were a number of matters more or less connected with the faith of which it assumed cognizance. Their cursory consideration is indispensable and they can more conveniently be grouped together. Marriage in Orders The celibacy enjoined on the Catholic clergy includes the seculars, from the subdiaconate upwards, and the regulars who are bound by the three vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience. Even degradation from orders does not remove the disability, as the indelible character impressed in the ordination remains. Strict as has been the enforcement of the canons, since the twelfth century the weakness of the flesh has at all times led to occasional infractions of the rule, punishable with degradation, reclusion in a monastery, and other penalties. Whether the offence was justiciable by the Inquisition was, in the earlier period, the subject of debate, some authors holding that if the marriage was public it implied heretical error, bringing it under inquisitorial jurisdiction, but that if it was secret this showed that there was no intellectual misbelief, making the offender guilty only of violating the law, and subjecting him, if secular, to the spiritual courts, and if regular, to the prelates of his order. The Reformation, which sanctioned clerical marriage, introduced a new and controlling factor that in time altered the situation. 
yet for a considerable period there was a powerful movement especially among german catholics to relax the prohibition in the hope of effecting a reunion the question was regarded as open for discussion as a matter merely of discipline arnaldo albertino argues that the pope can dispense for marriage in orders and instances the dispensation granted by alexander the sixth to his son caesar borgia then a cardinal deacon to marry the heiress of valentinois the reactionary influences which controlled the council of trent changed all this when in fifteen sixty three it made clerical celibacy a matter of faith rendering priestly marriage unquestionably thenceforth heretical the inquisition however did not wait for this to assume jurisdiction though it seems not to have acted until after the outbreak of the reformation had rendered clerical celibacy a subject of discussion the earliest case that i have met is that of miguel gomez a priest of saragossa sentenced for marrying in orders by the toledo tribunal in fifteen twenty nine when the peculiar punishment which seemed to show that it was a novelty for which no precedent existed he was exhibited for three days on a ladder at the portal of the cathedral in his shirt and drawers with his hands tied his feet chained and a mitre on his head after which he was deprived for life of sacerdotal functions and banished for ever from the province toledo had no other case until fifteen sixty two when it had to deal with the somewhat complicated offence of fray juan ramirez who entered a religious order while married but twice left it and returned again during which performances he married two wives that jurisdiction depended wholly on the sacrament is seen in the case of juan carrillo alias fray juan ortiz a franciscan denounced in fifteen ninety six to the toledo tribunal by his prelate fray juan de ovando for apostasy and living with a woman reputed to be his wife investigation showed that she was merely his concubine so the case was suspended and he was remanded to ovando to be dealt with under the rules of the order after the offence had clearly been made heresy by the council of trent the terrifying formula of accusation by the fiscal describes the offender as unworthy of mercy to be deprived of all ecclesiastical privilege to be degraded from his orders and to be relaxed to the secular arm to which was added the otrosi demanding the free use of torture in practice however there was the widest discretion it is true that writers speak of appearance in public auto or degradation and reclusion in a monastery for years or a similar term of galley service but there seems to have been no rule indeed it is not easy to understand how an offence so uniform in its nature should have been visited with penalties so diverse in fifteen ninety seven francisco agustin an augustinian of barcelona married in toledo sought to defend himself on the plea that he had entered the order under compulsion in order to escape his debts his sentence was appearance in an auto abjuration de levi and imprisonment for life in the convent where he had made profession in sixteen twenty nine fray lorenzo de avalle a benedictine priest accused himself to the valladolid tribunal of having married and lived for eight years as a musician in aragon notwithstanding his self-denunciation he was sentenced to verbal degradation and to four years detention in a monastery where he was to undergo a circular discipline while the woman was notified that she was free to marry again in strong contrast with this was the case of juan alonso palacios a married jesuit before the toledo tribunal in sixteen fifty nine who though not an espontaneado escaped with a reprimand and four years of reclusion then in sixteen sixty four fray juan de ayala a mercenarian priest was by the same tribunal suspended perpetually from his functions and recluded for three years in a convent with one year's friday fasting and some spiritual penance again in sixteen seventy five the same tribunal condemned jeronimo de morales a married subdeacon to five years in the galleys three more of exile and disqualification for orders five years of galleys with three more of exile and deprivation of functions and benefices was the portion of don cristoval de zabiati alias don juan baptista de verganza priest of talavera de la reina who appeared in the great madrid auto of sixteen eighty in seventeen hundred the toledo tribunal had to deal with a case characterized as con circunstancias gravissimas so that we may regard the sentence as representing the extremity of punishment for the offence the culprit was not required to appear in an auto, 
but his sentence was read in the audience chamber in the presence of twenty-four ecclesiastics it prescribed abjuration de levi perpetual deprivation of functions perpetual confinement in a convent cell to be left only for choir and refectory in which he was to have the last place to fasting for four years on bread and water on fridays and vigils and to a circular discipline when taken to the convent the details of his career are not given but there is a suggestion of material for a picaresque novel as the culprit was a dominican fray tomas juster who had been a calificador of the inquisition and a preacher of the king and who enjoyed the multifarious aliases of don juan de san feliu cisneros don vicente de ochaita and don juan de ibarrola it is somewhat remarkable that degradation appears so rarely to be resorted to the offence seems to have been by no means frequent in the toledo reports from fifteen seventy five to sixteen ten there are only the two cases referred to above and in the record from the same tribunal from sixteen forty eight to seventeen ninety four the number is only ten from seventeen eighty to eighteen twenty the combined records of all the tribunals show only six cases End of section sixty one Section sixty two of a history of the Inquisition of Spain, volume four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, volume four, by Henry Charles Lee. Book eight, chapter sixteen, part two, spheres of action, miscellaneous business. Personation of priesthood. The veneration with which the sacraments are regarded, and the supreme importance ascribed to them as a means of salvation, render it indispensable that they should be guarded with the utmost solicitude. Not only is their validity essential to those who seek them, but any fraud in their dispensation is sacrilege, which, in the case of the Mass, may plunge all worshippers present into the sin of idolatry. With the exception of baptism they can be administered only by those in full priest's orders, and the pretense to do so by men unqualified is a wrong not only to the faithful who are deceived, but to the Creator who has established them for the solace and salvation of His creatures. The fees attaching to the confection and bestowal of the sacraments are a valuable privilege of the priesthood, and the temptation was great for graceless laymen or clerics in the lower orders to simulate the possession of the requisite faculties, and to betray the unsuspecting into accepting from their hands the worthless simulacra. In the venality of the fourteenth century this would seem not to have been regarded as an especially grave offence, for in the tax-roll of Benedict the Twelfth, the official fee for absolution for pretending to be a priest, hearing confessions and granting absolution, is only six grossi, or about three-quarters of a florin. After the outbreak of the Reformation it was regarded as a more serious matter. Paul the Fourth, in briefs of May twentieth, fifteen fifty seven, and February seventeenth, fifteen fifty nine, defined the offence as subject to the Inquisition, and to be punished by relaxation even when there was not relapse. Sixtus V felt compelled to reissue the brief of Paul, and Clement the Eighth, in sixteen o one, confirmed the acts of his predecessors, authorizing prosecution by either the Inquisition or the Episcopal Ordinary. This was applicable only to culprits who had reached the age of twenty-five, but Urban the Eighth in 1627 reduced the limit to twenty. This repetition of legislation shows the stubbornness of the evil and the papal determination to suppress it. Even complicity was sternly punished, for in 1619 a layman assisting a celebrant whom he knew to be unqualified was tortured for intention, made to abjure de vehementi, to serve five years in the galleys, and was perpetually suspended from assisting at mass. Cardinal Scalia, however, states that when the offence was committed through thoughtlessness, relaxation was commuted to ten years of galleys, but there was no hesitation in inflicting the full penalty in appropriate cases. As late as July 18, 1711, Domenico Spallaccino, a hardened offender who had lived for five years by celebrating Mass in Rome, Loreto, and other places, was relaxed and condemned to be hanged and burned. He was duly hanged in the Piazza di Campo dei Fiori. The body was fastened to an iron stake on a pile of wood and was reduced to ashes which were gathered up and buried. In Spain the matter was treated less seriously. The Inquisition at first did not regard itself as having jurisdiction unless there were misbelief as to the sacraments. 
a carta acordada of january thirty first fifteen thirty three instructs the tribunals that in these cases the culprit is to be asked whether he thought himself possessed of the power or whether he had anywhere heard it so asserted as an opinion and what was his intention if he acknowledges no erroneous belief the matter does not concern the inquisition and he is to be handed over to the magistrate the briefs of Paul IV were not admitted in Spain, and the matter slumbered until 1574, when, on January 13th, the Suprema addressed to the tribunals a circular inquiry, asking whether there had been any prosecutions for this offense. If so, on what grounds was the jurisdiction based, what form of procedure was followed, and what penalty was inflicted. Also, opinions were asked as to how such cases should be treated. Evidently, no attention had as yet been paid to the question— the replies showed that there was no general policy, and a brief of August 17th of the same year was obtained from Gregory the Thirteenth, reciting that in Spain there were conflicting opinions whether the Inquisition had or had not jurisdiction, wherefore he granted to it exclusive cognizance and forbade the Episcopal courts from entertaining such cases. This the Suprema sent, November 26th, to all the tribunals with orders to prosecute in such cases, and to introduce a corresponding clause in the Edict of Faith. It is evident that the Spanish Inquisition did not share the horror felt in Rome for such offences, and this is manifested in the comparative moderation of the penalties inflicted. About 1650, a Spaniard in Rome, writing to a friend at home and comparing the severity of the Italian Inquisition with the mildness of the Spanish, instances the Roman torture of bigamists and soliciting confessors, the longer terms of galleys for the former and the implacable relaxation of those who celebrate Mass without ordination. There was no such ferocity in Spain. No time had been lost in assuming the jurisdiction, and already in 1575 there was a culprit in a Toledo auto, Fray Alonso Garcia, a Franciscan who had celebrated Mass and heard confessions, and whose sentence was merely abjuration de levi and four years' galley service. The most complete discretion was exercised, and the penalties varied in the same tribunal according to the circumstances of the case and the temper of the inquisitors. Thus, in Toledo, in 1578, Pero Juan Cusito, a student who carried forged certificates and had confessed many persons, absolving them and imposing penance, appeared in an auto with halter and candle, abjured de levi, and had two hundred lashes and three years of galleys. In the same year, a Frenchman named Pierre Saletas, accused of having for twenty years heard confessions and celebrated mass on forged certificates, was tortured without confessing, and was banished the kingdom for four years, and forbidden to administer sacraments without genuine certificates. In 1600, Baltazar Rodriguez, a deacon, appeared in an auto, abjured de levi, was suspended for ten years from the exercise of his orders, with perpetual disability for promotion, and had six years of galleys. In the same year, the mercenarian, Fray Gregorio de Palacios, was spared appearance in an auto, but abjured de levi, had fifty lashes, and was recluded for three years in a monastery of his order. In 1622, at Valladolid, the Franciscan deacon, Fray Juan Tapia, for celebrating Mass, was merely ordered to keep his convent as a prison, and to present himself when summoned. Somewhat greater severity was shown to Fray Antonio Frechado, a Trinitarian subdeacon, who for publicly hearing confessions was required to abjure de levi, was suspended from his functions for two years, during which he was recluded in his convent, was disabled for promotion, and had some spiritual penance. It would be useless to multiply examples of this diversified moderation. I have met with but one case in which the papal prescription of relaxation was obeyed, and this occurred in Mexico in 1606, when Fernando Rodriguez de Castro, a mulatto, was relaxed for administering sacraments without ordination. But this was no precedent for, in the great auto of 1648, Gaspar de los Reyes was sentenced to two hundred lashes and the galleys for life, and Martin de Villavicencio Salazar to the same scourging and five years of galleys. The systematic writers assure us that the papal decrees were not received in Spain, and that the punishment varied with the nature of the case, consisting usually of scourging, unless the offender was a frail, the galleys, exile, reclusion, degradation, suspension of functions, etc., varied at the discretion of the tribunal, and that in cases of minor culpability it could be commuted for money. Relaxation was kept in view only for some error in faith persistently held, a purely academical supposition. 
although the culprit was exhaustively examined as to his belief in the necessity of priestly orders to the validity of sacraments that ecclesiastics between themselves in reality attached but little importance to the offence may be inferred from the case of the mercenary and fray pedro de la presentacion who celebrated mass when only in subdeacon's orders the toledo tribunal condemned him june sixteenth sixteen sixty two to three years of galleys the superior of his order at once interceded for him and in september the suprema commuted the penalty to three years reclusion in a convent with three years subsequent exile from daimiel toledo and madrid when only ten months of the term had expired the provincial of castile applied for the remission of the remainder but in vain and when two years had passed the effort was renewed evidently the good frailes recked little of the idolatry into which he had plunged all who were present at his ministration as the eighteenth century advanced a still more lenient view seems to have obtained in seventeen forty nine the case of fray juan de santa rosa a franciscan deacon was an aggravated one for he had administered the sacraments of baptism the eucharist penitence and matrimony but the toledo tribunal only declared him irregular for promotion suspended him from the diaconate for two years and imposed fifteen days of spiritual penance no special expectation of amendment earned this benignity for his provincial was instructed to send him to a convent from which he was not to go out alone so as not to expose him to relapse under the restoration there was leniency difficult to understand the sentence of the dominican fray tomas garcia by the cuenca tribunal november fourteenth eighteen sixteen for celebrating mass without priest's orders was that the commissioner of villescusa was to reprimand him in presence of the superior of his convent pointing out the severe penalties provided by the papal decrees and prescribing spiritual penances for a year besides informing the prelate that he could not ascend to full orders this was confirmed by the suprema with the addition that he be transferred to a house of stricter observance december eleventh of the same year angel sampaio a married layman of campo ramiro lugo was convicted of celebrating mass the suprema alludes to his attentato horrible but merely orders him to be reprimanded and sent back to his home where the parish priest and his father are to keep watch over him in connection with this subject it may be mentioned that the inquisition also took cognizance of a class of cases alluded to above under solicitation in which laymen managed to hear confessions of women not with a view to administer the sacrament of penitence but through jealousy or for the opportunity of asking indecent questions or in the hope of listening to prurient details these cases were by no means infrequent in seventeen eighty five there were three before the tribunal of valencia in 1793 one in murcia in 1796 joseph harantz was prosecuted in madrid for doing this in order to hear his wife's confessions the same year there was a case in seville in 1797 one in barcelona and in 1807 miguel dominguez sacristan of san miguel de niebla pretended to be a capuchin with the object to listening to the confession of a woman with what severity such cases were treated i have not been able to ascertain End of section 62. Section 63 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley M. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Chapter 16, Spheres of Action, Miscellaneous Business, Part 3. Personation of Officials In the universal dread inspired by the Holy Office, the temptation was great to personate its agents, and to extort money as the price for forbearance, for no one ventured to question the authority or acts any stranger who presented himself as an official the opportunities thus afforded were speedily recognized and utilized as early as fourteen eighty seven at saragossa a special auto was held april first at which appeared a cleric who had pretended to be an inquisitor and as such had made an arrest the penalty inflicted is not recorded but evidently the opportunity was taken to make an impressive warning 
the systematic writers assume that in these cases there should be careful consideration of the injury afflicted for the pretender may deserve exemplary punishment the usual offence is asserting that there are accusations and that he will save the accused from prosecution for this he must refund the money received, appear in an auto, and suffer two hundred lashes and five years of galley service. If the imposture is assumed only to escape from some trouble and causing no damage, there is some penalty of fine or exile. If there has only been an assertion of official position, the penalty is very light and secret. Other authorities tell us that, if the culprit is of a low class, he has two hundred lashes and four years of galleys, more or less according to the gravity of the offence. If he is noble or rich, he is fined one or two thousand ducats and serves for two or three years, without pay, as a gentleman in the galleys, or against the moors or heretics. Evidently, in an offence which varies so much in motive and result, much was necessarily left to the discretion of the tribunal, and the few cases will serve to indicate the different methods of operating and the deterrent penalties inflicted. In the Seville Auto of September 24, 1559, there were three cases of personation. Alonso de Honteveros, for pretending to be a familiar and endeavoring to make arrest for the purpose of extortion, appearing with halter and gag, and was sent to Zares, his place of residence, to receive a hundred lashes. Juan de Aragon of Malaga, for the same offence, was spared the gag, but wore a mitra and had a scourging at Malaga and another where his offence was committed, besides two years of exile, while his accomplice, Francisco Pietro, received the same sentence with the substitution of Verguenda for scourging. On the other hand, at Toledo, in 1581, Francisco de la Batida was visited with the utmost rigour. He represented himself as an alguazil, carrying a vara de justicia, and using the name of the inquisitor general. He would summon the alcades and other officials to render assistance, which was freely given without question. He would make arrests, carry his prisoners to some distance, take their money, leave them in charge of some local familiar, and disappear. In this way, he moved from Puente de Azina to Almaden and Madrid, at thence to Saragossa, where he was arrested. He confessed freely at once and was condemned to relaxation, by virtue of a special brief obtained from Gregory the Thirteenth, for the Suprema, with doubtful mercy, commuted this to six hundred lashes, two hundred each in Toledo, Almaden, and Fuente de Enzina, and the galleys irremissibly for life. Zapata relates what is evidently the exploit which brought to a close the promising career of this enterprising knave. El Almagro, he says, the agent of the Fuggers at Augsburg was Juan Zelder, a man highly esteemed and reputed to be of great wealth. Suddenly, a stranger appeared, with the vara of an alguazil of the Inquisition, who sought out two familiars and commanded them to assist him in making an arrest. Proceeding to Zelder's house, he made the arrest, locked him up in a room, and consoled the frightened family by assuring them of the customary mercy of the Inquisition. He then summoned a notary and placed all the property of the prisoner under sequestration, except two thousand ducats which he said he had orders to take for the expenses of the trial. The whole town was thrown into commotion, but no one dared to ask for papers or authority or identification. Zelder was placed in a carriage with strict orders that no one should exchange a word with him. The familiars were required to accompany it to the next halting place, where they and the carriage were dismissed with handsome gratuities, and the stranger confided Zelder to the care of a familiar of high standing, with orders to guard him carefully, incommunicado, while he would proceed to Toledo and send instructions. Ten days passed when the familiar, growing tired of the expense, made inquiries and in ascertaining the facts released the prisoner. Meanwhile, the impostor, fearing to carry the gold, deposited it with a banker and took a bill of exchange on Saragossa, so that he was readily tracked and arrested when he presented the bill for payments. The secular court claimed him, but the Inquisition asserted its jurisdiction. Fortunately, Zapata says, for the culprit, for the offense was capital and he escaped the scourging and the galleys. Another method of speculation on the fears and hopes of the defenseless appears in the case of Geronimo Roche, son of the secretary of the University of Lerida. 
who pretended to be an official to have much influence with the tribunal and to hold faculties to remit four sanbenitos and to appoint four familiars he approached a morrissey who with her three daughters had been reconciled and offered to relieve her of the San Benito for two hundred ducats, and those of her three daughters if one of them would abandon herself to him. He was forbidden the house, but he persisted in writing letters of mingled threats and love. For this he appeared in the Saragossa Auto of June 6, 1585, where he was sentenced to Verguenza and eight years in the galleys, being spared the scourging in consideration of his father. There appears to have been a very lenient view taken, in 1582, by the Toledo Tribunal of the case of Pedro Marino, a sacristan, who pretended to be a familiar and as such visited the hospital and asked the inmates whether they had confessed, when he arrested and carried off those who had not. It was in evidence also that, on seeing two men quarrelling in a church, he arrested one in the name of the Inquisition. There does not seem to have been a pecuniary motive in these eccentricities, and he escaped with the reprimand and banishment for a year. Another motive, which was regarded with the lenient's eye, was assuming official position in order to enjoy exemptions and privileges of the Inquisition. Thus, when James Corvalana of Barcelona in this manner bluffed out the officers of justice who came to his house to see some salt, Inquisitor Padilla imposed on him a fine of fifty ducats and some spiritual penance, and was rebuked by the Suprema for inflicting so heavy a penalty for so trifling a cause, on cosas tan livianas. Personation was by no means uncommon, but I am convinced that Laurent is mistaken when he says that there rarely was an auto in which someone was not punished for this offence. In the Toledo record from 1575 to 1610, the number of cases is only 13, and in the same tribunal from 1648 to 1794, they amount only to four. Principal interest in these cases is the evidence which they afford of the terror inspired by the Inquisition the very name of which seemed to paralyze, so that no one, whether magistrate or individual, dared to question the authority of any impostor who assumed to represent it. And this same terror, doubtless, is the reason why this apparently facile method of trading on popular fear was not more frequently exploited. It required more than common nerve to incur the risk of inquisitorial vengeance. Somewhat akin to this was the levying of blackmail by threats and denunciation. No doubt there was a good deal of this, in which the victims prudently suffered in silence, rather than to draw upon themselves the attention of the dreaded tribunal. It was a matter of which the Inquisition could cognizance, but the only case which I have happened to me is that of Pedro de Combe Promoseltes, who was sentenced by the Toledo Tribunal in 1666 to three years of galley service for astrology and had his term extended to five for attempts at extortion in this manner demoniacal possession that evil spirits can take possession of a human being deprive him of his free will and subject him to extreme bodily and mental suffering is a belief handed down from ancient times and still largely held as a matter of faith that relief can be had by the ministrations of an exorcist duly authorized by admission into one of the lower orders of the priesthood is a corresponding belief, and formulas without number have been prepared to enable him to exercise his power over the demon. There is no heresy involved in either the possession or the exorcism, and, under normal conditions, there was no call for interference by the Inquisition, but when, for any reason, such interference was desired, there was little trouble in finding pretext for its jurisdiction. We have seen, volume 2, page 135, the active measures taken, in 1628, with the nuns of San Placito, whose demoniacally inspired revelations were somewhat revolutionary. Greater self-denial was exhibited by the Valladola Tribunal in a contemporaneous case, when a Jesuit confessor reported to it that Donia Felipa and Donia Anya de Marcado, Bernardin nuns in Santo Espiritu of Olmeda, made gestures and other irreverent acts of confession and communion, which caused scandal, and he thought proceeded from demoniacal possession. The tribunal felt doubts as to its jurisdiction, and consulted the Suprema, which submitted the matter to a calificador of high attainments. Prolonged investigations were made, 
other nuns were examined, and it was in evidence that the two inculpated were women of exceptional virtue and piety who had prayed to God to test them with afflictions. The case dragged on for more than ten years, resulting in the conviction that it was undoubtedly one of possession, for which the nuns were free from blame, and finally, April 16, 1630, the Suprema ordered the suspension. Wherever there was the faintest suspicion of heresy, the Inquisition could assert jurisdiction. This involved the question of the responsibility of the demon eye for his utterances, which was somewhat intricate. In the case of one under trial by the Grenada Tribunal in 1650, the learned Jesuit, Padre Diego Tello, who was called in as a calificador, reported, with an immense array of authorities, and after three visits to the accused in the secret prison, that there could be no doubt as to the possession, for he was able to discuss points of theology and other matters far beyond his capacity. He could also speak Latin intelligibly, and he quoted scripture while, as he uttered many heresies, it was evident that the spirit was evil. At the same time, he was rational on so many points that he could not be regarded as irresponsible for the heresies. Luther and Zwingli, he added, were notoriously possessed by demons, but they were none the less held responsible for their teachings, and it was the uniform practice of the Inquisition so to decide in these cases. In the hysterical epidemics which formed so notable a feature of possession, the Inquisition was apt to be called in and was ready to act, although it would be difficult to determine on what grounds. In 1638, there was such an epidemic in one of the Pyrenean valleys, and, on September 24th, Jacinto de Robles, secretary of the governor of Aragon, reported to the Saragossal Tribunal that, on a recent visit to Jaca, he had found, in the Val de Tena, that there were about sixty endiminadas, and that the malady was spreading. It was attributed to Pedro de Arecibo, and his friend Miguel Guillén, who had been seized by the secular authorities. Guillén had been executed, while Arecibo's trial was nearly concluded. He had confessed that a Frenchman had given him a paper, and some conjurations, though wished to win women, but it only rendered them possessed a statement evidently fabricated to satisfy his torturers. It was the demons who had accused these two men, adding that their death would not stay the infection, for there were other accomplices. The women affected were of the best families, their ages ranging from seven to eighteen. Some were pregnant and others were suckling their infants, for demons were able to produce these results in the virtuous. The bishop of Jaca and some Jesuits were exhausting their exorcisms, and an inquisitor was badly needed. What function was expected of an inquisitor is not stated, but the Suprema was consulted, and, after some delay, it appealed to the king. It was ready to send an inquisitor and four frais, but it had no funds for the expenses of the latter, which would have to be defrayed from some other source. The king gave orders accordingly, but they were not obeyed, and the last we hear of the matter is another consulta of March 28, 1640, in which he was urged to speedy action in view of the great importance of the affair. The intervention of the Inquisition might well be welcomed if it was always as rational and as effective as in an epidemic of the kind which troubled Quintero, Mexico, in 1691. Two young girls who had suffered themselves to be seduced pretended to be possessed. The Franciscans and Padres Apostolico took them in hand, exercising them at night in the churches with the most impressive ceremonies, which spread the contagion until there were fourteen patients and the community was thoroughly excited. It would doubtless have extended much further, but fortunately the Dominicans, the Jesuits, and the Carmelites, jealous of the rival orders, pronounced the whole to be an imposture. The two factions denounced each other from the pulpits, the people took sides, and passions grew so hot that severe disturbances were impending. Both factions appealed to the Inquisition, which submitted the matter to calificadores. These decided that the demoniacal possession was fraudulent, and that the blasphemies and sacrilegious acts of the arguments and the violent sermons of the friars were justifiable by the Inquisition. With great good sense, the tribunal issued a decree, January 9, 1692, ordering the cessation of all exorcism and of all discussion, whether in the pulpit or in private. 
the excitement forthwith died away and the energumens left to themselves for the most part recovered their senses prosecutions were commenced against four of them and against the franciscan fray mateo de bonilla which seemed to have been suspended after a few years one of the girls however who had caught the infection had her nervous system too profoundly impressed for recovery she continued under the inspection of the inquisition gradually sinking into a condition of confirmed hypochondria until we lose sight of her in seventeen o four cases of imposture were not infrequent whether this in itself rendered the impostor liable to prosecution by the inquisition may be doubted but in the deception she was very apt to commit acts or other blasphemies which brought her under its jurisdiction thus in seventeen ninety six we find the valencia tribunal prosecuting benito gargori a pretended demoniac and francis de sidnes an accomplice for irreligious actions and utterances the exerciser occasionally laid himself open to inquisitorial animadversation thus in seventeen forty nine fray jamie sons a lay brother of the order of san francisco de assis used to visit the sick and pronounce them to be possessed when he would make the sign of the cross and sprinkle them with holy water he was denounced to the barcelona tribunal which warned him to desist for he had no power to exercise and threatened to proceed against him whereupon he promised to obey exorcists also sometimes abused their opportunities by committing indecencies upon their patients i have not met with such cases in the spanish inquisition but in this it would doubtless follow the example of the roman congregation which in sixteen thirty nine ordered the prosecution of a most flagrant one reported by the inquisitor of Bergamo. Considered as a whole, the influence of the Inquisition must have been decidedly beneficial in restraining the development of this disease, for experienced inquisitors recognized that the methods usually adopted only aggravated it. Cardinal Scaglia, in treating of these epidemics among nuns, remarks that the superiors, not content with exorcisms, commence prosecutions examine witnesses and interrogate the pretended criminals suggestively and assertedly and threaten them with torture thus extracting whatever confessions they desire and creating still greater disturbance in the convent and the city end of section sixty three recording by ashley m Section 64 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley M. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Chapter 16, Spheres of Action, Miscellaneous Business, Part 4 insults to images allusion has already been made to the invasion of episcopal jurisdiction by the assumption of the inquisition that outrages or insults offered to sacred images fell under its cognizance for this there was more justification than for some other inferential heresies for wilful irreverence to the objects of universal cult was reasonably regarded as causing suspicion of erroneous belief and during the period of active persecution of crypto judaism and of protestantism such offences were readily ascribable to heretical fanaticism in one instance at least the secular magistrates exercised jurisdiction in december sixteen forty three madrid was much excited by a robbery committed on a miracle working image of nuestra senora de la gracia when all its jewels ornaments and vestments were taken and worst of all the image was left lying face downwards on the ground great efforts were made to detect the perpetrators of the sacrilege and it was accounted miraculous when they were identified while investigating another robbery they must have been tried by the criminal judges for no mention is made of the inquisition and all three were hanged in march sixteen forty four in presence of an immense crowd this was exceptional and the jurisdiction of the inquisition was generally admitted we are told by a writer of the period that when images of the saints are outraged by word or act if the accused belongs to a nation infected with iconoclastic heresy and the evidence is sufficient and he denies intention he must be tortured 
Overcoming the torture, without having sufficiently purged the evidence, he can be sentenced to an extraordinary penalty and to abjuration, either de levi or de vehementi. If he confesses both fact and intention and begs for mercy, he is to be reconciled. But, if pertinacious, he must be relaxed. This, however, applies to cases of absolute heretics, in which the sacrilege was apt to be merely an aggravating incident, while the majority of cases consisted of more or less reckless Catholics, whose punishment varied with the circumstances and was rarely vindictive. In the Toledo Tribunal, from 1575 to 1610, there were but four cases, which illustrate the general principles of treatment and the extreme susceptibility felt with regard to any irreverence towards sacred objects. The first of these occurs in 1579, when Francisco del Espinar, a boy of thirteen, was tried for pulling up a wayside cross, playing with it until he broke it, and cast the fragments into a vineyard, and then alleging that it was no sin because the cross was not a blessed one. He confessed freely and pleaded that it was not through irreverence, because he was drunk, but he was punished with sixty lashes and two years of exile. The second was in 1595, when Fernando Rodriguez was accused by three witnesses of throwing a stick at a paper image of the Virgin on an altar, tearing it and uttering a filthy jest, but he proved an alibi and the case was suspended. The next was in 1600, when Anton Ruiz Nieto was punished with abjuration de Levi and three years exile, for maltreating a crucifix and using offensive words to it. The fourth, in 1606, illustrates the circumspection requisite to avoid even the appearance of irreverence, and the danger of denunciation which constantly impended over every one. Isabel de Espinosa was denounced by three witnesses because she had placed on a closed stool, which she kept in her living room, a painted board on which were representations of Christ and some saints. A neighbor removed it, and she replaced it. When the neighbor spoke to her, and she changed its place. She was brought from Ocaña to Toledo, and a house was assigned to her as a prison. In defense, she explained that her mother-in-law had left her some old furniture, which her husband had just brought to the house. Among it was this board, black and indistinguishable by age, and, without examination, she had put it on the objectionable article, but when this was pointed out to her, she had removed it. As she was a simple woman, and there was no apparent malice, the case was suspended. In contrast with the severity of the secular courts, as manifested by the Madrid case of 1644 above referred to, and the French case of Chevalier de la Barre, the Inquisition was singularly merciful. In 1661, Francisco de Abiles, chief auditor of the Priors of St. John, for insults to an image of Christ, was only exiled for two years by the Toledo Tribunal, which likewise, in 1689, merely exiled for one year Juan Martin Salvador for stabbing a cross. Perhaps the instant of the greatest rigor that I have met was that visited, in 1720, by the Madrid Tribunal on a youth named Joseph de la Sierra. While confined in the royal prison, he became enraged in gambling, and, in his wrath, he threw in the dirt a picture of the Virgin and tore up another, for which he was sentenced to two hundred lashes, five years in the galleys, and eight years of exiles from Madrid and his native province of Galicia. During the active period of the Inquisition, cases of this offense are singularly few. In all the sixty-four autos held in Spain, from 1721 to 1727, there is not a single specific instance serious enough to require appearance in an auto, indicating how universal and deep-seated was the popular reverence for sacred symbols. It is therefore significant of the spiritual and intellectual unrest characterizing the close of the century, that outrages on images become comparatively frequent. In the decade 1780 to 1789 inclusive, there were 16 cases, and that of 1790 to 1799, 33, and from 1800 to 1810, 19. Some of them, such as trampling on the cross, indicated of iconoclastic zeal. Under the Restoration, there are but three cases on record. During this period, the spirit of revolt manifested itself in other kindred ways. In 1797, 1798, 1799, 1800, and 1802, there were trials for throwing down and trampling on consecrated wafers. 
In 1797, in Valencia, Bernardo Amengail, Ignacio Sanchez, Miguel Escriva, and Valentin Duza were prosecuted for exhibitions for lessing the saints and sacred objects. In 1799, at Seville, Manuel Mirasol was tried for a sacrilegious assault on a priest carrying the sacrament to a sick man. In 1807, Dr. Vincent Peña, priest of Sequence, was prosecuted in Cuenca for celebrating a burlesque mass of Don Escribo de la Monta for assisting him. These were surface indications of the hidden currents which were bearing Spain to new destinies, and it is worthy of note that they almost ceased during the brief years of the Inquisition under the Restoration. Akin to the function of preserving images from insults was the reverent care with which the Inquisition sought to protect the cross from accidental pollution. A Carta Accordia of September 20th, 1629, instructs the tribunals to suppress the custom of painting or placing crosses in recessive of streets where two walls form an angle, or other unclean places. They are exposed to filth, while all existing ones are to be removed or erased under discretional penalties. Another Carta of April 19th, 1689, recites that not only has this not been done, but that the custom of placing crosses in these objectionable places is extending, wherefore the previous orders are reissued, with notice that six days after publication will be allowed, subsequently to which the penalties will be enforced. Uncanonized Saints In the exuberant cults offered to saints, there must be some central and absolute authority to determine claims to sainthood and to preserve the faithful from the superstition of wasting devotion on those who have no power of suffrage. St. Ulrich of Augsburg is said to be the first saint whose sanctity was deliberately passed upon by Rome in 993, and Alexander III in 1181 definitely forbade the adoration of those who had not been canonized by the Holy See. The assumption of such authority was essential for the cult of a local saint was profitable to a shrine fortunate enough to possess his remains, and popular enthusiasm was ready at any moment to ascribe sainthood to any devotee who had earned the reputation of a special holiness. How difficult it was for even the Inquisition to crush this eagerness for new intercessors between God and man is seen in the disturbances which troubled Valencia for seven years, between 1612 and 1619. After the death of Mosan Francisco Simon, a priest of holy life, there developed a fixed belief that he was a saint in heaven. Chapels and altars were dedicated to him. Books were printed filled with the miracles wrought by his intercession. His images were adorned with the nimbus of sanctity. Processions and illuminations were organized in his honor, and the question of his right to a place in the calendar became a political as well as a religious one. It was in vain that the Holy See asserted its unquestioned right of decision and ordered the Inquisition to suppress the superstition. Popular excitement reached such height that an attempt was made to murder in the pulpit a secretary of the tribunal. When he endeavored to read the edict, a priest named Ozar was slain for opposing the popular frenzy. An archbishop Aliaga, for six years after his election in 1612, was unable to perform the visitation of his see, because he would everywhere have met the unauthorized cults which he could not sanction by partaking. The Suprema did its best by continual consultas to Philip III, asking the aid of the secular arm in suppressing the schismatic devotion, and enable it to publish its condemnatory edicts. Its efforts were neutralized by the Council of Aragon backed by the all-powerful favorite Lerma, whose marquisate of Dinia led him to favor the Valencians. It was doubtless his disgrace in 1618 which enabled the Suprema to attain its purpose, when an energetic consulta of January 10, 1619, was returned with a decree in the royal autograph to the effect that, if certain five points that had been agreed upon were not executed within a month, the tribunal could be ordered to publish the edicts without further delay. In this case, the Inquisition acted under special papal commands, but the growing abuse of the unauthorized cult and its supposititious saints led Urban VIII in 1634 to issue a general decree empowering bishops and inquisitors to repress, with penalties proportioned to the offense, all worship of saints and martyrs not pronounced as such by the Holy See, or relating their miracles in books, or representing them with the nimbus. 
Under this, the Index of Sotomayor, in 1640, and the subsequent ones, ordered the suppression of all images or portraits adorned with the insignia of sanctity, unless the persons represented had been duly beatified or canonized by Rome. Yet they did not condemn a work issued, in 1636, by a pious priest of Salamansa and Toledo, Francisco Miranda y Paz, urging the cult as a saint of Adam, the father of the human race, and audaciously asking whether this could not be done without the license of a Roman pontiff. In fact, what the Inquisition did in discharge of this duty is less significant than what it left undone. We have seen that the assumed martyrdom of Al Santo Nino de la Guardia was followed by a popular cult of the unknown victim. That cult proved exceedingly lucrative to those who exploited it and has continued to the present day, although Rome could never be induced to sanction it yet the Inquisition prudently forbore to interfere with it in any way. Similar abstention was observed in the celebrated case of the forgeries known as the Plomos del Sacramonte, inscribed leaden plates accompanied by bones assumed to be those of the earliest Christian martyrs, exhumed in 1595 on a mountain near Grenada. The forgeries were clumsy enough, but they favored the two points dearest to the Spanish heart the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin, and the Spanish Apostolate of St. James. They were welcomed with the intensest fervor. A house of secular canons was erected on the spot, which grew wealthy through the offerings of pilgrims, and innumerable miracles attested the sanctity of the relics. Rome refused to admit the authenticity of the Plumos without examining them. After a long struggle, they were sent there in 1641 and after another protracted contest they were condemned as fabrications may sixth sixteen eighty two by innocent the eleventh in a special brief the bones of the so-called martyrs were not specifically condemned as spurious but they were not accepted as genuine yet the index of vidal marin while printing the condemnation of the plomos and of the books written in their defence was careful to assert that the prohibition did not include the relics or the veneration paid to them the Sacramonte is still a place of pilgrimage, and, in the Plaza del Triunfo of Grenada, there stands a pillar bearing the names and martyrdoms of the saints as recorded in the Plomos. Yet, so long as the claims of the martyrs were not allowed by Rome, and the only evidence in their favor was condemned as fabricated, this was superstition, and its suppression was the duty of the Inquisition. While it was empowered to do this by the decree of Urban the Eighth, it is not easy to see whence Inquisitor General Ars E. Reynoso obtained faculties to authorize the cult of supposititious saints not accepted by the Holy See. The success of the Plomos led a learned Jesuit, Roman de la Higuera, and his imitators to fabricate chronicles of early Christian times, principally designed to stimulate mariolatry and belief in the Christianization of Spain by St. James. They were long accepted and genuine, and, in 1650, Ars Irenoso ordered the fictitious saints and martyrs who figure in them to be included in litanies as objects of veneration and worship. Still, the Inquisition assorted to the last its authority under the decree of Urban the Eighth. So recently as 1818, Joseph de la Herrera, an apothecary in Zeres de la Frontera, desired to establish the cult of an engraving of the Trinity copied from a picture venerated in the Cathedral of Mexico. The Tribunal of Seville prohibited the effort. End of section 64. Recording by Ashley M. Section 65 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Spheres of Action, Miscellaneous Business. Chapter 16, Part 5 the immaculate conception the dogma of the immaculate conception of the virgin had a struggle for recognition through six centuries before it was defined as an article of faith by pius the ninth in eighteen fifty four 
in spain where popular devotion to the virgin was especially ardent it had in the seventeenth century become almost universally accepted except by the dominicans whose reverence for their great doctor st thomas aquinas bound them to follow him in its denial in this they had long been fighting a losing battle with their great rivals the franciscans and of late with their still more bitter foes the jesuits successive popes sixtus the fourth paul the fourth paul the fifth and gregory the fifteenth in vain sought to suppress the disputatious scandals by forbidding public discussion of the subject under severe penalties and the two latter extended these penalties to those who should publicly assert the virgin to have been conceived in original sin but still the holy see cautiously abstained from declaring the conception to have been immaculate the enforcement of these penalties was confided to all bishops and inquisitors from sixteen seventeen to sixteen fifty six philip the third and philip the fourth made the immaculate conception a matter of state policy by long and earnest efforts with the papacy to decide it affirmatively and negotiations for combined action were carried on with france but the gallican court responded only with pious phrases that in this the crown was but voicing the wishes of the people was manifested when in sixteen thirty six a man who ventured in madrid to assert that the virgin was conceived in original sin was promptly cut down by some passing soldiers was arrested by the inquisition and as soon as his wounds were healed was thrown into the secret prison for due prosecution under the papal decrees the dominicans and their followers found it hard to observe the discreet silence prescribed by the popes and in sixteen sixty one the spanish bishops united an earnest request to alexander the seventh representing that persons were still found who publicly denied the immaculate conception philip the fourth sent the bishop of placentia to rome as a special envoy to convey this memorial resulting in the brief solicitudo of december eight sixteen sixty one in which alexander expressly abstained from defining it as a dogma but forbade the teaching of the opposite as well as stigmatizing the opposite as heresy thus continuing the non-committal policy of his predecessors to prevent discussions and quarrels without deciding the question to this end he empowered all prelates and inquisitors to prosecute and punish transgressors severely no matter what exemptions they might claim and including even jesuits he also placed on the index all books impugning the immaculate conception and likewise those which should tax unbelievers with heresy this brief was received with great rejoicings by the upholders of the doctrine who regarded it as a triumph in valencia it was made the occasion of a splendid festival in which pasquinades on the opponents were plentiful one which was greatly applauded represented a dominican stretched on a sick-bed and watched by a jesuit a franciscan opening the door inquires how is the good brother to which the jesuit replies he is speechless but he still lives it was doubtless to the temper thus events that we may attribute the suppression by the suprema of the city's official report of the celebration the prohibition of one paper and the correction of another the brief was promptly transmitted to the tribunals by the suprema with orders for its enforcement which show how delicately such explosive material had to be handled they were cautioned that when they or their commissioners were present at sermons preached by dominicans they must be careful that any action taken was such as not to create scandal they were not trusted with prosecuting transgressors but were ordered beforehand to transmit to the suprema the sumerias with the opinions of the calificadores and to await instructions apparently the customary jealousy arose between the episcopal and inquisitorial jurisdictions for a carta acordada of sixteen sixty seven calls for information as to whether the ordinaries concurred in hearing cases or whether they were treated as belonging exclusively to the inquisition 
it was impossible to make the angry disputants keep the peace and the suprema was busy in condemning and suppressing writings on both sides in sixteen sixty three we find it ordering the seizure at the ports of two books printed in italy an edict of january four sixteen sixty four suppressed fifteen books and tracts issued in sixteen sixty two and sixteen sixty three as indecent and irreverent to the holy see the religion of st dominic and the angelic dr aquinas another decree of december seven sixteen seventy one suppressed two books indecently attacking the dominicans and another of prayers and exercises for the devotion of the immaculate conception by the franciscan provincial banaqua books of devotion thus assumed a controversial character and we can safely assume this to be the cause of an order in sixteen seventy nine to seize at alcante and transmit to the suprema box of dominican breviaries i have chanced to meet with but few cases of prosecutions for impugning the immaculate conception but they occurred occasionally thus in seventeen eighty two don antonio fornes a pilot's mate of a naval vessel was tried in seville for obstinately denying it and in seventeen eighty five don isidro moreno a physician and his son joaquin were brought before the saragossa tribunal for the same offence unnatural crime inherited from classical antiquity unnatural crime was persistent throughout the middle ages in spite of the combined efforts of church and state it is true that with the leniency shown to clerical offenders the council of lateran in eleven seventy nine prescribed for them only degradation or penitential confinement in a monastery which was carried into the canon law but secular legislation was more severe and the usual penalty was burning alive in spain in the thirteenth century the punishment prescribed was castration and lapidation but in fourteen ninety seven ferdinand and isabella decreed burning alive and confiscation irrespective of the station of the culprit the crime was mixti fori the law treated it as subject to the secular courts but it was also ecclesiastical and in fourteen fifty one nicholas v empowered the inquisition to deal with it when the institution was founded in spain it seems to have assumed cognizance for we are told that in fifteen o six the seville tribunal made it the subject of a special inquest there were many arrests and many fugitives and twelve convicts were duly burnt possibly this may have called attention to the incongruity of diverting the inquisition from its legitimate duties with the new christians for a decree of the suprema october eighteen fifteen o nine assumes that this had already been recognized and it informs the tribunals that they are not to deal with the crime as it was not within their jurisdiction this apparently settled the matter as far as the castilian kingdoms were concerned in aragon it does not appear that the early inquisition took cognizance of the matter as is shown by the curious connection of the crime with the rising of the germania in fifteen nineteen the city of valencia was suffering from a pestilence which had driven away most of the nobles and higher officials when on st magdalen's day june fourteenth fray luis castelloli preached an eloquent sermon in which he attributed the pest to the wrath of god excited by the prevalence of the offence the populace were excited and hunted up four culprits who confessed and were duly burnt by the justiciary Hieronimo faragud on july twenty ninth there was a fifth a baker who wore the tonsure and was delivered to the episcopal court which sentenced him to vergüenza this dissatisfied the people who tore him from the spiritual authorities garroted and burnt him the governor was summoned and the leaders of the mob feared punishment there had been a scare concerning a rumoured attack by the moors which had led the trades to form military companies these were further organized elected a chief and swore confraternity when recognizing their strength 
they utilized the opportunity of gratifying their hatred of the nobles and the rebellion broke out in all this the inquisition was evidently not thought of as having jurisdiction but possibly it may have drawn attention to the crime and led to an application to clement the seventh for a special brief placing it under inquisitorial jurisdiction bleda however tells us that when the duke of sessa ambassador at rome made request for such a brief he gave as a reason that it had been introduced into spain by the moors be this as it may the brief of clement february twenty fourth fifteen twenty four recites that sessa had represented the increasing prevalence of the crime and had asked for an appropriate remedy which the pope proceeded to grant the form in which it is drawn shows that the matter was regarded as wholly foreign to the regular duties of the holy office for it is addressed not to the inquisitor-general as usual but to the individual inquisitors of aragon catalonia and valencia and it authorizes them to subdelegate their powers to whom they please they are empowered to proceed against all persons lay or clerical of whatever rank either by accusation denunciation inquisition or of their own motion and to compel the testimony of unwilling witnesses that the offence was not ecclesiastical or heretical was admitted by the limitation that the trial was to be conducted in accordance with local municipal law but yet with singular inconsistency the episcopal ordinary was to be called in when rendering sentence the barcelona tribunal seems to have questioned in fifteen thirty seven whether the brief continued in force for the suprema wrote to it july eleventh that there had not been time to decide this positively but that it might continue to act whatever doubts existed were settled in favor of the inquisition and the aragonese tribunals enjoyed the jurisdiction to the end the archbishop of saragossa had complained of being thus deprived of cognizance of these cases and it was restored to him by a brief of january sixteenth fifteen twenty five but at the request of charles v pope clement july fifteen fifteen thirty evoked all pending cases to himself and committed them to the inquisitors with full power to decide them in conjunction with the ordinary castile was never included within the special grant in answer to some inquiring tribunal the suprema replied november sixth fifteen thirty four that the matter did not pertain to the inquisition nor was it deemed advisable to procure a brief conferring such power this was adhered to in fifteen seventy five the lagrono tribunal was informed that it could not prosecute such cases as it had no faculty and about fifteen eighty the tribunal of peru was told not to meddle with it in any way except in cases of solicitation the consulta magna of sixteen ninety six states that philip the second towards the close of his reign applied to clement the eighth for a brief conferring the power on the castilian inquisition but the pope declined for the reason that the whole attention of the inquisitors should be concentrated on matters of faith majorca although belonging to the crown of aragon was not specifically included in the brief of clement the seventh and never assumed the power when in sixteen forty four the commissioner in Iviza reported to inquisitor francisco gregorio about jaime galastria a cleric denounced for this offence gregorio replied that he had no jurisdiction still the tribunal was accustomed to arrest offenders and hand them over for trial to the secular judges so he sent a warrant for the arrest of galastria even though he had taken asylum in a church it is symptomatic that arrest by the inquisition for a crime over which it had no jurisdiction was considered a matter of course sicily also belonged to aragon but was not included in fifteen sixty nine philip the second ordered the death penalty to be rigidly enforced without exceptions and that the informer should receive twenty ounces from the estate of the convict but this was slackly obeyed by the secular courts and in the concordia of fifteen ninety seven he reserved the crime exclusively to the inquisition with the understanding that a papal brief should be applied for 
relieving inquisitors from irregularity for relaxing culprits application was accordingly made to clement the eighth but after philip's death the viceroy duke of maqueda and the ambassador the duke of sessa at the instance of influential sicilians urged clement to refuse which he not only did but forbade the inquisition to take cognizance of such cases the tribunal complained that this deprived it of its jurisdiction over its own officials to which the reply was that it was not the pope's intention to exonerate them from it the tribunal therefore continued to punish its own guilty ministers and the number of cases cited would seem to indicate that the crime was by no means uncommon the punishments inflicted were comparatively moderate occasionally imprisonment for life or banishment perpetual or temporary from the place of offending or deprivation of office with heavy fines dr martin real who tells us this writing in sixteen thirty eight further informs us that throughout italy the crime was everywhere treated with a leniency wholly inadequate to its atrocity the roman inquisition moreover took no cognizance of it when in sixteen forty four some conventual franciscans rendered themselves conspicuous by sounding the praises of the practice the congregation contented itself with ordering their superiors to proceed against them with severity in portugal Yawo, the third had no sooner got his inquisition into working order than he was seized with the desire to obtain for it jurisdiction over the pecado mayo this he pursued with characteristic obstinacy while the papacy manifested its customary repugnance it was not until after his death that pius the fourth in a brief of february twenty fifteen sixty two committed the decision to the conscience of cardinal henrique confirming in advance what he might do but trials were to be conducted according to municipal law henrique had no scruples but in fifteen seventy four he applied to gregory the thirteenth for confirmation and for using the process for heresy in these cases when again the pope committed to him the decision and ratified it in advance in sixteen forty the regulations prescribed that the offence is to be tried like heresy and the punishment is to be either relaxation or scourging and the galleys in a case occurring in the lisbon auto of seventeen twenty three the sentence was scourging and ten years of galley service end of section sixty five section sixty six of a history of the inquisition of spain volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a history of the inquisition of spain volume four by henry charles lee book eight spheres of action miscellaneous business chapter sixteen part six in their general hostility to the inquisition the aragonese kingdoms objected to this extension of its jurisdiction there were complaints by the cortes and in the various concordias and settlements there were concessions secured which gave to the secular judges some participation in the trials into the details of these more or less temporary arrangements it is scarce worth while to enter except to mention that in the struggle which resulted in the concordia of sixteen forty six aragon gained the point that the crime was recognized as mixti fori to be tried by either the secular court or the inquisition according to priority in commencing action and that familiars were included in this the current practice may be gathered from the answers of valencia and saragossa in response to inquiries by the suprema in fifteen seventy three in valencia arrest was accompanied by sequestration but not in aragon where the crime did not entail confiscation 
in aragon when a new inquisitor was inducted the papal briefs were presented to him and he accepted them and all sentences commenced by qualifying the inquisitors as ueses commissarios apostolacos para conocer on al crimen de sodomia showing that this was a special jurisdiction the routine of procedure in the two tribunals did not vary much the process was somewhat simpler than in heresy trials the accused was allowed ample means of defence and counsel advocates and procurators witnesses names were not suppressed except in valencia when the accused was of high rank in which case the suprema was consulted after the publication of evidence the procurator had the right to examine the witnesses the concordia of fifteen sixty eight had provided that convicts should not appear in autos but in aragon this was left to the discretion of the tribunal which generally exhibited them there these reports make no allusion to the concurrence of secular judges but the practice may be gathered from a letter of philip the second march seventeenth fifteen seventy five to the captain-general of catalonia where it appears that when a convict was relaxed the royal court demanded to see the papers of the case before pronouncing sentence this the king pronounced to be wholly wrong and ordered the custom of valencia and aragon to be followed that when a case was ready for decision the inquisitors notified the captain-general who delegated judges to take part in the consulta after which the sentence was to be executed without further examination torture was freely employed even on the testimony of a single accomplice this raised a question in aragon where the use of torture was forbidden as the trials were to be conducted in accordance with municipal law but the inquisition replied that the brief of clement the seventh had been applied for at the request of the secular judges who had found themselves unable to convict for lack of torture and desired for that reason the inquisition to have jurisdiction the truth of which assertion may well be doubted in sixteen thirty six there was raised a question as to torturing witnesses who revoked but it was decided in the negative punishment varied with time and place in aragon spontaneous confession was encouraged by simply reprimanding the culprit warning him and ordering him to confess sacramentally and this was confirmed by the suprema in a decree of august sixth sixteen hundred in valencia however self-denunciation was visited with scourging and galleys and if testimony of accomplices supervened with relaxation for those accused and regularly convicted the statutory and ordinary punishment was burning when in fifteen seventy seven the captain-general of valencia had some hesitation as to his duty in the case of two culprits relaxed to him by the inquisition philip the second ordered him to execute them promptly and as late as sixteen forty seven in an auto at barcelona one was garroted and burnt yet on the whole there seems to have been a disinclination to relax these offenders who could not escape as heretics could by confession and conversion in sixteen sixteen we find the suprema asking the valencia tribunal why it had not confiscated the estate of dr perez convicted of this crime and in sixteen thirty four it inquires whether there is any fuero prohibiting the pena ordinaria when guilt has been fully proved and the offender is of full age about sixteen forty an experienced inquisitor informs us that in saragossa the penalty for those over twenty-five was relaxation for minors scourging and the galleys but he adds that this is not observed he had seen many thus convicted and condemned to relaxation but the suprema always commuted the penalty ecclesiastics seem to have been regarded as entitled to a special leniency in sixteen eighty four the suprema called to account the valencia tribunal for its benignity in a case of this kind when it replied in much detail 
two decrees of pius v in 1568 it said had prescribed relaxation with preliminary degradation in the case of priests and in 1574 the tribunal had so treated the case of a subdeacon many authorities however held that clerics were not to be subjected to the rigour of the law for this offence and it was the common opinion that incorrigibility was required to justify the ordinary penalty this had been the practice in valencia especially since sixteen fifteen when a priest was convicted of a single act and by order of the suprema was sentenced to an extraordinary penalty this had since been followed in various cases so that clerics were not relaxed unless incorrigible and this was defined to be when repeated punishment showed that the church could not reform them this argument moreover precluded the use of torture which as the tribunal pointed out could be used only when the penalty was worse than torture the case which called forth this explanation affords a very instructive example of the advantage to justice of an open trial with opportunity of cross-examination the accused was fray manuel sanchez del Cancellar y arbustan a distinguished member of the order of la merced the trial had lasted for nearly three years when the papers were submitted to the suprema in august sixteen eighty four there were two accomplice witnesses to consummated acts others to solicitation others to lascivious and filthy actions and others to general foul reputation under the ordinary inquisitorial process condemnation would have been inevitable but repeated examinations and cross-examinations revealed discrepancies and contradictions and variations and a knowledge of the witnesses enabled the accused to present evidence of enmities the conclusion reached by the tribunal was that nearly the whole mass of evidence was the result of a conspiracy embracing a number of frails of the convent incited by jealousy of the honours and position obtained by sanchez still there was some testimony as to indiscretions which was not rebutted and as there had been a great scandal requiring a victim with customary inquisitorial logic he was sentenced to four years exile from valencia orihuela and madrid for the first two of which he was deprived of active and passive voice of confessing and preaching and of all honours in his order in this consideration was given to three years spent in prison so that if innocent he had suffered severely and was sent forth branded with an ineffaceable stigma while if guilty he had a penalty far less than his deserts when the suprema asked why the two witnesses to complicity were not prosecuted the tribunal replied that they were regarded as spontaneously confessing and it was not customary to prosecute in such cases besides although their enmity and contradictions invalidated their testimony these were insufficient to justify prosecution for false witness altogether it was an unpleasant business which the tribunal evidently desired to dispatch with as little damage as possible to the church the tendency towards leniency increased with time and was shown to laymen as well as to ecclesiastics in seventeen seventeen the barcelona tribunal sentenced guillaume amiel a frenchman to four years of presidio and perpetual banishment from spain the suprema commuted the presidio to a hundred lashes but when the sentence was read amiel protested that his father was a gentleman and that he held a patent as teniente del rey cristianissimo thus claiming exemption from degrading corporal punishment the proceedings were suspended and the suprema was consulted which omitted the lashes and on the same account the boy ramon gil who was the accomplice was spared the vergüenza to which he had been condemned the most conspicuous case of this nature in the annals of the inquisition was that of don pedro luis galceran de borja grand master of the order of montesa he was not only a grandee of spain but was allied to the royal house 
he was half brother to francisco de borja duke of grandia and subsequently general of the jesuits and was of kin to nearly all the noblest lineages of the land for his arrest in fifteen seventy one the assent of philip the second was necessary he was not confined in the secret prison but had commodious apartments from which during his trial he conducted the affairs of the order he claimed exemption on the ground of the privileges of the order and more than two years were spent in debating the question though it was pointed out that while the trinitarians had even greater privileges two members professed of that order had recently been relaxed for the same crime and borja was not even a cleric but a married man with children the claim was finally disallowed and the trial went slowly on the evidence reduced itself to two singular witnesses who testified to solicitation and attempt and to one martin de castro who testified to consummation and then revoked powerful influence from all quarters was brought to bear to save the accused and in the final consulta de fe there was discordia two inquisitors and the ordinary voted for acquittal the other inquisitor who was juan de rojas in a written opinion called for four years of exile and a heavy fine the suprema after prolonged correspondence with the tribunal accepted this but changed the exile to six years of reclusion in his convent of montesa lorente intimates that the inquisitors expected to gain bishoprics or at least places in the suprema and that a bargain was made through which on borja's death the order of montesa was incorporated with the crown as the military orders of castile had been under ferdinand to this latter some colour was lent by philip's appointment of borja's natural son to the grand commandership of the order from which he rose to the cardinalate there is an evident allusion to this case in the remark of an italian traveller in fifteen ninety three who when speaking of the severity of the inquisition in these matters illustrates it by the story of a grandee who for merely throwing his arm around the neck of a page spent ten years in prison and fifty thousand ducats cases were sufficiently frequent to give the aragonese tribunals considerable occupation especially after it was included in the edict of faith in fifteen seventy four as a crime to be denounced i have but a few scattering data but they are suggestive thus in saragossa at the auto of june sixth fifteen eighty five there were four culprits relaxed in catalonia in fifteen ninety seven the report by inquisitor heredia of a visitation through the sea of tarragona and parts of those of barcelona viche and urgel contained sixty-eight cases of all kinds and of these fifteen were for this class of offences though most of them were subsequently suspended in valencia there appeared in the autos from january fifteen ninety eight to december sixteen o two twenty-seven of these culprits of whom seven were frails as it was customary to read the sentences con meritos the populace had an edifying education from seventeen eighty to eighteen twenty the total number of cases coming before the three tribunals was exactly one hundred end of section sixty six section sixty seven of a history of the inquisition of spain volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a history of the inquisition of spain volume four by henry charles lee book eight spheres of action miscellaneous business chapter sixteen part seven usury the ecclesiastical definition of usury is not as we understand the term an exorbitant charge for the use of money beyond the legal rate but any interest or other advantage however small or indirect derived from a loan of money or other article 
forbidden by the old law between the chosen people and extended under the new to the brotherhood of man it has been the subject of denunciation continuously from the primitive church to the most recent times ingenuity has been exhausted in devising methods of repression and punishment only to show how impossible has been the task of warring against human nature and human necessities from an early period usury was regarded as an ecclesiastical sin and crime subject to spiritual jurisdiction in both the forum internum and forum externum in twelve fifty eight alexander the fourth rendered it justiciable by the inquisition and at the council of vienne in thirteen twelve the assertion that the taking of interest is not a sin was defined to be a heresy which the inquisition was in duty required to prosecute during the later middle ages when the greater heresies had been largely suppressed the prosecution of usurers formed a considerable and the most profitable portion of inquisitorial activity it is true that the heresy consisted in denying that usury is a sin but as the repertorium of fourteen ninety four explains the usurer or simonist who does not affirm or deny but is silent and tacitly believes it not to be a sin to commit usury or simony is a pertinacious heretic mentally in spain the usurious practices of jews and conversos were the principal source of popular hostility but jews were not subject to the inquisition and in its earlier years it appears not to have recognized its jurisdiction in this matter over the conversos for i have met with no trace at this period of action by it against usury whether in castile or in aragon as regards the latter indeed it was impeded by a furero of the cortes of calatayud in fourteen sixty one prohibiting the prosecution of usurers by both the secular and spiritual courts and the procuring of faculties for the purpose by the inquisition to ensure the observance of this juan the second was required to swear that he would not obtain any papal rescript or commission authorizing inquisition into usury and that if such receipt were had it should not be used but be delivered within a month to the diputados it may be assumed that the inquisition sought relief from this restriction for julius the second issued a uh, motu proprio january fourteen fifteen o four reciting the fuero of calatayud and stating that the usuraria provitus had so increased that a measure of wheat would be multiplied to twenty-five within three years chiefly because the inquisition in consequence of this fuero was precluded from the exercise of its lawful jurisdiction he therefore ordered inquisitor-general deza to prosecute all christian usurers and compel them to desist by inflicting the penalties prescribed by the general council while ferdinand was summoned to aid the inquisitors and he and his successors were released from any oaths to observe the fuero as all commercial and financial transactions at the time were based on interest payment and as the agriculturalist habitually borrowed seed corn before sowing to be repaid with increase after harvest the inquisition thus had an ample field opened for its operations that it did not neglect the opportunity is fairly inferable from the opposition excited it was the subject of one of the most energetic remonstrances of the cortes of manzan in fifteen ten and the concordia of fifteen twelve bore an article in which ferdinand promised to obtain from the pope the revocation of the faculties granted to the inquisitors that he would allow no other grant to be obtained and that meanwhile he would arrange that no prosecutions should be brought except for open assertion that usury was no sin for this as for the other articles he swore to procure the papal confirmation 
inquisitors were likewise sworn to obey the concordia and when ferdinand was released from his oath by leo x in the brief of april thirty fifteen thirteen a motu proprio followed september second to the effect that as heresy and usury are the most heinous of crimes to be prosecuted with the sharpest rigour the inquisitors were released from their oaths and directed to employ the faculties granted by julius the second for the suppression of usury this serves to explain why in the compromise embodied in inquisitor-general mercator's instructions of fifteen fourteen there is no allusion to usury the inquisitors were not to be disturbed in the exercise of their functions in this respect when however leo in fifteen sixteen confirmed the concordia of fifteen twelve he removed usury from inquisitorial jurisdiction and prohibited its prosecution unless the culprit should hold it not to be a sin it has already been seen how completely the inquisition ignored all these agreements in spite of royal and papal confirmations so when charles v was obliged in fifteen eighteen at the cortes of saragossa to take the specific and elaborate oath imposed on juan the second it proved equally futile inquisitors continued to exercise jurisdiction but in aragon proper they were impeded for a time by a brief of clement the seventh january sixteenth fifteen twenty five ordering them to confine themselves in future to heresy a brief procured by juan of austria archbishop of saragossa who claimed jurisdiction over usury for his own court this afforded slender relief for he employed the inquisitorial process and the cortes of saragossa in fifteen twenty eight adopted a fuero confirmed by charles v reciting that the laws provide for the punishment of usurers by the secular courts but that the ecclesiastical judges were prosecuting them wherefore at the desire of the four brazos his majesty ordered the ancient laws of the kingdom to be enforced without exception so long as the inquisition was not involved charles was indifferent as to how usurers were treated but when the catalans at the cortes of manzan in the same year complained of the prosecution of usury by inquisitors and petitioned that it be prevented he dryly answered that the law should be observed and justice should be done no greater satisfaction than this could be had when a few years later the cortes of the three kingdoms reiterated the complaint of the prosecutions for usury by the inquisition inflicting an ineffaceable stain upon parties and their descendants even though they were discharged without penance the reply of the inquisitor-general to this was a simple denial coupled with the demand that the names of injured parties should be produced in the absence of documents it is not easy to understand why the inquisition suddenly abandoned a jurisdiction for which it had contended so strenuously but so it was in fifteen fifty two simancas asserts that inquisitors have no cognizance of questions arising from usury but must leave them to the ordinaries for usurers are not moved by erroneous belief but by the desire for sordid gains in this simancas evidently spoke by authority for the suprema in a carta acordada of march seventeen fifteen fifty four forbade the tribunals to take cognizance of usury and the subject disappears from inquisitorial records the secular and spiritual courts were left to fight the losing battle with industrial and commercial progress which eventually compelled the recognition of the fact that payment for the use of money is customarily profitable to both parties morals the object of the inquisition was the preservation of the purity of faith and not the improvement of morals the view taken of its duties as to the latter is set forth in the comments of the suprema on the report by 
de soto salazar of his visitation in fifteen sixty six of the barcelona tribunal clement abbot of ripoll was prosecuted for saying that so great was the mercy of god that he would pardon a sinner who confessed even though he had not a firm intention to abstain in future and also for keeping a nun as a mistress he was fined in four hundred ducats and was ordered to break off relations with the nun under pain of a thousand ducats the suprema sharply reprimanded inquisitor padilla for inflicting so heavy a penalty and for exceeding his jurisdiction in prohibiting the unlawful connection so when the inquisitors fined jaime boca an unmarried familiar in twelve ducats for keeping a married woman as mistress the suprema told them that it was none of their business it is true that in two other cases of familiars fined in twenty ducats each for keeping mistresses the comment is simply that the rigour was excessive the same principle as we have seen was observed in the treatment of solicitation the question of morals was studiously excluded as a matter entirely beyond the purview of the inquisition and the only point considered was the technical one whether cases came within papal definitions drawn up to safeguard the sacrament of penitence the same remark applies to the vigorous prosecution of those who held simple fornication to be no sin there was no attempt to repress the sin itself for this was beyond the faculties conferred on the inquisition but merely to ascertain and punish the mental attitude of the accused as time passed on however and as the heretics who were the legitimate objects of the holy office grew scarce there arose a tendency to enlarge its sphere of action and to assume the position of acustos morum this has been seen in the censorship which during the later period came to be applied not only to obscene books but to all manner of works of art that did not accord with the censor's standard of decency from this it was an easy step to intervene in the private lives of individuals in matters wholly apart from its legitimate jurisdiction of which we find occasional examples in the later period of decadence thus in seventeen eighty four joseph mas was prosecuted in valencia for singing an improper song at a dance and in seventeen ninety one there is a prosecution of manuel de pino for indecent and irreligious acts in seventeen ninety two the barcelona tribunal takes the testimony of ramon Sirolis of Locke with respect to the scandalous life of the parish priest of that place and his abuse of the holy oils in eighteen ten the valencia tribunal is investigating rosa avenant keeper of a tobacco shop for suspicion of maltreating some children in her house in eighteen sixteen the santiago tribunal sentences don miguel querizetta a post-office official to leave the city where he has led a disorderly and scandalous life and charges him to reconcile himself to his wife and to live with her in eighteen nineteen don antonio clemente de polar is prosecuted by the madrid tribunal for propositions and for dressing in such wise as to satisfy the passions and for other excesses in these and similar cases it may be assumed that the parties inculpated richly deserved correction but this sporadic defence of virtue and punishment of vice was much more likely to encourage the gratification of malice than to elevate the standard of public morals and the employment of the tremendous machinery of the inquisition in such matters marks the depth of its fall from its former height had its object from the beginning been the purification of morals as well as of religion possibly the awe which it inspired in all classes might have resulted in some ethical improvement but during the time of its power the impression that it produced was that morals were of slender account in comparison with faith and in the day of its decline these occasional attempts to extend its jurisdiction could only produce exasperation without amendment end of 
section sixty seven section sixty eight of a history of the inquisition of spain volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a history of the inquisition of spain volume four by henry charles lee book eight spheres of action miscellaneous business chapter sixteen part seven the seal of confession when in twelve sixteen the fourth council of lateran rendered auricular confession imperative it was essential that the father confessor should be bound to preserve absolute silence as to the sins revealed to him for a time there were some exceptions admitted as heresy for instance but eventually the obligation became universal and the schoolmen exhausted their ingenuity in devising the most extreme cases by which to illustrate the inviolability of what has become known as the seal of confession human nature being what it is and priestly nature being subject to human infirmities the violation of the seal has at all times been a source of anxiety and the object of rigorous punishment administered to the secular clergy by the spiritual courts and to the regulars by their superiors the roman inquisition in the first half-century of its existence assumed exclusive cognizance of the offence and demanded that all offenders whether secular or regular should be tried by its tribunals but in sixteen o nine it abandoned its jurisdiction and left them to their bishops and prelates as the heresy involved in betraying the confidence of the penitent was only an inferential error as to the sacrament an artificial pretext like that devised with regard to solicitation the spanish inquisition did not hold it to be comprised in the general delegation of faculties but that a special papal commission was requisite no attempt seems to have been made to obtain this until sixteen thirty nine when on october eleventh the suprema addressed philip the fourth a consulta setting forth that numerous denunciations were received by the tribunals against confessors who revealed confessions and that inquisitors were asking urgently for permission to prosecute such cases as violations of divine natural and political law rendering culprits suspect in the faith this being even more derisory of the sacrament than solicitation it was notorious that the ordinaries did not check it among the secular clergy nor their prelates among the regulars nor could in such hands any remedy be efficacious because in public trials the witnesses would be bought off or frightened off and there were no secret prisons to assure the necessary segregation of the accused the king was therefore asked to procure from the pope for the inquisition exclusive jurisdiction over the offence the suprema probably did not exaggerate as to the denunciations received by the tribunals for in the minor one of the canaries we find it in sixteen thirty seven receiving testimony against diego artiaga priest of hierro for this offence in sixteen forty three against diego salgado priest of la palma and in sixteen forty four against fray matias pinto of tenerife there can be no doubt that philip as usual acceded to the request of the suprema but urban the eighth seems not to have been responsive he had a plausible reason for declining in the fact that the roman inquisition had abandoned its jurisdiction over the matter and at the moment he was at odds with the spanish over the question of censorship and of the plomos del sacromonte the offence was never included in the edict of faith but occasionally it is enumerated among the charges against confessors on trial for solicitation as in the cases of the franciscan fray juan panchon de salas 
in mexico in seventeen twelve of the carmelite ventura de san joaquin in seventeen ninety four and of fray antonio ortuno in eighteen o seven it was difficult to eradicate belief in the competence of the inquisition and as lately as eighteen o eight jose antonio alvarez priest of horcajo de los montes was denounced for this offence to the toledo tribunal but the trial was suspended probably through doubt as to jurisdiction when the question was brought up squarely in the case of dr don francisco tornio before the valencia tribunal after due discussion it decided march twenty eighth eighteen sixteen that it had no jurisdiction and the case was accordingly dismissed general utility the efficient organization of the inquisition and the dread which it inspired caused it to be invoked in numberless contingencies most diverse in character and wholly foreign to the objects of its institution a brief enumeration of a few of these will serve to complete our survey of its activity and trivial as they may seem to illustrate how powerful was the influence which it exercised over the social life of spain the value of its services arising from the indefinite extent of its powers was recognized early in fourteen ninety nine a benedictine monastery complained to ferdinand that it had pledged a cross to a certain pedro de santa cruz and could not recover it as he had placed himself under protection of dominicans who claimed exemption from legal processes ferdinand thereupon ordered the inquisitors of the city to settle the matter they neglected it and he wrote again peremptorily instructing them to seize the cross and do justice between the parties in april fifteen hundred the king instructs the valencia tribunal to recover for don ramon lopez of the royal guard two runaway slaves and some plate which they had stolen evidently there was no little variety of duties expected of the holy office in fifteen eighteen a nunnery of clares in calateud complained that within ten paces of their house there had been built a mercenarian convent of which the inmates were disorderly the nuns could not walk in their garden without being seen and great scandals were apprehended charles v applied to leo x to have the mercenarians replaced by benedictines or geronimites and the inquisition was invoked to assist parties sometimes obtained papal briefs to have their suits transferred to the tribunals in fifteen forty eight dona aldonza cerdan did this in a litigation with don hernando de la caballeria and in fifteen sixty one dona isabel de francia in a suit with don juan de heredia in both cases the inquisitors of saragossa refused to act until inquisitor-general valdez ordered them to do so all inquisitors were not thus self-restrained for when about this time a general command was issued forbidding them to prosecute for perjury committed in other courts it shows that they had been asked to do so and that some of them at least were ready to undertake such business in sixteen forty seven when the prevalence of duelling called for some effective means of repression among the remedies proposed was that sending a challenge should be made a matter for the inquisition on the ground that the infamy accruing to the offender and his descendants would be the most effective discouragement to punctilious gentlemen the suggestion apparently was not adopted but it illustrates the readiness to have recourse to the elastic jurisdiction of the holy office the jesuits found the inquisition of much service when through the favour of olivares they were enabled to invoke its intervention in one of their quarrels with the dominicans in sixteen thirty four fray francisco rales issued a pamphlet against the society and dr espino an ex carmelite published two others they were answered by padre salazar and there the matter might have ended but the jesuits appealed to philip the fourth and to olivares who promised satisfaction and ordered the inquisitor-general soto mayor himself a dominican to take action with the significant hint that he would be watched 
a royal decree of january twenty ninth sixteen thirty five rebuked the suprema for lack of zeal and ordered it to act with all diligence and to inflict severe punishment it responded promptly on february first with an edict suppressing the pamphlet of Raleigh's under heavy penalties but this did not suffice and on june thirtieth it prohibited every one layman or ecclesiastic from saying anything in private or in public derogatory to any religious order or the members thereof under exemplary penalties to be rigorously executed a decree which had to be repeated in sixteen forty three on june twenty seventh sixteen thirty five the three obnoxious pamphlets were burned with unprecedented ceremony there was a solemn procession of the officials and familiars with the standards of the inquisition while a mule with carmine velvet trappings bore a chest painted with flames in which were the condemned writings it traversed the principal streets to the plaza where a fire was lighted a herald with sound of trumpet proclaimed that the company of jesus was relieved of all that had been said against it and that these papers were false calumnious impious and scandalous they were cast by the executioner into the flames and then the box and the procession wended their way solemnly back to the dominican college of san tomas the effect of the demonstration however was somewhat marred by the populace believing that the box contained the bones of a misbelieving jew and accompanying the procession with shouts of death to the dogs and other pious ejaculations espina was arrested and incarcerated not for the last time for in sixteen forty three he boasted that he had been imprisoned fifteen times for his attacks on the jesuits roales was more fortunate he was a chaplain philibert of savoy his pamphlet had been printed in milan and he was safe in rome but a printer who had issued an edition in saragossa was arrested and presumably sent to the galleys and a dominican fray cagnamero who had circulated the three pamphlets was ordered to be arrested but seems to have saved himself by flight still the irrepressible conflict continued and the inquisition was kept busy in prosecuting offenders and suppressing obnoxious utterances it even construed its duty so rigidly that it condemned a memorial of the unfortunate creditors who suffered by the bankruptcy in sixteen forty five of the jesuit college of san hermengildo in seville when some three hundred depositors lost four hundred and fifty thousand ducats and were struggling to rescue the remaining assets from the hands of the jesuits the granada tribunal did not pause to inquire as to its jurisdiction when in may sixteen forty six owing to the scarcity of wheat there were bread riots and the mob had control of the city it summoned all the grain measurers and porters under pain of excommunication to appear before it on a matter of importance by examining them considerable stores of hidden corn were revealed the corregidors registered it and the price was fixed at forty-two reales this was volunteer action but in sixteen forty eight when a pestilence was raging in valencia the tribunal was called upon to maintain the quarantine at one of the city gates the king on february one sixteen forty nine notified the suprema that the pest had ceased in valencia but that it was violent at cadiz san lucar and other places and urged continued vigilance to which the suprema replied that it had since april done its full duty but that the municipal officials were very negligent and it asked him to order them to do their share apparently the inquisition was relied upon for quarantine work as lately as july two eighteen eighteen the suprema wrote to all the tribunals that the plague had appeared at tangier and threatened spain with the most terrible of calamities the king had ordered energetic precautions in which all branches of the government must cooperate and it was no time for hesitation or scruples the tribunals were therefore instructed to keep watch on the officials of all departments and see that they did their duty and if they could devise more effective measures they were invited to make suggestions 
the unlimited interference of the inquisition with matters pertaining to episcopal supervision is seen in two or three cases tried by the madrid tribunal may five sixteen fifty six it sentenced the priest francisco perez lozano to exile for a year from various places for his share in founding a confraternity with what were called statutos execrable february sixth sixteen eighty eight juan moreno de piedrola a priest of the congregation of san salvador who proposed to establish a congregation in the rules of which the tribunal discovered censurable propositions was ordered to surrender all the papers and not to discuss it in word or writing and was exiled until he should have permission to return with warning that otherwise he would be prosecuted with the full rigor of the law as he was not required to abjure even de levi it shows that there was no suspicion of heresy involved then in sixteen ninety seven fray juan maldonado of the order of san juan de dios had three years of exile for preaching in the church of his covenant at quidad real a sermon characterized as burlesque and scandalous though there is no hint of its being in any way heretical this perpetual intrusion into all manner of affairs irrespective of heresy rather increased towards the last in seventeen eighty eight antonio lopez was prosecuted in valencia for selling rosaries with bones made of clay as relics in seventeen eighty nine andres uanez a coachman for a conversation on a superstitious subject in seventeen ninety one the carmelite fray bonifacio de san pablo for attempting to print a satirical paper josef de la rosa in cordova for carrying a consecrated wafer in a relic bag vincente fellerit in valencia for a vain observance in seventeen ninety five don miguel catala fiscal in bugnol and josef sanchez mesquifa a scrivener were prosecuted for using in drafting testaments the words diversos attributos when alluding to the trinity in seventeen ninety nine juan rodriguez a priest in santiago for assisting and performing ceremonies in a mock marriage in eighteen o eight josef varquez de la torre a scrivener of valencia for drawing a deed of separation between spouses in eighteen eighteen in valencia vincente micus priest of cedrillos for not wanting his parishioners to die in the franciscan habit as all these cases presuppose denunciation they illustrate the popular estimate of the all-embracing powers of the inquisition and the espionage under which every spaniard lived in fact there was scarce anything in which the inquisition did not feel itself authorized to intervene the latitude with which inquisitors construed their own powers is manifest in their assuming to issue licenses to hunt in prohibited places sometimes for their own benefit and sometimes for that of others this was an abuse which the suprema strove to correct by forbidding it in fifteen twenty seven but it was so persistent that the prohibition had to be repeated in fifteen thirty and again in fifteen sixty six as the inquisition was supreme within its jurisdiction and claimed the right to define the extent of its powers there was no one to call it to account for their arbitrary exercise if any other body in the state felt that its rights were invaded the only recourse was to the sovereign and we have seen how under the hapsburgs the crown with scarce an exception decided in its favour end of section sixty eight Section 69 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9 conclusion chapter one decadence and extinction part one the inquisition may be said to have reached its apogee under philip the fourth we have had ample opportunity to see how that pious monarch yielded to its aggressiveness 
until it became a virtually independent organization within the state obeying the royal mandates or not as best suited its convenience and engaged in almost perpetual controversies with the other branches of the government while the king with rare exceptions submitted to its exigencies it is true that in his financial distress he compelled the restitution of a small part of the confiscations and that he asserted the royal prerogative of making and unmaking inquisitors-general and of appointing members of the suprema but when once he had exercised the power his appointees acted in independence it would not be easy to imagine a more complete assertion of irresponsible authority than the sudden arrest of villa and Nueva, of a leading minister in the absence of the sovereign at a time of the utmost confusion when nothing would have been risked by delay save perhaps that the sovereign might have refused assent yet not only did philip condone this but he threw himself into the persecution of his favourite with such ardour that he could scarce restrain himself from risking a rupture with the holy see in defence of the holy office under the disastrous regency of maria anna of austria and the reign of carlos the second the royal authority almost disappeared and although this gave such men as nitard and valadares opportunity to assert still further the independence of the inquisition it also enabled don john of austria to banish nitard and the other governmental departments to emulate its disregard of the royal authority there was an omen of the future when they united in sixteen ninety six in the junta magna to protest against the encroachments of the inquisition and to demand its withdrawal into its proper limits although by dexterous management the attempt was baffled the bourbons with the advent of the bourbon dynasty a new element entered into the political organization of spain the absolutism of louis the fourteenth had embraced the church as well as the state and the gallican theories as to the power of the holy see were encouraged in order to assure the headship of the crown it was inevitable that philip v and his french advisers should entertain very different views as to the relations between the king and the inquisition from those which had been current for a century even at the height of the war of succession we have seen how philip in the affair of Froilan diaz intervened as master and regulated the relations between the inquisitor-general and the suprema how he undertook to reform the inquisition and how in many ways he curbed its audacity but for a court intrigue working through philip's uxoriousness macanath might have succeeded in his project of rendering the inquisition wholly subordinate to the crown and though the vindictiveness of the holy office inflicted on him lifelong punishment for the attempt this did not prevent the continued assertion of the royal supremacy as we have had occasion to see in repeated instances and in many different directions philip's assertion of the royal prerogative however by no means implied any lack of zeal for the faith and as long as the inquisition confined itself to its duties of exterminating heresy it had his cordial support frequent allusions have been made above to its renewed activity during the period following the close of the war of succession full statistics are lacking but in sixty-four autos between seventeen twenty one and seventeen twenty eight there appeared nine hundred and sixty two culprits and effigies of whom one hundred and fifty one were relaxed that this met his hearty approbation is manifested by the letter which he addressed january fourteenth seventeen twenty four to his son lewis when abdicating in his favour in this the exhortations breathing a lofty morality are accompanied with earnest injunctions to maintain and protect the inquisition as the bulwark of the faith for to it is attributable the preservation of religion in all its purity in the states of spain so that the heresies which have afflicted the other lands of christendom causing in them ravages so deplorable and horrible have never gained a foothold there smallpox cut short the reign of louis to seven months after which philip was obliged to resume the weary burden till death released him july the ninth seventeen forty six and if during this later portion of his government 
the inquisition was less busy this may safely be attributed to flagging energies and lack of material and not to any restraint on the part of the sovereign the punishment which he allowed it to inflict on Belando for the history of his reign of which he and his queen after careful scrutiny had accepted the dedication shows how untrammelled was its exercise of its recognised functions yet philip unwittingly started the movement that was ultimately to undermine the foundations on which the inquisition rested he brought with him from france the conviction that the king should be the patron of letters and learning and he had the ambition to rule over a people of culture he aroused the slumbering intellect of spain by founding the academies of language and of history and of medicine the seminary of the nobles and the national library and he replaced for catalonia the university of lerida by that of thevera notwithstanding the vigilance of the censorship it was impossible that the awakening intelligence of the nation thus stimulated should not eagerly grasp at the forbidden fruit of modern philosophism all the more attractive in that it had to be enjoyed in secret fernando the sixth from seventeen forty six to seventeen fifty nine followed his father's example in encouraging the spread of culture carlos the third was even more energetic in urging the enlightenment of his subjects and thus there was gradually formed a public few in numbers it is true but including the statesmen in power which had lost the old spanish conception that purity of faith was the first essential and regarded the inquisition as an encumbrance save in so far as it might be used for political ends the inquisition still inspired fear and the case of olavide shows that these opinions had to be cherished in secret but the number who entertained them was indicated when the bonds of society were loosened and the national institutions crumbled in the earthquake of the napoleonic invasion possibly the diffusion of this modern rationalistic spirit insensibly affecting even those opposed to it may partly explain the rapidly diminishing activity of the inquisition the great tribunal of toledo in the fifty-five years from seventeen forty to seventeen ninety four inclusive dispatched but fifty-seven cases or an average of but one a year this cannot be attributed to a lack of culprits for bigamy blasphemy solicitation sorcery and similar offences which furnished so large a portion of the penitents of old were as rife as ever the fact is that the officials were becoming indifferent and careless except in the matter of drawing their salaries when on may twenty second seventeen fifty three the priest miguel de alonso garcia was to be sentenced in the audience chamber with closed doors and in the presence of the officials it happened that there were no witnesses of the solemnity because none of the officials were to be found in the secreto the personnel of the inquisition was visibly deteriorating and consequently forfeiting the respect of the community there had long been complaint of the insufficiency of the salaries which had remained stationary while the purchasing power of money had greatly diminished and there had been no reduction in the official staffs to correspond with the dwindling business thus in spite of the emplomania characteristic of the nation and of the privileges and exemptions attached to official position it became increasingly difficult to fill the offices properly as early as seventeen nineteen the inquisitors of barcelona complained to the suprema of the trouble they experienced getting people to serve on account of the lack of desire for the offices and the absence of advantage accruing from them in seventeen thirty seven we find that the toledo tribunal had neither a commissionary nor a notary in guadalajara the capital of a province which in seventeen eighty seven numbered one hundred and twelve thousand seven hundred and fifty souls in 1750 a writer deplores that the stipend of 800 ducats is insufficient to support the dignity of an inquisitor so that the inquisitor general is not always able to make fitting nominations this necessitates the appointment of calificadores to examine the doctrines brought under review resulting in the indefinite prolongation of cases and also in lack of vigilance to suppress the errors perpetually propagated in books when the calificadores are not paid they are slow in their work 
and to escape paying them many things which ought to be referred to them are passed over that the respect felt for the inquisition should diminish under these circumstances was inevitable and altogether at this period it presents the aspect of an institution which had survived the causes of its creation and was hastening to its end yet it had exercised too powerful an influence in moulding the spanish character for it to disappear when its mission was accomplished and we shall see how violent were the struggles attendant upon its dissolution meanwhile it dragged on its existence under constantly increasing limitations fernando the sixth it is true gave it obstinate support in its quarrel with benedict the fourteenth over the works of cardinal norris but he dealt a severe blow when in seventeen fifty one he deprived of the huero the officials of the tribunal of lima carlos the third who succeeded in seventeen fifty nine came from naples with the highest ideals of royal supremacy coupled with less respect for ecclesiastical claims than was current in spain he surrounded himself with advisers such as rhoda campomanes aranda and florida blanca who were more than suspected of leanings to modern philosophism and his reign of benevolent despotism was marked with a series of measures designed to diminish or abolish the privileges of inquisitorial officials to repress abuses and to tame arrogance the complete control which he assumed over its functions is exhibited in the rules imposed in seventeen sixty eight on its censorship and in seventeen seventy and seventeen seventy seven on its jurisdiction over bigamy when he ordered it in future to limit its operations to the suppression of heresy and not to embarrass the royal courts the theory thus developed of the relations between the crown and the holy office is formulated in a consulta of the council of castile november thirtieth seventeen sixty eight the king as patron founder and endower of the inquisition possesses over it the rights inherent in all royal patronage as father and protector of his vassals he can and ought to prevent the commission of violence and extortion on their persons property and reputation indicating to ecclesiastical judges even in their exercise of spiritual jurisdiction the path pointed out by the canons so that these may be observed the regalias of protection and of this indubitable patronage have established solidly the authority of the prince in issuing the instructions which he has deigned to give to the holy office acting as an ecclesiastical tribunal under such conditions he was quite content with its existence and when rhoda suggested its suppression and presented various documents to show that this had been discussed under charles v philip the second and philip v he merely replied the spaniards want it and it gives me no trouble in fact the time had not arrived for such drastic measures the abbe clement reports a conversation with aranda october twenty ninth seventeen sixty eight in which the count warned him that it was necessary to speak of the inquisition with great reserve for people imagined that all religion depended on it it was in truth an obstacle to all improvement but time would be required to deal with it and he advised clement to allude to it only to rhoda and campomanes end of section sixty nine section seventy of a history of the inquisition of spain volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a history of the inquisition of spain volume four by henry charles lee book nine conclusion chapter one decadence and extinction part two with the accession in seventeen eighty eight of carlos the fourth there opened for spain a new and disastrous epoch timid irresolute indolent he had fallen completely under the influence of his wife maria luisa an energetic and self-willed woman until seventeen ninety two he kept in office florida blanca 
who was succeeded for a short time by aranda and then power was grasped by manuel godoy subsequently known as prince of peace cadet of an obscure family of badajoz he had entered the royal bodyguard where he attracted the attention of the queen whose favoured lover he was universally believed to be as well as the favourite of her husband he speedily rose to the highest dignities and became omnipotent although a court intrigue occasioned his dismissal in seventeen ninety eight he was restored in eighteen hundred remaining arbiter of the destinies of spain until the tumult of lackeys at aranjuez in eighteen o eight directed against him caused the abdication of carlos in favour of his son fernando the seventh light-headed selfish vain and unscrupulous he was mainly responsible for the misfortunes which overwhelmed his country and from which it may be said not to have as yet recovered the outbreak of the french revolution gave a new importance to the inquisition when the seductive theories of the french philosophers were preached as the foundation of practical politics overturning thrones and threatening monarchical institutions with the doctrines of the social compact the sovereignty of the people and the universal brotherhood of man the holy office might claim that as the foundations of social order were based on religion its labours were essential for the safety of the state while the state recognised that it was the most available instrumentality for the suppression and exclusion of the heresies of liberty and equality in this tumultuous breaking down of the standards of thought and belief in this emergence of a new order on the ruins of the old the functions of the inquisition adapted themselves to the exigencies of the times in other ways besides the increased sharpness and vigilance of its censorship i have frequently had occasion above to refer to an alphabetical list of all the persons denounced to the various tribunals from seventeen eighty to eighteen twenty some five thousand in all and this taken as a whole affords us an insight into the change in the objects of inquisitorial activity judaism and islam and protestantism no more claim its attention the church is no longer threatened by enemies from without what it has to dread is revolt among its own children three-fifths of the denunciations are for propositions largely among the cultured classes including a fair proportion of ecclesiastics their precise errors are not stated but doubtless many were jansenistic and more were hostile to the claims of the church militant and to the absolutism of the monarchy there is also a large class of cases virtually unknown a century earlier significant of a vital change in the intellectual tendencies of the nation calling for the special vigilance of the inquisition popular indifferentism is revealed in the numerous prosecutions for inobservance or contempt of church observances even more noteworthy are those for outrages on images of christ the virgin and the saints and even for sacrilegious treatment of the venerable sacrament in many other ways was manifested the weakening of the profound and unquestioning veneration which for three centuries had been the peculiar boast of the spanish race on the other hand it is not a little remarkable that there are very few cases of offences against the inquisition for in all these forty years there are but nine that can in any way be included in this class at the same time when we recall the old-time punctilious enforcement of profound respect it argues no little decline in popular awe when in seventeen ninety one a simple parish priest dr joseph hines of polop alicante dared to address the valencia tribunal in terms of violent indignation at the conduct of its secretary dr pascal perez when on a mission to collect testimony he tells the tribunal that if it does not dismiss perez it will sink greatly in his estimation and his whole epistle breathes a spirit of independence and equality wholly impossible at an earlier time it was not without reason that in seventeen ninety three the tribunal in appealing for increase of salaries 
complained of the decline in popular respect for its officials, which it attributed to their meagre pay and the curtailment of their privileges. How completely the tribunals had lost their former energy is indicated by the abandonment, about this time, as we have seen, volume 2, page 98, of the publication of the Edict of Faith, which of old had been so impressively solemnized and had proved at once so fruitful a source of denunciations and so powerful a means of maintaining popular awe. Coincident with this, and as though the Inquisition felt that it was on trial before the people, there was a marked tendency towards amelioration of procedure, coupled with benignity in the treatment of culprits. Allusion has been made above to the introduction of the Audiencia de Cargos, through which the accused was afforded an opportunity of knowing what was alleged against him, and frequently of clearing himself without the disgrace of arrest and trial. There is a very suggestive instance of merciful consideration in 1791 in the case of Joseph Casals, a weaver, charged before the Barcelona tribunal with the utterance of shocking blasphemies in the church of Santa Catalina. A century earlier he would have been arrested, and, on proof of the offence, he would have been sentenced to scourging or the galleys. In place of this, Padre Miguel Alberque was instructed to report secretly as to the character of the accused, which he did to the effect that Casals had regular certificates of confession, but was of quick temper and occasionally broke out in curses. Then a commission was issued to Alberque to summon Casals and to represent to him the gravity of his offence and of the punishment incurred and the mercy shown by the tribunal, which would keep a watch on him. In pursuance of this, the good priest reported that Casals was deeply repentant and desired to be heard in confession, which he had permitted. The case is trivial, but of such was the bulk of inquisitorial business and the temper in which it was conducted was of no little import to the people at large. Partly this may be attributable to the modern softening of manners, partly to a growing sense of insecurity, and partly to the inertia which led the officials to shun all avoidable labour. It was becoming more and more a political machine, and neglectful of the objects of its creation. During the Inquisitor Generalship of Manuel Abad y La Sierra, from 1792 to 1794, we are told that in all Spain there were but sixteen condemnations to public penance. Abad was an enlightened man. He thought of assimilating the inquisitorial procedure to that of other courts of justice, and consulted with Lorente as to the formula for such a reform. But conservatism, however relaxed in practice, was not ready for total abandonment of the old methods. His design became known, he was forced to resign, and was relegated to the Benedictine monastery of Sopatran, under a charge, as we have seen, of Jansenism. In fact, an absolute renunciation of the old procedure would have largely deprived the Inquisition of its usefulness in its new political functions, to which its established methods were peculiarly adapted. When, in 1796, a powerful intrigue was formed for the overthrow of Godoy, the Inquisition was naturally selected as the only weapon with which to strike at the favourite. Three friars were found to denounce him, because for eight years he had avoided confession and communion, and because of his scandalous relations with women. Had Inquisitor General Lorenzana been resolute, Godoy's fate might have been that of Olivide, but he was timid. Archbishop Despuig of Seville and Bishop Muthkiv, then of Avila, who were the leaders of the plot, vainly assured him that Godoy's arrest would ensure success. He refused to act except under orders from Pius the Sixth. Despuig then prevailed upon his friend Cardinal Vincenti to induce the Pope to write to Lorenzana, reproaching him with his indifference to a scandal so hurtful to religion. It chanced that Vincenti's letter, enclosing that of Pius, was intercepted at Genoa by Napoleon, who, to ingratiate himself with Godoy, forwarded to him the correspondence. 
godoy assured his position and took a mild revenge which does credit to his sense of humour by sending lorenthana despuig and muthkiv into honourable exile as special envoys to condole with the pope on the occupation of his territories by the french in fact Kappa Mane describes the inquisition of the period as devoted to the unholy work of an inquisition of state in order to preserve its imperilled existence and its ministers as trembling at the sight of the infamous favourite when they had the honour of joining the crowd of his flatterers End of section seventy Section 71 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 1. Conclusion Decadence and Extinction Part 3 Inquisitors might reasonably feel anxious as to their position, for projects of reform were in the air. Gaspar Melchor de Jovellanos, the most conspicuous Spaniard of his time for intellectual ability and rectitude, had been exiled from the court in 1790 and had betaken himself to his native Gijón, where for years he labored in founding the Instituto Astrianze, desiring to endow it with a library of scientific works, he applied in 1795 to Lorenzana for license to import them, but Lorenzana refused on the ground that there were good Spanish writers, rendering recourse to foreigners unnecessary especially as foreign books had corrupted the professors and students in various universities. A process of reasoning applied to works on physics and mineralogy, which Jovellanos characterized as Monumento de Barbary. The attention thus drawn to his library aroused the suspicion of the commissioner of the Inquisition, Francisco Lopez Hill, priest of Somio, who secretly entered it one day while the owner was taking his siesta. Word was brought to him and he hastened thither, finding Hill examining a volume of Locke. Jovellanos turned him out, telling him that his office rendered him an object of suspicion and forbidding him to enter the building without permission. Hill became a spy and was probably the order of denunciation, which caused Jovellanos years of captivity. He was suddenly recalled from his exile November 23, 1797, to assume the position of Minister of Gracia y Justicia, where he speedily gave the Inquisition abundant cause to dread him. A competencia has arisen between Seville Tribunal and the Episcopal authorities over a confessional, which it had ordered to be closed. The matter came before Carlos, who instructed Jovellanos to obtain the opinion of Tabira, bishop of Osma, which he duly transmitted to the king, February 15, 1798, with a representation arguing that the time had come to restore to the bishops their old jurisdiction in matters of faith. The object for which the Inquisition was established had been attained. Its process was cumbrous and inefficient, and its members were ignorant. The jurisdiction of the bishops could alone furnish an effective remedy for existing evils, a jurisdiction more natural, more authoritative, more grateful to the people, and fuller of humanity and gentleness, as emanating from the power granted to them by the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, the authority that had been usurped from them should be restored. Moreover, he took into the consideration the condition of the Holy See, deprived of its temporalities by the French Republic. Everything, he said, pointed to a fearful schism at the death of Pius VI. In each case, each nation must gather itself under its own pastors. 
the papacy would endeavor to retain the cumbrous and costly organization of the curia by increasing its exactions, and it would have to be reduced to the functions exercised during the first eight centuries. Jovellanos was a sincere Catholic, but after utterances so hardy, it was not difficult for his enemies to convince the king that he was inclined to heresy and atheism. Godoy had grown alarmed at the ascendancy which he was acquiring over Carlos. His fellow minister Caballero conspired with the Inquisition, and August 15th, the king signed the dismissal of his minister, whose official life had endured but eight months. A fortnight later, a royal carta orden declared it to be his unalterable will that the holy office should permanently enjoy its jurisdiction and prerogatives without modification. Jovellanos returned to Hyong, where he lived in dignified retirement for two years and a half. His offense, however, had been too great for pardon, and his influence was still dreaded. An anonymous denunciation of the flimsiest character was laid before Carlos, describing him as having abandoned all religion and as being at the head of a highly dangerous party, engaged in schemes for the overthrow of Catholicism and the monarchy. The pusillanimous king adopted the course suggested to him by the secret accuser. Before daybreak of March 13, 1801, the house of Jovellanos was surrounded by a troop of horse. He was aroused from sleep. His papers were seized and transmitted to the Ministry of State. He was kept in house incommunicado for 24 hours, then thrust into a coach and carried still incommunicado across Spain to Barcelona and thence to Mallorca, where he lay in prison until the abdication of Carlos in 1808 and the consequent troubles effected his release. A case nearly parallel was that of Mariano Luis de Urquillo, who followed Jovellanos in the Ministry of Gracia y Justicia. He had no cause to love the Inquisition. Among his useful indiscretion was a translation of Voltaire's Morte de César, which led the Inquisition to make secret investigation, resulting in the conviction that he was dangerously infected with philosophism. He was about to be arrested when Aranda, who recognized his merit, recommended him to the king, and in 1792 he was appointed to a position in Aranda's office. The Inquisition had learned respect for royal officials and substitute for a decree of arrest a summons to an audiencia de cargos, ending in sentence of light suspicion of sharing philosophical errors, absolution ad cautelam, some secret penances, and the suppression of his book, though his name was considerably omitted in the Edict of Prohibition. His official promotion was rapid, and at the age of 30, he found himself a minister, employing his power, possibly with more zeal than discretion, in encouraging the Enlightenment and all human influences. On the death of Pius VI, he incurred ultramontane hostility by inducing the king to sign the decree of September 5, 1799 restoring to the bishops the right of issuing dispensation, a measure which provoked long and bitter discussion. This was followed, as we have seen above, volume 3, page 504, October 11th, by a sharp rebuke to the Inquisition, ordering it to confine itself to its proper duties, and soon afterwards he presented to Carlos for signature a decree suppressing the Inquisition and applying its property to purposes of charity and public utility. This was too bold a measure. The king shrank from the responsibility and Urquillo suddenly succeeded in concentrating upon himself clerical hostility which was reinforced by the enmity of First Consul Bonaparte, whose policy he had opposed. Godoy, who commenced to fear him as a rival and who was irritated by some imprudent jest, withdrew his support. A triple prosecution was commenced against him by three inquisitors 
and he fell in December 1801. He was sent to Pampelunia, to the cell which had been occupied by Florida Blanca, and there he lay for a year or two, deprived of fire, lights, books, and writing materials. He was liberated under surveillance. In 1808, he refused to accompany Carlos and Fernando to Bayon, but he attended the so-called Junta of Notables there, accepted the French domination, served as Secretary of State, and with the other Afrancesados, sought refuge in France in 1813, dying in Paris in 1817. It is evident from all this that the opposition to the Inquisition was gathering strength and boldness, but that its foundations were too deep and solid to be overthrown without an upheaval that should shatter the social fabric. A well-intentioned but somewhat absurd attempt was made by Gregoire, constitutional bishop of Blois, whose fervent Catholicism combined with equally fervent liberalism was of service so essential in piloting the Church of France through the storms of the Revolution. In 1798, he addressed a letter to the Spanish Inquisitor General urging the suppression of the Inquisition and universal toleration as a preliminary to the redemption of Spain from despotism and to enabling it to take its place among the nations which had recovered their rights. This was translated into Spanish and some thousands of copies were circulated. It may have made some secret converts, but the only visible result was to elicit several replies, one of these by Pedro Ruiz Blanco, told Gregoire, with more or less courtesy, to mind his own business, assured him that if the Inquisition was suppressed, Spain would remain as intolerant as ever, and asserted that no Spaniard had ever imagined that coercion could be employed to obtain conversion. It was probably this, mingled with some skillful adulation of the king and his ministers, that procured for the author in 1800, the Episcopate of Leon. There was also an anonymous discurso historico legal, evidently by well-informed inquisitor, probably Risco of Irena. It was the most rational history of the Inquisition that had as yet appeared, although it assures us that the experience showed that the penitents were most grateful for the benevolence shown to them, and that it was a tribunal full of gentleness, the center of benignity, compassion and mercy, but also of justice. A third was by Lorenzo Villanueva, a calificador of Valencia Tribunal, whose defense of the reading of scripture has been alluded to above. It was published under the transparent pseudonym of Lorenzo Astengo, his maternal name. In view of his subsequent career, it is not without interest to see his indignation at the advocacy of toleration and his dithyrambic denunciation of the horrors to which philosophism had led the assertion of human liberty. The first portion of his work is impassioned and rhetorical defense of persecution, supported by ample learning. Vigorous is his denunciation of the modern theories of philosophism and the rights of man, since original sin, he asks, what rights has man saved to slavery, to punishment, and to ruin? So he combats at length the doctrine of the sovereignty of the people, which he stigmatizes as delirium, a dream, and a deception. Yet he admits that the Inquisition is not perfect, that it has committed errors through imprudence, through ignorance, through excessive zeal, through human frailty, and that it has prevented the development of some things which would aid the prosperity of the nation. If, as has been asserted, he expected a bishopric in reward for this, he was disappointed. Thus, at this period, the Inquisition was inert, and its very existence seemed to be threatened, but its potentiality of evil was undiminished. It was still an object of terror to all inclined to liberal opinion, 
and it was regarded by the conservatives as the bulwark protecting the land from the deluge of modern thought. Feeble though it might be in appearance, we shall see how prolonged and stubborn was the contest required for its final suppression. End of section 71 Section 72 of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9. Chapter 1. Conclusion. Decadence and Extinction. Part 4. The Treaty of Fontainebleau, October 27, 1807, dismembered Portugal, of which Godoy was to have the southern portion as an independent kingdom, and the king of Etruria, Ferdinand of Parma, the northern portion. Napoleon sent Gino with an army which, accompanied by Spanish troops, speedily overran the land when Gino issued a decree declaring Portugal annexed to the empire. Simultaneously, French armies under Dupont and Monset entered Spain and occupied the strongholds of Pampeluna, Barcelona, Figueras, and other places. Mura was sent as commander-in-chief and took possession of Madrid. The tumult of Aranjuez drove Godoy from power, and on March 19, 1808, Carlos abdicated in favor of his son, Fernando VII, whose accession was received with enthusiasm by the nation. Boharne, the French ambassador at Madrid, and Mura, however, refused to recognize him. Carlos protested to Napoleon that his abdication had been caused. By various devices, Carlos and his queen, Fernando and his younger brother Don Carlos, were induced to go to Bayonne to lay their respective pretensions before the emperor. There on May 5th, Fernando was obliged to renounce the crown to his father and the latter to transfer it to Napoleon. Carlos and Maria Luisa were sent to Compiègne and Fernando to Valencia, where he remained until 1814. Meanwhile in Madrid, Mura, under instructions, ordered the Infantes Antonio and Francisco, the remaining members of the royal family, to depart for Bayonne on May the 2nd. The indignant populace rose with the aid of few officers and soldiers and after a gallant struggle against the veterans of Napoleon, the insurrection was repressed with heavy slaughter, followed by numerous executions. The heroic Dos de Mayo was the signal of resistance to the invader, and in a few weeks, Spain was aflame. The desperate Six Years' War of Liberation was commenced, and the nation showed what a people could do when abandoned by its incapable and cowardly rulers. With the soldiers' contempt for an unorganized militia, Napoleon pursued his plans. Joseph was called from Naples to occupy the vacant throne and was acknowledged as king by an assembly of notables, convoked at Bayonne in June, which transformed itself in Cortes and adopted a constitution. This summary of the situation is necessary to an understanding of the position of the Inquisition. Whatever may have been the views of the, some of its local tribunals, the central body accepted the intrusive domination and was afrancesado, a term which, to the patriots, became one of the bitterest contempt. The constitution of Bayonne provided that in Spanish territories, no religion save Roman Catholicism should be tolerated. Raymond Edonat, dean of the Suprema, was a member of the Cortes, and when he took the oath of allegiance to Joseph, the latter assured him that Spain was fortunate in that the true faith alone was there honored. 
When the constitution was under consideration, two members, Pablo Arribas and José Gómez Hermosilla, advocated the separation of the Inquisition, but Ethernard and his colleagues of the Inquisition, Galaza, Evia Noriega, and Amarillas, successfully opposed it. Although they admitted that in conformity with public opinion, its procedures should be made to conform to that of the spiritual court in criminal cases. The Inquisition thus deemed itself safe and earnestly supported the Napoleonic government. After sanguinary suppression of the Madrid rising on May the 2nd, it made haste to counteract the impression produced and on the 6th the Suprema addressed the circular letter to the tribunals describing the affair as a scandalous attack by the lowest mob on the troops of the friendly nation who had given no offense and observed strictest order and discipline. Such demonstrations, it said, could only result in turbulence and in destroying the confidence due to the government, which was the only one that could advantageously direct patriotic energies. The tribunals were therefore instructed to impress on their subordinates and the commissioners and familiars in their district the urgent necessity of unanimously contributing to the preservation of public tranquillity. This communication was received by Valencia Tribunal on May 9th, and on the 11th it was read to the assembled officials, calificadores, notaries, and familiars of the city, with exhortation to comply strictly with its commands, action which was doubtless taken by other tribunals. The Inquisition thus remained in Madrid under the protection of the French arms, but its freedom of action was curtailed. The Abate Marchena, a fine classical scholar but revolutionary and tinctured with atheism, had abandoned Spain early in the French Revolution and had barely escaped the guillotines during the terror. He returned in 1808 as Murat's secretary when the Inquisition thought fit to arrest him, but Mura sent a file of grenadiers and forcibly released him. When Napoleon reached Madrid, December 4, 1808, the capitulation granted to the city provided that no religion but Catholicism could be tolerated, but on the same day he issued a decree which suppressed the Inquisition as contrary to the sovereignty and to civil authority, and confiscated its property to the crown. The inquisitor Francisco Riesco stated during the debate in the Cortes of Cadiz that this sudden decree was motivated by the refusal of the members of the Suprema to take the oath of allegiance to the new dynasty, but this is evidently incorrect, as most of them had already done so at Bayonne, and Arce y Reynoso, who resigned his inquisitor generalship, adhered to the French and accompanied them on the final evacuation. Riesco further asserts that Napoleon ordered them to be imprisoned, but they escaped and scattered to the place of safety. The Inquisition was thus left in an anomalous position and without a head, for correspondence with Pius VII was cut off and neither his acceptance of Arce's resignation nor his delegation of powers to a successor could be had. The Junta Central, which was striving to govern the country, attempted to fill the vacancy with Pedro de Quevedo y Quintano, bishop of Orense, but he could obtain no papal authorization and made no attempt to act. It was argued that during a vacancy the jurisdiction continued with the Suprema, but this was denied and it remained an open question. During the period which followed, the tribunals maintained their organizations and exercised their function after a fashion when not prevented by French occupation. Thus, when the invaders reached Seville February 1, 1810, the Inquisition was suppressed but its members took refuge in Ceuta. Valencia remained in operation until the city was captured by Suse in 1811, while Barcelona at one time transferred itself to Tarragona. 
Activity was intermittent and in the excitement of that stirring time. There was little energy for the prosecution of heresy, while even when the enemy had withdrawn, in many cases the buildings had been ruined. The Valencia record shows that the total number of cases brought before all the tribunals in 1808 was 67. In 1809, 22. In 1810, 17. In 1811, 25. In 1812, 1. In 1813, 6. Probably few of these cases were regularly heard, if we may judge from that of Don Vicente Valdez, captain of volunteers who in 1810 was denounced to the Valencia Tribunal for blasphemous propositions. October 27th, it was ordered that in view of circumstances, a fitting occasion should be awaited for the audiencia de cargos demanded by the fiscal, a postponement which proved to be protracted for it was not until 1816 that he was tried. Still, where the Inquisition itself was concerned, it could act swiftly and effectively. In 1809, the French took possession of Santiago. Felipe Sobrino Taboada, professor of civil law in the university, was acting as police magistrate, and by order of the director general of police, he issued a proclamation exhorting the people to lay down their arms and praising the suppression of the Inquisition. When the French retired, the university refused to admit him to his chair. He obtained the decision of Tribunal of Public Safety of Coruña, re-establishing him, and then the Inquisition arrested him without the prescribed preliminary formalities and kept him for five months in the secret prison. Afterwards, he was allowed to keep his house as a prison, and when finally the bounds were enlarged to the province of Galicia, it was with the condition that he would accept no public office. End of section 72section 73 of a history of the inquisition of spain volume 4 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ss kim seoul south korea a history of the inquisition of spain volume 4 by henry charles lee book 9 chapter 1 conclusion decadence and extinction part 5 the junta central which endeavored to govern amid much opposition from the particularist tendencies of the provincial juntas retired to cadiz when the french occupied andalusia on january first eighteen ten it issued a convocation for the assembling of cortes and on the thirty first it dissolved after appointing a regency and imposing on it the duty of convoking the cortes by march first the regency delayed until forced by the pressure of public opinion on june eighteenth it published a decree ordering elections where they had not been held and summoning the deputies to meet in august in isla de leon now san fernando near cadiz suffrage was virtually universal and in the letters of convocation the nation was called upon to assemble in general cortes to establish and improve the fundamental constitution of the monarchy while the commissions of the delegates empowered them to decide all points contained in the letters and all others without exception or limitation the cortes accordingly assumed the title of majesty as embodying the will of the people and occupying the throne of the absent sovereign when they were opened september twenty fourth about a hundred deputies were present two-thirds of whom were elected by the provinces not occupied by the french armies and the rest selected in Cadiz from among natives of the unrepresented district, including the colonies, then more or less in open revolt, while as the vicissitude of the war permitted, 
deputies came straggling in from districts unrepresented at first. As a whole, the body fairly reflected existing public opinion. The liberals numbered 45, and the majority consisted of ecclesiastics, men of the privileged classes and government employees. It was an unavoidably hazardous experiment, this sudden wrenching of Spain from the old moorings and launching it on the tempestuous waters of modern idea, under the conduct of men without training or experience in self-government. Grave mistakes were inevitable, and their constructive work was idealistic and doomed to failure, a failure bound to result in blood and misery. At the moment, however, there were no misgivings and the Cortes were regarded as the salvation of the nation. The oath administered to members bound them to maintain Catholicism as the exclusive religion of Spain and to preserve for their beloved monarchy Fernando VII and all his dominion. Their first act was to adopt a series of five resolutions offered by an ecclesiastic, Diego Munoz Torero, a rector of University of the Salamanca, of whom one provided that the regency should be continued as the executive power, on taking an oath recognizing the sovereignty of the nation as embodied in the Cortes and promising obedience to their enactment. Rather than do this, the regency proposed to break up the Cortes but the threatening aspect of the people and the army caused a change of heart, and that same night they took the oath, except the implacable conservative, Quevedo, bishop of Orense, who resigned both from the regions and the Cortes. His resignations were accepted, but he was forced to take the oath required of all prelates and officials before he was allowed to retire to his diocese. It was evident that the Cortes and the Regency could not pull together. On October 28, the letter was dismissed and its membership was reduced from five to three and a new Regency was installed with which the Cortes could work in harmony. After settling relations with other departments of the state, the first attention of the Cortes was given to the freedom of press. Two days after the opening session, the subject was introduced and referred to a committee. No time was lost. A decree was reported October 8th, and on the 18th, in spite of the reclamation of the opposition, it was passed by a vote of 68 to 32. This was regarded as a preliminary attack on the Inquisition, which was thus deprived by the implication of the function of censorship. Some members desired this to be explicitly stated, giving rise to the hot debate in which Inquisitor Riesco, a member of Cortes, pleaded in vain for some honorable mention of the Holy Office. There was also indignation excited by the provision subjecting prohibition by the bishops to revision by secular power, which was subversive of the imprescriptible rights of the Church, whose judgments are final. If this was really the first move in a campaign against the Inquisition, it was not unskillful, for it set at liberty the pens which had hitherto been restrained. At once there arose a crowd of pamphleteers and journalists, not only in Cadiz but throughout Spain, who attacked the Inquisition unsparingly, raising a clamor which showed how severe had been the repression. Sturdy defenders were not lacking, and the worldly war was vigorously waged. The two most prominent champions on either side were Antonio Puig Blanchi, who, under the pseudonym of Nathanael Homtop, collected under the title of La Inquisición sin Mascara, or the Inquisition Unmasked, and Padre Maestro Fray Francisco Alvarado, a Dominican of high repute for learning and eloquence, whose letters under the name of El Filosofo Lancio, or Antiquated Philosopher, continued for two years to keep up the struggle against all innovations of the liberals. Puig Blanche was no exception to the general rule that those who attacked the Inquisition was careful to profess the highest veneration for the faith, and in no way to advocate toleration. 
His work commences with an eloquent description of religion as the foundation of all civil constitution, and Catholicism as the noblest adornment of enlightenment and liberty, the only question being whether the Inquisition was the fitting institution for its protection. He is careful to maintain to the last his abhorrence of heresy and his desire for its suppression, which he proposes to effect by reviving episcopal jurisdiction under certain limitations. With all this, his denunciation of the Inquisition was unsparing, and he had ample store of atrocities with which to justify his attacks, although there was unfairness in attributing to it in the 19th century the cruelties which had stained its previous career. Alvarado was a man of extensive learning, not of little claim to the title of philosopher, whether antiquated or modern. Though his methods were not such as to make converts, they were well adapted to stimulate those of his own side, for he was an effective partisan writer, fluent, sarcastic, open course, vulgar, and vituperative, using assertion for argument and indifferent as to truth. The chief value of his letters is the flood of light which they shed on the conservative attitude of the time, which explains much in the subsequent vicissitude of Spain. Philosophers, he says, are wolves, robbers and devils, monsters which cannot be regarded without horror, enlighteners who are nothing but ignoramuses and cheats and emissaries sent by hell. To seek to undermine popular confidence in the priesthood, he holds to be a crime greater than the crucifixion of Christ. The ferocity of his intolerance shows how little Spanish churchmen had changed since the days of Torquemada. As to the relations of religion and the state, he assumes that the only function of the civil power is to punish him who offend the faith the Catholic religion is as intolerant as light is of darkness, or as truth is of falsehood, and this intolerance distinguishes it from all religions invented by men. Repeatedly and savagely he proclaims that burning is the proper remedy for unbelief, and he tells his adversaries that if they wish free thought, they may go to England or to the United States. But in Spain, what they had to expect was the quemadero. Such advocacy could only render the liberals more eager to accomplish their work. End of section 73section 74 of a History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 1, Conclusion. Decadence and Extinction, Part 6. While this controversy was contributing to the greater enlightenment or obscuration of public opinion, the Cortes was engaged in framing a constitution. The committee entrusted with this task had a majority of conservatives, including several ecclesiastics, but these were quite willing to circumscribe the royal power while seeking to extend the privileges of the church and all the members signed the project as presented. It commenced by asserting the sovereignty of the nation, which had the exclusive right to establish its fundamental laws, and could never be the patrimony of any person or family, and it affirmed that the religion of nation was, and always forever would be the Catholic, Apostolic, and Roman, the only true one, which the nation protects by wise and just laws and prohibits the exercise of any other. This apparent concession to intolerance was denounced, when too late, as a trap for it place in the hands of the representative of the nation the power of deciding what the wise and just law should be for the protection of religion. 
Be this as it may, the Cortes was resolved that there should be no refusal to accept the new framework of government. In secret session of March 16, 1812, it was decreed that whosoever would refuse to swear to it should be declared an unworthy Spaniard and be driven from Spain, and measures were taken to have it read in every parish church where the assembled people should swear to obey it and to be faithful to the king. As the French armies were driven back, the Spanish commanders made it their first duty to see this ceremony performed, and where there was opposition cheaply arising from the priests, forces were employed. A priest of the Cadiz Cathedral who alluded to it slightly as uh, Libello, or a little book was prosecuted, and the irreconcilable bishop of Orense, who refused to take the oath, was exiled and declared to be an unworthy Spaniard. As a whole, however, it was enthusiastically accepted as the dawn of new era, though we may well question how many of those who took the oath comprehend the purport of these 384 articles, covering all the complicated minutiae of institutions based on entirely new conception of the relations between the government and the governed. It was inevitable that in the effort to create a new Spain, the fate of the Inquisition should be involved, especially as its disabled condition invited attack. That a struggle was impending had long been evident to all parties, and that this was felt to be decisive as to the character of the future institution of Spain is seen in the tenacity with which it was fought. The Inquisition was conservative stronghold, to be defended to the last, after all the outer defense had been abandoned, and the deep roots which it had established are manifested by the tactics required to its overthrow and by the fact that the contest was the bitterest and the most prolonged in the career of the Cortes, which had so unceremoniously converted Spain from absolutism to liberal constitutionalism. Some preparation had been made for the struggle by the conservatives. The first regency had endeavored to reconstitute all the old councils of monarchy and on June 10, 1810, Ethenard, the Dean of Suprema, addressed it to it a memorial, requesting it to order the reassembling of the Suprema, to which it responded August 1st by issuing such an order. The scattering of the members precluded this, but when the early acts of the Cortes foreshadowed what was to come on December 18th, Ethenard and Amarias asked new regency to appoint as a member the fiscal Iva Navarro and as the fiscal the Madrid Inquisitor Galarza, thus enabling the body to resume its functions. As no attention was paid to this, an old member, Alejo Jiménez de Castro, who had been exiled to Murcia by Godoy, was brought from his retreat to Cadiz as to have material for quorum present. The occasion to utilize this offered itself in January 1811. The freedom of press enabled Don Manuel Alcaiba to start La Triple Alianza, a frankly irreligious journal, in the second number of which there appeared an article ridiculing the immortality of the soul and suffrages for the dead. On January 28th, advantage was taken of this to ask the Cortes to refer it to the Inquisition for censure, which was carried in spite of opposition. The next day, the editors asked that the action be rescinded, leading to a three days debate in which the Inquisition was denounced as a mysterious, cruel, and anti-Christian tribunal, and for the first time, its suppression was openly advocated. President Doe ruled that the inculpated journal must be passed to the Junta de Censura, for he understood that the Inquisition was not organized when he was told that there were three members of the Suprema in Cadiz and that the civil tribunal was in Ceuta. 
This raised larger questions, and the whole matter was referred to a committee so composed that it was expected to report against re-establishment, but it withheld its report for a long time, and meanwhile there were other moves in the game. On May 16th, the member of the Suprema notified the Regency that they were prepared to act, in response to which the minister of Gracia y Justicia expressed his surprise that they should meet as a tribunal without awaiting the decision of the questions submitted to the Cortes, and forbade them from forming a council until they should have express authorization. The matter was brought before the Cortes, and Inquisitor Riesco vainly argued in favor of the Inquisition. His motion was referred to the committee, where it lay buried in spite of repeated calls for a report. The liberals insisted that a national council would be a more suitable body for the mature consideration of such questions. Their object was solely to gain time, which was fighting on their side, but the idea was seriously entertained even by the clericals. The Committee on the External Discipline of Clergy reported August 22nd in favor of the project with the list of matters to be submitted to the Council. On August 28th, the Cortes ordered it to be convoked, but postponed consideration of the details. Other matters supervened and no further action was taken, which Archbishop Vélez assures us saved Spain from a schism or at least from a scandal, for under the proposed program, it would have proved a second synod of Pistoja. In fact, the journals naturally took a lively interest in the matter. Thousands of pamphlets, we are told, appeared everywhere, pointing out the abuses and the relaxed morals of the clergy and demanding a reform that was assumed to be necessary. It is easy to imagine that the ecclesiastical authorities were willing to let the project drop. The positions of liberals were greatly strengthened by the adoption of constitution in March 1812, as was abundantly shown in the next debate on the Inquisition. This was provoked by the publication in April 1812 of the Diccionario Critico Burlesco of Gallardo, librarian of Cortes, in which all that the mass of the population held sacred was treated with ridicule, neither refined nor witty. It created an immense sensation and was brought before the Cortes, which enabled Riesco on April 22nd to call for the immediate presentation of the report of the committee on the Inquisition, for which Cortes had been waiting for more than a year. The committee, in fact, had reached a decision in July 1811 in favor of the Inquisition, and we are not told why it had been held back, for four members had concurred in it and only Minos Torero had dissented. The report was accordingly presented, re-establishing the Suprema in its functions, with certain limitations as to political actions. The debate was hot but the liberals had taken precautions to avoid a direct vote on the question. In a decree of March 25th, creating a Supreme Court of Justice, they had introduced an article suppressing the tribunals known by the name of councils, and they pointed out that this embraced the Suprema, which gave abundant opportunity for discussion. Even more important was the decision of the Cortes, adroitly planned for this especial purpose, December 13, 1811, during the discussion on the Constitution, that no propositions bearing on the fundamental law should be admitted to debate without previous examination by the Committee on the Constitution, to see that it was not in opposition to the Articles thereof. It was notorious that inquisitorial procedure was in direct contravention of the constitutional provisions to secure justice in criminal prosecution, and after an exciting struggle and a postponement, the report was referred to the Committee on the Constitution. The conservatives were so exasperated that they proposed to dissolve the Cortes, 
and have a new election under the constitution, to which the liberals agreed, except that the new body should meet October 1, 1813, and the existing one should remain in session until then. Archbishop Velez tells us that the policy of liberals was to gain time, for their personal safety was at stake if the Inquisition was re-established, nor does he recognize how monstrous was the admission involved in this, for an institution that could prosecute and punish legislators for their official act was virtually the despot of the land. Doubtless the deputies felt this, and that struggle was one for life or death. The flank of the enemy was thus skillfully turned. The Committee on the Constitution was in no haste to report, and occupied itself with collecting documentary material from the archives wherever accessible. Its conclusion was that the Inquisition was incompatible with fundamental law, and on November 13th it voted on a project for establishing Tribunales Protectores de la Fe in compliance with the constitutional requirements. Finally, on December 8th, two reports were presented, that of minority by Antonio Joaquin Perez, who had been an inquisitor in Mexico, argued that the abuses of inquisition was not inherent, that its procedure conflicted with the constitution and should therefore be modified accordingly. The majority report was a very elaborate document tracing the treatment of heresy from the earliest times and pointing out the irreconcilable incompatibility of the Inquisition with the constitutional provisions, securing to the citizen the right of open trial and opportunity for defense. It concluded with the draft of decree, Sobre Tribunales Protectores de la Fe, in which such caution was deemed necessary that the Inquisition was nowhere mentioned. It appealed to the national pride by simply reviving a law of the partidas concerning the prosecution of the heretics by the bishops. It prescribed the form and procedure of the episcopal tribunals, the punishment by lay judges of those pronounced guilty, and it provided for appeals as well as for the suppression of writings contrary to religion. The reports were duly received, and January 4, 1813, was appointed for the opening of debate. Probably no measure before the Cortes provoked so bitter and prolonged the debate. The liberals have secured the advantage of position, and the conservatives felt that the issues involved the whole future relations of church and state. There was a preliminary skirmish on December 29th when Sanchez de Ocaña asked for the postponement until the bishops and chapters could be consulted on the ground that the church was an independent body. This was voted down and the debate was opened on the designated day, January 4, 1813. The friends of the Inquisition had not been idle. The church organization was in good working order and the Cortes was bombarded with memorials from bishops, chapters, ayuntamientos, military officers, towns and provinces, showing how active the canvas had been during the two years in which the subject had been mooted. Yet, the conservatives could only procure, out of 59 sees existing in Spain, protests from two archbishops and 24 bishops, the authorities of three vacant sees and four chapters of those occupied by the French, while the number from officers of the army was not large. Those from towns were but a small fraction of the municipality, and only two provinces, Alava and Galicia, spoke through their authorities. Munoz Torero declared January 10th that every mail brought him mountains of letters in favor of the Inquisition, and Torreno spoke of the reclamations that came in, showing how the signers of protest had been coerced. The debate was vigorous and eloquent on both sides, but while it took the widest range, embracing the history of church from the apostolic times and the career of the Inquisition from the 13th century, 
the parliamentary question in reality turned up the power of Cortes to intrude in the sphere of the ecclesiastical jurisdiction. After discussion lasting until January 22nd on the preliminary propositions, the decree itself was taken up article by article and strenuously fought over. Amendments were presented and accepted or rejected as they strengthened or weakened the measure, and hard resistance was offered to the clauses, allowing appeals from the judgment of the bishops, which the liberals supported on the ground that all the members who opposed the Inquisition had been denounced throughout Spain as heretics, and the safety of the citizen demanded that episcopal definition of heresy should not be final. The debate was prolonged until February 5th, when the last article was agreed to, and the decree in its final shape did not differ essentially from that proposed by the committee. There was no formal suppression of inquisition. It was simply declared to be incompatible with constitution, and the laws of partidas was revived. This letter had been agreed to on January 26th by a vote of 92 to 30, and the date was assumed as determining the extinction of the Inquisition, regulating the disposition of its property. It is not worthwhile to recapitulate the details of the episcopal tribunals and the provisions of censorship, as bishops took little interest in the exercise of their restored jurisdiction, though there are traces of their action in one or two cases, that of Joaquin Ramirez, priest of Moscardon, and of Doña Antonia de la Torre of Seville. During the 17 months that elapsed until the re-establishment of the Inquisition, we are told that although the land was full of Freemasons and other anti-Catholics, the bishops had no occasion to arrest anyone, for no informers or accusers came forward doubtless because they realized that their names would be known. In the debate, several ecclesiastical distinguished themselves by their able advocacy of the measure, among whom were preeminent Munoz Torero, who had become a leading part in drafting the decree. Lorenzo Villanueva, who had defended the Inquisition against Bishop Gregoire, and Luis Padron, parish priest of Valderojas in Galicia, and formerly of the Canaries. How they fared in consequence we shall see hereafter. On the other side, one of the most vehement was Pedro Inguanzo, who was rewarded with the See of Zamora, and ultimately with Archbishopric of Toledo. End of section 74「Section 75 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 1, Part 7. Conclusion decadence and extinction the liberals had won their victory by unexpectedly large majorities indicating how great had been the advance in public opinion no measure had created such intensity of feeling on either side the rejoicing of the liberals was extravagant and the anger of the clerical party may be gauged by the declamation of archbishop velez who is as vehement as though the whole fate of Christianity was at stake. The abomination of desolation, he declares, seemed to have established its throne in the very house of God. The clergy had already been alienated by various measures adverse to their interests. The appropriation of a portion of the tithes to the support of the armies, the escheating of the property of convents destroyed by the invaders, or having less than twelve inmates, and the abrogation of the voto de santiago a tax on the agriculturists of some provinces based on a fraudulent tradition of a vow made by ramiro i when by the aid of st james he won the suppositious victory of clavijo 
the debate on the Inquisition had heightened the reputation of the Cortes as an irreligious body, and it was not wise to inflame still further the hostility of a class wielding such preponderating influence, but the liberals, intoxicated by their victory, proceeded to render the measure as offensive as possible to the defeated clericals. On February 5th, after the final vote, the Committee on the Constitution was instructed to prepare a manifesto setting forth the reasons for the suppression of the Inquisition, which, together with the decree, should be read in all parish churches for three consecutive Sundays, before the offertory of the Mass, that in all churches the insignia of those condemned and penanced should be removed, and that a report should be made as to the disposition of the archives of the tribunals. The preparation of the manifesto delayed the publication of the decree until February 22nd, for it was a long and wordy document, in which the decadence of Spain was attributed to the abuses of the Inquisition. The ancient laws had therefore been revived, restoring their jurisdiction to the bishops, in whose hands the Catholic faith and its sublime morals would be secure. Religion would flourish, prosperity would return, and, perchance, this change might some day lead to the religious brotherhood of all the nations. It was not long before the imprudence of this step manifested itself, for it gave the Church a battleground on which to contest not only the reading of the manifesto, but the execution of the decree itself, and, if defeated, of occupying the advantageous position of martyrdom. Opposition had for some time been in preparation. As early as December 12, 1812, the six bishops of Lerida, Tortosa, Barcelona, Urgel, Teruel, and Pampeluna, in the safe refuge of Majorca, had prepared a manifesto widely circulated in private, representing the Church as outraged in its ministers, oppressed in its immunities, and combated in its doctrines, while the Jansenist members of the Cortes were described as adherents of the Council of Pistoja. No sooner was the decisive vote of February 5th taken than the chapter of the vacant see of Cadiz prepared for a contest over the reading of the decree and manifesto. It had already appointed a committee of three with full powers, and it now instructed the committee to communicate secretly with refugee bishops in Cadiz and with chapters elsewhere with a view to common action. Letters were sent to the chapters of Seville, Malaga, Jaén, and Córdoba, representing that the Cádiz chapter was ready to be the victim, but would be strengthened by the union of others. Seville replied with promises to do the same, the rest more cautiously, for they felt that they were treading on dangerous ground. This dampened somewhat the ardor of the fiery Cádiz chapter, and it sought for other support. On February 23rd, the parish priests and army chaplains of Cadiz were assembled and addressed the chapter at great length. To read the decree and manifesto would be a profanation and a degrading servility. The papal constitutions creating the Inquisition were binding on the consciences of the faithful until revoked by the same authority, and from this obligation the secular power could not relieve them. To obey would be to incur the risk of a dreadful sacrilege, and the penalties for impeding the Inquisition imposed by Julius III and Sixtus V, it was better to fall into the hands of man than into those of God, and they were ready to endure whatever fate might befall them. This was rank rebellion, slightly moderated by the expression of a desire to learn the opinions of the holy prelates who were in Cadiz. The chapter duly transmitted this address to the prelates, the bishops of Calahora, Plasencia, San Marcos de Leon, Siguenza, and Albaracin. Calahora and San Marcos were deputies in the Cortes and had signed the Constitution, stating that it entertained the same sentiments and repeated the request for their opinion. The bishops replied cautiously, 
and in substance advised that representations be made to the government which might be induced to modify its decrees time was growing short for march seventh had been designated as the first sunday for reading the decree and manifesto on march third a capitular meeting was assembled in which it was unanimously resolved to obey but to make use of the provisions which authorize citizens to obey without executing and to represent reverentially the reasons for suspending action until further determination this was the first step in the development of a somewhat formidable plot which was organizing on march fifth the papal nuncio pedro gravina archbishop of nicaea addressed to the regency a very significant protest against the decree itself the abolition of the inquisition he said was contrary to the primacy of the holy see he protested against this and he asked the regency to induce the cortes to suspend its publication and execution until happier times might secure the consent of the pope or of the national council on the same day he was guilty of the indiscretion of writing to the bishop of jain and to the chapters of malaga and granada under strict injunctions of secrecy advising them of the proposed resistance of the cadiz chapter and inviting their cooperation the next day march sixth the chapter sent to the regency the address of the priests and chaplains of cadiz with a communication setting forth the reasons which not only prevented the execution of the mandate of the cortes but imperiously required the secular power to protect the church and relieve it from an act in contravention of its honor and sanctity the chapter it argued could not be accused of disobedience for insisting on the spiritual law which was more binding than the temporal the regency evidently was participating in the plot to overthrow the cortes for the purpose of saving the inquisition the legislative and executive branches of the government had become estranged there had been dissension in the matter of the suppression of the convents and an investigation made by the cortes into the affairs of the regency had led to a damaging report on february seventh the liberals were convinced that it was planning a coup d'etat when on the night of saturday march sixth the rumor spread that it had dismissed the governor of cadiz di cayetano valdez and had replaced him with di jose maria alos sunday passed without the reading of the decree and manifesto in the churches and on monday the minister of gracia y justicia sent to the cortes the communications of the chapter to the regency a permanent session was at once declared the cortes dismissed the regents and replaced them with the three senior members of the council of state cardinal luis de bourbon archbishop of toledo de pedro agar and de gabriel siscar who forthwith took the oaths and at nine p m assumed possession of their office the dismissed regents offering no resistance harmony between the legislature and the executive being thus restored on march ninth the cortes ordered the regency to compel obedience under threats of measures to be taken the chapter yielded at ten p m and promised that the next morning and on the two following sundays the decree and manifesto should be duly read it was obliged to furnish authentic copies of all papers and correspondence on the basis of which a sharp reprimand was addressed to the seville chapter and on april twenty fourth prosecution was commenced against the cadiz capitular vicar and the three members of the committee for treasonable conspiracy their temporalities were seized and for six weeks they were imprisoned incommunicado the trial dragged on until the restoration of fernando the seventh rendered acquittal a matter of course and enabled them in their defense to declare that to destroy the inquisition or to impede its action in matters of faith was the same as prohibiting the jurisdiction of the roman pontiff thus trampling under foot a dogma established by jesus christ the documents thus obtained showed that nuncio gravina 
had been active in furthering the plot of resistance. Now that it had been crushed, policy would have dictated dropping the matter. But on April 22nd, the Minister of Gracia y Justicia addressed him a sharp letter, expressing the confidence of the Regency that he would in future observe the limits of his office, as otherwise it would be obliged to exercise all its authority. To this he, of course, replied defiantly. Whenever ecclesiastical matters were concerned, he might find himself obliged to follow the same course, and the Regency could do as it pleased. Some further correspondence followed in the same vein, and then, after an interval, his passports were sent to him, his temporalities were seized, and he was informed that the frigate Sabina was at his disposal to transport him whither he desired. He declined the proffered frigate and established himself in Portugal near the border, whence he continued busily to stir up disaffection, assuming that he still retained his functions as nuncio. On July 24th, he addressed a protest to the government and sent a circular to the bishops, inviting them to apply to him in cases requiring his aid. This led to a lively controversy in which the government charged him with deceit, and he retorted by accusing it of falsehood and challenging it to publish the documents. This was by no means the only trouble excited by the enforced reading of the decree and manifesto. Recalcitrant priests were found in many places, whose cases caused infinite annoyance and bad blood, and the bishop of Oviedo was recluded in a convent for refusing obedience. The government triumphed, but it was a pyrrhic victory, multiplying its enemies, heightening its reputation for irreligion, and weakening its influence. The result was seen in the elections for the new Cortes Ordinarias, when the deputies returned were largely reactionary, owing to clerical influence. There were many vacancies, however, which were filled by the old members for the corresponding places, and thus the parties were evenly balanced. The new Cortes met September 26th, and on November 29th adjourned to meet in Madrid January 15th, 1814. The Regency transferred itself to Madrid January 5th. By that time, the French were virtually expelled from Spain. Wellington was following Sioux into France, and Suchet was barely holding his own against Copons in Catalonia. The return of Fernando el Deseado was evidently at hand, and was eagerly expected. The reaction following the prolonged excitement of the war was beginning to be felt. There was widespread misery in the devastated provinces, the relief of which was slow and difficult, and was aggravated by a decree of the Cortes requiring those which had been subjugated to pay the arrears of the war contributions. Dissatisfaction with the Cortes was aroused by what were regarded as their sins both of commission and omission. The lowering of the value of French money caused great suffering and trouble. All who had served under the intruso were ejected from office. The parish priests were reinstated in their old cures, which turned into the streets the new incumbents. People began to grumble at the preponderance of the liberals in the Cortes. In short, there was no lack of subjects of complaint. Exhaustion and poverty the inevitable consequences of so prolonged and desperate a struggle, produced discontent, and it was natural that those who had guided the nation through its tribulations should be held responsible, while their services should be forgotten. The military also were dissatisfied at finding that, at the close of a successful war, they had not the importance that they considered to be their due, while the clergy were outspoken in opposition and through two widely circulated journals, El Procurador de la Nación y del Rey and La Atalaya de la Mancha, attacked the government furiously. During all this period, Fernando's existence at Valencay had been as agreeable as was consistent with his safekeeping. The only restriction on his movements was a prohibition to ride on horseback. Napoleon is said to have kept him supplied with women to satisfy his strongly developed sensuality, 
and he manifested his characteristic baseness in letters to his captor, congratulating him on his victories and soliciting the honor of a matrimonial alliance with his family. After the Battle of Leipzig, Napoleon, striving to save what he could from the wreck, represented to Fernando that the English were seeking to convert Spain into a Jacobin republic. Fernando was ready to agree to any terms, and on December 11, 1813, there was signed what was known as the Treaty of Valencia, under which peace was declared between France and Spain, the English and French troops were to be withdrawn, the Afrancesados, who had taken refuge in France, were to be restored to their property and functions, and Fernando was to make a yearly allowance of thirty million reals to his father and mother. Fernando sent the Duke of San Carlos with the treaty to Madrid for ratification, instructing him that if he found the Cortes and a regency infected with Jacobinism, he was to insist on ratification pure and simple. If he found them loyal, he was to say that the king desired ratification with the understanding that he would subsequently declare it invalid. The treaty excited general indignation. As early as January 1, 1811, the Cortes had decreed that they would recognize no treaty made by the king in captivity, and that he should not be considered free until he was surrounded by his faithful subjects in Cortes. Now the Cortes responded to Fernando's message with the decree of February 2, 1814, reissuing the former one and adding that obedience should not be rendered to him until he should, in the Cortes, take an oath to the Constitution. On his arrival at the frontier, this decree was to be handed to him with a copy of the Constitution, that he might read and understand it. He was to follow a route prescribed by the Regency, and on reaching the capital, he was to come directly to the Cortes, take the oath, and the government would then be solemnly made over to him. All this was agreed to with virtual unanimity. It was signed by all the deputies and was published with a manifesto denouncing the treaty and expressing the warmest devotion to the king. The publication aroused general indignation at the treaty, and the manifesto elicited universal applause. To Fernando, trained in the traditions of absolutism, the Treaty of Valencay was vastly preferable to the reception prepared for him, but he uttered no word of dissent when, after Napoleon had liberated him without conditions on March 7th, he was transferred by Suchet on the banks of the Fluvia, March 24th, to Capons, the captain-general of Catalonia. He exercised volition, however, in deviating from the route laid down by the Regency and made a detour to Saragossa, on the road to Valencia, but he preserved absolute silence as to his intentions. Everywhere he was received with delirious enthusiasm. The people idealized him as the symbol of the nationality for which they had struggled through five years of pitiless war, and there were no bounds to their exuberance of loyalty. End of section 75 Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 76 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4 by henry charles lee book nine chapter one part eight conclusion decadence and extinction the restoration to few men has it been given as to fernando to exercise so profound and so lasting an influence on the destinies of a nation his ancestor henry the fourth had a harder task when he undertook to impose harmony on compatriots who, for a generation, had been savagely cutting each other's throats. Fernando came to a nation which had been unitedly waging war against a foreign enemy. 
Differences of opinion had grown up as to the reception or rejection of modern ideas, and parties had been formed representing the principles of conservatism and innovation. Mistakes had been made on both sides, and bitterness of temper was rising. But a wise and prudent ruler, coming uncommitted to either side and enthusiastically greeted by both, could have exorcised the demon of faction, could have brought about compromise and conciliation, and could have gradually so trained the nation that it could have traversed in peace the inevitable revolution awaiting it. This was not to be. Unfortunately, Fernando was one of the basest and most despicable beings that ever disgraced a throne. Cowardly, treacherous, deceitful, selfish, abandoned to low debauchery, controlled by a camarilla of foul and immoral favorites, his sole object was to secure for himself the untrammeled exercise of arbitrary power and to abuse it for sensual gratification. Cruel he was not, in the sense of wanton shedding of blood, but he was callously indifferent to human suffering, and he earned the name of Tigre Khan, by which the liberals came to designate him. When Fernando entered Spain, he was naturally undecided as to the immediate attitude to be assumed towards the changes made during his absence, but the enthusiasm of his reception and the influence of the reactionaries who surrounded him emboldened him in the determination to assert his autocracy. Several secret conferences were held during the journey to decide whether he should swear to the Constitution, and the negative opinion prevailed. In fact, to a man of Fernando's character, voluntary obedience to the Constitution was an impossibility. Not only did it declare that sovereignty resided in the nation, with the corresponding right to determine its fundamental laws, but the powers of the crown were limited in many ways. The Cortes reserved the right to exclude unworthy aspirants to the succession, and to set aside the incumbent for any cause rendering him incapable, clauses susceptible of most dangerous interpretation. At this very time, indeed, the Cortes were deliberating on the appropriation to be made to the king for the maintenance of his court, which implied the right to subject him to the most galling conditions. If anything was needed to induce him to assert the full powers enjoyed by his predecessors, it was afforded by a manifesto known as the Representation of the Persians, from an absurd allusion to the ancient Persians in the opening sentence. This was signed by sixty-nine deputies to the Cortes. At much length, and with turgid rhetoric, it set forth the sufferings inflicted on Spain by the liberals. It argued that all the acts of the Cortes of Cadiz were null and invalid. It pointed out the limitations on the royal power prescribed by the Constitution, and it asserted that absolute monarchy was recognized as the perfection of government. It did not omit to declare that the Inquisition was indispensable to the maintenance of religion, without which no government could exist. It dwelt on the disorders consequent upon its suppression, and it reminded Fernando that from the time of the Gothic kingdom, intolerance of heresy was the permanent law of the nation. Even if the king should think best to swear to the Constitution, the manifesto protested that it was invalid, and that its destructive principles must be submitted to the action of Cortes assembled according to the ancient fashion. This paper, dated April 12th, was drawn up and secretly circulated by Bernardo Moza Reales, who carried it to Valencia and presented it to Fernando, receiving as reward the title of Marquis of Mata Florida. Fernando reached Valencia April 16th and paused there until May 4th, while secret preparations were made to overthrow the government. The Cortes, unaware of the contemplated treachery, were amusing themselves in arranging the hall for the solemnity of the king's oath and his acknowledgment as sovereign, and took no measures for self-protection. 
troops were secretly collected in the vicinity of Madrid under General Eguia, a violent reactionary, who was made Captain General of New Castile. On the night of May 10th, when Fernando was nearing the capital, Eguia notified Joaquin Perez, president of the Cortes, that they were closed. Troops took possession of the hall, and the archives were sealed, while police agents were busy making arrests from a list of 38 marked for proscription, including two of the regents, two ministers, and all the more prominent liberal deputies. No resistance was encountered, and the precedent was established which has proved so disastrous to Spain. In the early dawn of the 11th, there was found posted everywhere a royal manifesto dated at Valencia on the 4th. In this, after a rambling summary of antecedent events, Fernando promised to assemble as soon as possible Cortes of the old fashion, and in conjunction with them to establish solidly whatever was necessary for the good of the kingdom. He hated despotism. The Enlightenment and culture of Europe would never permit it, and his predecessors had never been despots. But the Cortes of Cadiz and the existing body were illegal, and all their acts were invalid. He did not intend to swear to the Constitution or to the decrees of the Cortes, but he pronounced them all void and of no effect, and anyone supporting them in any manner or endeavoring to impede the execution of this manifesto was declared to be guilty of high treason and subject to the death penalty. It is perhaps needless to say that the promised convocation of Cortes and the salutary legislation never took place. All the modernized institutions framed since 1810 were swept away at a word, the old organization of government was restored, and Fernando was an absolute despot, disposing at his pleasure of the lives and property of his subjects who had fought so desperately for his restoration. How he used this power was manifested in the case of the 52 prisoners who were arrested at the time of the coup d'etat. Nineteen months were spent in endeavoring to have them condemned by tribunals and commissions formed for the purpose, but no crime could be proved that would not equally affect all who had voted with them, many of whom stood in high favor at court. The last tribunal convened for their trial advised Fernando to sentence them in the exercise of his royal omnipotence, and he did so, December 17, 1815, sending them to distant fortresses, African presidios, and convents, with strict orders to allow them to see no one and to send or receive no letters. As regards the three specially obnoxious clerical deputies, Villanueva was recluded for six years in the convent of La Salceda, from which we shall see him emerge and again play a brief part on the political stage. Munoz Torero was sent to the convent of Erbon in Galicia. He finally fell into the savage hands of Dom Miguel of Portugal and perished after severe torture in 1829. Ruiz de Padron was not on the list of the proscribed. He had not been elected to the new Cortes, but was detained by sickness in Cadiz. On his return in May to his parish of Valdeoras, his bishop, Manuel Vicente of Astorga, made a crime of his absence from his cure without episcopal license, and prosecuted him for this and for sustaining in the Cortes projects adverse to religion and the throne. On November 2, 1815, he was sentenced to perpetual reclusion in the desert convent of Cabeza de Alba, and to prevent appeal, the bishop sent the process to the Inquisition of Valladolid. Ruiz appealed to the Metropolitan, but the bishop refused to allow the appeal. Then, a recurso de fuerza to the chancellery of Valladolid was tried, which thrice demanded the process before the bishop, to escape exposure in a secular court, allowed the appeal. 
Finally, the Metropolitan annulled the proceedings, and Ruiz was set at liberty after four years' imprisonment, broken in health and ruined in fortune. This action probably superseded a prosecution against him for printing his speech in the Cortes against the Inquisition, a prosecution commenced by the Madrid Tribunal and transferred to Valladolid. It was at first thought that the manifesto of May 4th, by invalidating all the acts of the Cortes, in itself re-established the Inquisition. In fact, Seville, its birthplace, had not waited for this, and on May 6th the popular tumult restored it. The next day its banner, piously preserved by Don Juan Garcia de Negra, a familiar, was solemnly conducted to the castle of Triana by a procession, at the head of which marched Juan Asisla de Vera, co-administrator of the diocese. The Te Deum was sung in the cathedral. The houses were illuminated and splendidly adorned with tapestries. All this was premature, as likewise were the attempts made by some tribunals to reorganize for the absence of an inquisitor general and suprema rendered irregular the transaction of business representations were made to the king by seville and other towns by the chapter of valencia and by bishops praying him to take action and the scruples as to the intervention of the civil power in spiritual affairs vanished fernando accordingly by decree of july twenty one eighteen fourteen recited the appeals made to him, and announced that he deemed it fitting that the Holy Office should resume the exercise of its powers, both the ecclesiastical granted by the popes and the royal bestowed by his predecessors. In both of these, the rules in force in 1808 were to be followed, together with the laws issued at sundry times to restrain abuses and curtail privileges. But, as other reforms might be necessary, he ordered that, as soon as the Suprema should assemble, two of its members, selected by him, and two of the royal council, should form a junta to investigate the procedure and the methods of censorship, and, if they should find anything requiring reform, they should report to him that he might do what was requisite. Even the Cortes could not assert more authoritative domination. The inquisitor generalship was filled by the appointment of Francisco Xavier de Mier y Campillo, bishop of Almería, and the vacancies in the Suprema were supplied. The Junta of Reform was organized and met and consulted. In 1816, we hear of their being still in session, but we are told that they found nothing requiring amendment. The Suprema lost no time in getting to work, a circular of August 8th to the tribunals enclosed the royal decree and announced that, in virtue of it, the council was that day restored to its authority and functions, which had been interrupted only by the invasion and the so-called Cortes. The tribunals were ordered to proceed, as in former times, with all business that might offer, and the officials were to discharge their accustomed duties until the bishop of Almeria should receive his bulls. Lists of all officials were to be sent, with statements of their dates of service, and of popular report as to their conduct during the troubles, and whether they had publicly attacked the rights of the sovereign and of the holy office. A process of purification ensued, investigating the records of all officials, many of whom had bowed to the tempest during the short-lived triumph of liberalism. April 7, 1815, a circular letter directed that anyone who had petitioned the Cortes for the abolition of the Inquisition, or had congratulated them on their action, was no longer to be regarded as in office or entitled to wear the insignia, but considerable tenderness was shown to the erring. Thus, Don Manuel Palomino y Lozano, supernumerary secretary of the madrid tribunal had signed an address of congratulation to the cortes but on his pleading coercion and fear 
he was allowed to retain office. End of section 76. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 77 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 1, Part 9, Conclusion, Decadence and Extinction. Allusion has already been made to the difficulties experienced in reconstituting an institution which, during five years of war, had been exposed to spoliation and destruction, resulting in some places in the wrecking of its buildings, the purloining of its movables, and the scattering of its papers. Thus, for instance, in September and October 1815, the Logroño Tribunal, which had lost its habitation, was negotiating with the Marquis of Monasterio for his house, which he offered rent-free, if it would keep the premises in repair and make the necessary alterations. The Suprema instructed it to secure better terms if it could, and to be very economical with the alterations. As late as 1817, we chanced to learn that Santiago and Valladolid had no prisons, and in 1819 that Lerena was in the same plight. The financial question was even more serious. We have seen how, under Godoy, the tribunals had been obliged to convert all their available securities into government funds, which of course had become worthless, and how the Cortes, by decree of December 1, 1810, had applied the suppressed prebends to the conduct of the war. It must, therefore, have been well-nigh starved when suppressed by the Cortes, but there was no disposition to expose individuals to suffering, and, when its property was declared to belong to the nation, elaborate provision was made for the payment of salaries and the customary gratifications, though we may safely assume that, in the majority of cases, these kindly intentions failed of effect. When re-establishment came, the task of gathering the salvage from the wreck of the past six years was most disheartening. The royal decree simply called on the Inquisition to resume its functions, and said nothing about its property, the restoration of which was evidently taken for granted, under the manifesto, invalidating the acts of the Cortes. There was no disposition, however, on the part of the Treasury officials to do this, and, in response to a consulta of August 11th, the King, on the 18th, issued an order on them to make over to the tribunals all real estate of every kind that had been absorbed by the Treasury, the account of rents to be made up to July 21st and apportioned on that basis. This left personal property out of consideration, and a further decree was procured September 3rd, ordering the restoration of everything that had passed into the Caja de Consolidación, as well as the fruits of the suppressed prebends, balancing the accounts up to July 21st. This was slackly obeyed. The necessities of the tribunals were pressing, and the Suprema presented consultas of October 1st and 23rd, asking that they should be allowed to collect the revenues, and that restitution should be made of all past collections, or, in default of this, that a monthly allowance of 80,000 reals be made to the Inquisition. To this, Fernando replied that the needs of the royal treasury did not permit the repayment of back collections, nor could it meet the proposed monthly allowance, but it was his will that such payments as the general treasury and the junta del credito publico could spare should be made as a payment on account for the most necessary expenses of the inquisition this last was doubtless an empty promise the royal financiers were determined not to go back of july twenty first and it appears by a letter of december sixteenth that the royal officials were still making collections 
the most that the Suprema could accomplish was to procure from the Junta del Credito Público an order of January 9, 1815, and from the Chief of the Treasury, one of January 30th, to their subordinates to cease collecting from the property of the Inquisition under the rigid condition that an account should be kept by the tribunals of their collections, so that whatever they might obtain of arrears due prior to July 21st should inure to the benefit of the government. In this, however, there was recognized the justice of a claim for the unpaid back salaries of the officials, and elaborate arrangements were made to ascertain and put these in shape, but it was labor lost. The treasury was at too low an ebb, and the claimants for services rendered during the troubled years of war and revolution were too numerous for the Inquisition to obtain what it demanded. The Suprema was also diligent in seeking to recover the amounts which the tribunals had been obliged to invest in government securities, but this was as fruitless as other attempts to save fragments of the wreck. The last we hear of it is in 1819, when the Suprema was still endeavoring to meet the exigencies of the Treasury in framing lists of the dates and numbers of the bonds. It was difficult to evolve order out of the chaos of destruction, especially where the papers had been scattered, so that evidences of indebtedness and accounts were lost, interfering greatly with efforts to reclaim property. In November 1814, we find the Valencia Tribunal issuing an edict requiring the return of all books and papers and records within 15 days under pain of excommunication and 200 ducats. As to the furniture and other effects, they were to be restored under threat of legal proceedings. Although Valencia had been for two years under French occupation, it seems to have been more prompt than some others in getting its finances into intelligible condition. In November, the Suprema calls upon it for a detailed schedule of resources and expenses, and in the latter it is not to omit the contribution required by the Suprema amounting to 130,896 reals, and, meanwhile, it is not to pay out anything for salaries or other purposes without awaiting permission. Under this it was allowed, January 21, 1815, to pay salaries up to the end of 1814, and in May to make further payments. Yet, in 1816, we find it reduced to seeking a loan wherewith to meet the salaries and a sum of 13,000 reals demanded by the Suprema. The Suprema itself, despite the contributions which it sought to levy from the tribunals, was in a condition of penury so absolute that, on July 3, 1815, it announced that it had no funds wherewith to pay the salaries of its officials or the postage on the official communications from the tribunals, which must therefore in future arrange with the post office to prepay the postage and settle monthly or quarterly. This, however, as it explained August 19th, applied only to what was addressed to it as, under a decree of May 19, 1799, letters to the Inquisitor General and other heads of councils were carried free. There was gradual improvement, but it was slow. A carta acordada of September 3, 1818, says that the Suprema cannot view with indifference the deplorable financial condition of nearly all the tribunals, whose diminished revenues force them to allow the meager salaries of their officials to fall into arrears, nor can it close its ears to the clamors of these unfortunates, reduced as they are to the deepest indigence. Seeking for partial remedies, it must insist on the avoidance of all expenses not absolutely indispensable, and the suppression of all superfluous offices. One of these is the notariate of the Court of Confiscations. When it falls vacant, it is not to be filled, and its duties are to be performed by the Secretary of Sequestrations, whose salary will consequently be raised by fifty ducats. This was a somewhat exiguous conclusion of so solemn an exordium, seeing that the actual work 
of the tribunals could readily have been performed by less than half the officials who swelled their payrolls but it is not without interest as showing how persistently the old inflated organization was maintained and was struggling to support itself on the remnants of its once prosperous fortunes under such a system poverty naturally continued to the last when the revolution of eighteen twenty broke out and the seville tribunal contributed six thousand reals to the committee organized to resist the rising it had no funds and was obliged to borrow the money on interest as almost the first act of the successful revolutionists was to suppress the inquisition the lenders in this case doubtless found themselves to be involuntary contributors at this time the seville tribunal had a force of twenty-eight officials with a payroll of ninety two thousand three hundred reals while the amount of its work may be gathered from the fact that the revolutionists found only three prisoners to release thus amid difficulties and tribulations the tribunals one by one resumed their functions in october eighteen fourteen seville was prosecuting lieutenant colonel lorenzo del castillo for propositions saragossa was receiving the self-denunciation of matthias pintado priest of bujanuelo for heregia mista and valencia was suspending the sumaria of the capuchin fray pablo de altea for mala doctrina while in december murcia was prosecuting don joseph de zayas a prominent lieutenant general of the royal army for freemasonry business however at the first was scanty in the book of secret votes of the suprema there is an interval from december twenty two eighteen fourteen until february sixteen eighteen fifteen as the months of eighteen fifteen passed on the breaks grow shorter and by the summer of eighteen fifteen the decrees follow each other closely valladolid seems to have been dilatory in getting to work for although it had three inquisitors drawing salary no case came up from it until january eighteen seventeen and from this one it would seem that it had not been in operation until october eighteen sixteen the prosecution of such a man as zayas shows that the reorganized inquisition did not hesitate to grapple with those in high place and another early case illustrates this still more forcibly during the french occupation the duke and duchess of sotomayor and the countess of mora had obtained possession of the books and indecent pictures accumulated in the madrid tribunal apparently they refused to surrender them the tribunal prosecuted them and rendered a sentence subject to the royal permission that these objects should be seized but in such a manner as not to attract attention or to provoke resentment the suprema confirmed the sentence ordering its execution by a single inquisitor accompanied by a secretary so as to reconcile the respect due to the parties with the secrecy that was essential a politic act was the issue of a general pardon for all that had impiously and scandalously been uttered and done against the inquisition under the fatal circumstances of the recent troubles it could afford to assume this attitude of magnanimity seeing that the government was pitilessly avenging it on its most prominent adversaries when the government failed in this duty the inquisition had no hesitation in nullifying its edict of pardon we have seen its prosecution of ruiz de padron until it found that the bishop of astorga was rendering this superfluous nor was this by any means an isolated case in august eighteen fifteen we find the suprema acting on sumarias from canaries in the cases of mariano romero a priest for a sonnet against the inquisition and of francisco guerra for a sonnet and an epitaph of the same character so in november eighteen fifteen there is a prosecution of the duke of parque castrillo for congratulating the cortes on the abolition of the inquisition and for a general order to the troops december two eighteen twelve his case dragged on until june ten eighteen seventeen when its suspension was ordered 
yet it was not easy to revive the old-time veneration for an institution that had been so buffeted and roughly handled by the press and the cortes a couple of cases in madrid in eighteen fourteen of women in whose shops scandalous pictures and objects were exhibited would seem to indicate that its commands were not obeyed with alacrity it was doubtless with a view of overcoming this indifference that fernando himself assumed the office of an inquisitor february three eighteen fifteen when he visited the suprema presided over its deliberations and participated in its decisions examined all the offices and expressed his royal satisfaction with the methods of procedure by royal permission the suprema sent its president and three members to return the visit and express its gratitude for a mark of royal favor such as ferdinand the catholic nor any of his successors had ever made a full report was printed in the gaceta of february sixteenth copies of which the suprema sent to the tribunals with orders to read it to the officials and place it in the archives with the same purpose he erected as we have seen the congregation of san pedro martir to a knightly order with a habit and badge and on april sixth the feast of saint peter martyr he presided over the congregation with his brothers carlos and antonio wearing the insignia in communicating this to the tribunals the suprema rendered it especially impressive by ordering them to commence the payment of salaries earned since july twenty first and to continue it monthly noble courtiers doubtless found that assuming office in the inquisition was an avenue to royal favor and we speedily see many of them submitting their genealogies for this purpose the great duke of berwick and alva fitzjames stuart silva stolberg y palafox thus seeks the office of alguazil mayor of the tribunal of cordova the marquis of altamira does the same for the position of honorary secretary in that of madrid and we happen to hear of the count of mazeda a grandee of the first class serving as alguazil mayor of the tribunal of santiago and the marquis of iscar as honorary secretary to the suprema in spite of all this the inquisition could not regain its former position not only was it not respected but it dared not to enforce respect two edicts of grace for freemasons were issued january second and february twelfth eighteen fifteen when the valladolid tribunal sent those for medina del campo and its district to its commissioner victor gonzalez to be posted the vicar-general and ordinary dr joseph suarez talavera as ecclesiastical judge demanded that they should pass through his hands and when they were posted they bore the m s subscription fixes dr suarez thus assuming that it was by his permission and arrogating to himself a jurisdiction superior to that of the inquisition when this was reported to the tribunal it ordered gonzalez to take them down and replace them with unsullied ones which he did thereupon suarez sent him word that but for starting on a journey he would make him repent and that had he known of his being in medina he would have cast him in prison and seen who could get him out the tribunal meekly swallowed this flagrant insult it was under instructions to perform no act indicating jurisdiction superior to that of the ordinaries so it quietly gathered evidence verifying the facts and sent the papers september fifteenth to the suprema the inquisition recognized and felt acutely its altered position in a report to the king on the subject of visitos de navios made by the suprema in eighteen nineteen there are repeated confessions of powerlessness the times are so unfortunate that its regulations failed to effect their object the same consciousness of weakness is manifest in the conduct of the occasional competencias which still occurred in such of these as i have had an opportunity of examining there are a studied courtesy and evident desire to avoid giving offence without wholly abandoning the claims of the holy office End of section seventy seven. 
Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 78 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 1, Part 10, Conclusion, Decadence and Extinction. To the same cause, we may at least partially ascribe the marked tendency to mitigation of punishment, except in the case of political offenders, and to avoid all unnecessary hardship and humiliation of culprits. When, in March 1819, the Madrid Tribunal pronounced a severe sentence on Teodoro Bachiller for propositions, the Suprema moderated it greatly in every way, in order, it said, to make him understand its benignity in taking care of his honor and of the comfort of his family. In January 1817, Lorenzo Ayon was tried in Seville for abusing a priest while celebrating Mass and endeavoring to snatch away the host, offenses for which of old he could scarce have escaped the stake. But now he had only absolution at Cotulum, a reprimand, two years of presidio followed by six years of exile, and the Suprema relieved him of the vergüenza which had been included. Even more marked was the case of Diego Blasquez, postmaster of Villanueva de la Serena, who, with some others, committed the sacrilege of burying a dog with funeral rites. The Lorena Tribunal commenced a prosecution and sent the Sumaria to the Suprema, which contented itself with ordering a courteous note to be addressed to the secular and ecclesiastical judges, expressing a hope that they would not permit a repetition of such scandals. It would be easy to multiply similar instances, but these will suffice to show how completely, in dealing with offenses against the faith, the spirit of the Inquisition had been tamed, and how factitious was the claim that its existence was essential for the preservation of religion, when there were over half a hundred episcopal tribunals perfectly competent to try such offenses, and perfectly ready to treat them with greater severity. Meanwhile, Fernando's reign had continued as it commenced. Under the influence of a Camarilla of low caste and ignoble favorites, who pandered to his vices and enriched themselves by trafficking in offices and in contracts and in justice, his government was a compound of brutality and imbecility, and the affairs of the nation fell into complete disorder. All the abuses that had flourished under Godoy were intensified and coupled with persistent, cruel persecution of those designated as liberals, who filled the jails through constantly recurring lists of proscriptions. De Martignac, who, as royal commissioner, accompanied the Duke of Angoulême in the invasion of 1823, was a thoroughly well-informed and unprejudiced observer, who, after a vigorous description of the misgovernment of Fernando, sums up by saying, we can conceive the influence of such a regime on the prosperity of the land, and yet it is difficult to realize the extent of disorder, wretchedness, and weakness to which it fell. It was necessary to resort to arbitrary taxes, to exorbitant duties which destroyed commerce, to loans raised without credit. It was impossible to provide for the most pressing necessities of the state. Everything was neglected or abandoned. The army was unpaid. The navy, destroyed at Trafalgar, remained in ruins. The administration, destitute of all means of action, did nothing and could do nothing to improve conditions or even to preserve what there was. From this arose the discontent of the people. It can scarce excite surprise that the crazy enthusiasm of Fernando's welcome in 1814 had evaporated. THE REVOLUTION OF 1820 During this disastrous period, every year saw an attempt at revolution. In 1814, it was tried at Pampeluna by General Mina, who escaped. 
in 1815, in Galicia, by Porlier, who was executed. In 1816, in Madrid, by Richard, who shared the same fate. In 1817, in Catalonia, by Lacey, who was shot. In 1818, in Valencia, by Vidal, who was put to death. Again, in Valencia, a plot was formed to break out January 1, 1819, but it was betrayed, and 13 of the conspirators were hanged. O'Donnell, Count of La Bisbal, an able soldier and unscrupulous intriguer, was privy to this, but averted suspicion and was appointed to command an expeditionary force, collecting at Cadiz for Buenos Aires, against the revolted colony. With customary negligence, transports were not provided. The troops lay idle for months, discontent spread, and a formidable conspiracy was organized, which counted on La Bisbal's support. He concluded that loyalty was safest and seized the leading plotters, for which he was rewarded with the Grand Cross of Carlos III. But suspicion arose. He was removed and replaced by the incapable Count of Calderon. The situation, however, was growing impossible, and revolution was in the air. A portion of the troops were cantoned at Las Cabezas de San Juan, a town not far from Cadiz. There, on January 1, 1820, Rafael de Riego, commander of the battalion of Asturias, assembled his men, made an inflammatory harangue, and they all declared for the Constitution. He made a dash for Arcos, where he captured Calderon and three of his generals, effected a junction with the battalions España and Corona under Colonel Antonio Quiroga, and failed in an attack on Cadiz. Delay and irresolution followed, until January 27th, when Riego, at the head of 1,500 men, marched to Algeciras, where he remained until February 7th. Defeated in an attempt on Malaga, he reached Cordova on March 7th, with some 500 despairing followers. No effort was made to capture them. The garrison and citizens looked on placidly, while Riego refreshed his men and headed for the Sierra Morena. They dropped off during the march, and he was left with 50 followers. So far as he was concerned, the movement was a failure. Still, its preliminary success had aroused the slumbering elements of discontent. On February 21st, revolution broke out at Coruña and spread to Ferrol and Vigo when the Count of San Román abandoned Galicia without a struggle. Saragossa followed on March 2nd, the captain-general and garrison joining the magistrates and people. When the news reached Barcelona on March 10th, the people rose and sacked the Inquisition, but did no injury to the officials. Within a few days, Tarragona, Gerona, and Mataró followed the example, the garrisons participating in the movement. In Navarre, Mina's account of the rising shows that there was prearrangement and that the municipal authorities and military officials were fully in accord. When he reached Pampeluna with a large force, gathered on his way from the border, he found that the revolution had already been peacefully accomplished on March 11th. Meanwhile, La Bisbal, seeing that the movement promised success, spared no promises to obtain command of the forces concentrating in La Mancha to put down Riego's rising. He received the appointment, and on reaching Ocaña, he induced the regiment Alejandro to cry, Viva la Constitución! The revolution was accomplished and was bloodless, save a hideous massacre at Cadiz of the unarmed multitude, perpetrated in cold blood by Don Manuel Freire. During the two months of this desultory movement, which prompt action could so readily have suppressed, the court was nerveless and incapable. When the news came of the rising in Galicia, Fernando issued, February 28th, a plaintive appeal, promising amendment. His terror increased as evil tidings came pouring in, and on March 3rd, 
he published a decree bewailing the state of the kingdom and announcing that he had ordered the council of state to prepare a comprehensive scheme of reform this was followed march sixth by another calling an immediate convocation of cortes it was too late he found himself abandoned by all even by his royal guard which general balesteros reported was planning to retire to buen retiro and sent a deputation asking him to swear to the constitution this was decisive and on the night of the seventh he issued another decree announcing his intention to do so this was received on the eighth with popular rejoicings but as no further action was taken an impatient mob on the ninth surrounded the palace with seditious cries and threats the guard was impassive fernando was deserted and was absolutely alone when the crowd began to mount the stairs to demand that he should swear to the constitution but they were restrained on learning that he had ordered the reassembling of the ayuntamiento of madrid as it had existed under the constitution its members were got together and proceeded immediately to the palace where fernando received them with warm expressions of affection he took the required oath of his own free will and ordered balesteros to make the army do the same a general illumination and bell ringing for three nights were ordered and the people dispersed not however without first visiting the inquisition releasing the prisoners and scattering the archives only two or three prisoners were found and these were political rodrigo tells us that the mob wanted them to pose as victims of persecution but they prudently refused and a neighboring cobbler was persuaded to exhibit himself as the presiding figure of the celebration on the same day march ninth fernando issued a decree abolishing the inquisition this bore that as its existence was incompatible with the constitution of eighteen twelve for which reason it had after mature deliberation been suppressed by the cortes and in conformity with the opinion of the junta this day established he ordered that from this day the suprema and the inquisition be suppressed throughout the monarchy setting at liberty all prisoners confined for political or religious opinions and transferring to the bishops in their respective dioceses their cases to be determined in accordance with the decree of the cortes this was followed march twentieth by a royal order providing for inventories of all property pertaining to the inquisition and reviving the decree of february twenty two eighteen thirteen the bureau of public credit was to take possession of and administer the property until its destination should be determined by the cortes shortly to be assembled while the salaries of officials were to be continued when the cortes met a decree of august ninth included this with other escheated property to be sold at auction by the junta nacional de credito during the slow progress of the revolution the inquisition seems to have been watching events with full consciousness of the fate in store for it if the movement should prove successful a letter of january nineteenth from the seville tribunal to the suprema states that it had delayed the arrests of the trinitarian fray juan montes and of don tomas diaz in consequence at first of the epidemic and then of the insurrection to which the suprema replied january twenty fourth that it left future action to the prudence of the tribunal considering how feeble at the time was the demonstration of riego this shows that its ultimate consequences were fully apprehended still the inquisition continued at work but the last case acted upon by the suprema was its confirmation february tenth of a sentence rendered january twenty eighth by the toledo tribunal on manuel de la pena palacios priest of ontoba as the last act of the dreaded holy office after a career of three centuries and a half it has an interest beyond its inherent trivial character and it will be found in the appendix 
At least one liberated prisoner gave expression to his delight at his release. Don Antonio Bernabu, a priest, had been a member of the Cortes of Cadiz, and had been arrested with the others in May 1814, but seems to have been released in about six months. He was a Jansenist of an extreme type, and in 1813 had printed a pamphlet to prove that the state could seize all ecclesiastical property and reduce the overgrown numbers of the clergy, putting those who were left on moderate salaries. The tract was a terrible indictment of the church for its greed of accumulation, its neglect of duty, and its departure from the old standards in concentrating all power in the Pope, which he attributed to the Isidorian decretals. On his release from prison, December 14, 1814, he hastened to denounce himself for this to the Inquisition and was placed in reclusion. In 1816, he denounced himself a second time for matters at first omitted. The fiscal presented the accusation April 20, 1817, rather cleverly drawn, for it demanded precise definition of his opinions on the wide range of subjects in which he charged the church with deviation from primitive times and specific proofs of his somewhat vague declamation as to abuses. To satisfy this would require the resources of a large library and years of research, while Bernabeu was confined in a convent and was denied even a copy of his offending pamphlet, besides being exposed to all manner of persecutions by his fellow inmates. His trial was still pending when the decree of March 9th liberated him. He was promptly returned as a deputy to the Cortes of 1820, and he celebrated his release by reprinting his pamphlet with an account of his sufferings and his answers to the charges of the fiscal. End of section 78. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 79 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 1, Part 11, Conclusion, Decadence, and Extinction. It would carry us too far from our subject to recount in detail the extravagancies and follies with which the triumphant liberals invited the cruel reaction that awaited them. Moderation, perhaps, was scarce to be expected of men, smarting under the persecution of the last six years, and suddenly brought from fortresses and presidios, or from exile, to take charge of the government and to frame laws for the nation that they should in turn persecute their persecutors was natural but impolitic mutual hatreds were inflamed and the land was divided into factions between which harmony and forbearance became impossible the long centuries of despotism and the repression of independent thought and action had rendered the people incapable of the large measure of self-government provided by the constitution so-called patriotic societies were rapidly formed de lorenzini de san fernando la fontana de oro la cruz de malta la landa burana and others which in reality were jacobinical clubs where the most radical measures were advocated and the most violent means of effecting them were urged an unbridled press was busy in adding fuel to the flames and in stimulating the ardor which sought to realize anarchical dreams. Masonry had been busy in preparing the revolution, and with its success, Masonry became the avenue to power and place. Its lodges multiplied and were rapidly filled. Then, with the progress of advanced ideas, Masonry became too conservative for the exaltados, who left it and established the comuneros, whose statutes formed a state of revolutionary character within the state. They rivaled the Masons in numbers and influence, 
and the virulent struggle for supremacy between the two bodies at times paralyzed the government and neutralized the forces of order. The disorderly element existing in all communities was utilized whenever there was an object to be gained, and mob rule became of frequent occurrence, not only in Madrid, but in nearly all the cities. The orders of the government were obeyed or disregarded as suited the temper of the populace or of its instigators. Officials commissioned as captains general or governors or magistrates were admitted or rejected. Orderly administration was becoming impossible, and everywhere turbulence reigned supreme. Liberalism was committing suicide. Yet, liberalism had need of its undivided strength, to maintain itself against the opposing forces. Fernando, while playing the part of a constitutional king, was constantly plotting to throw off the yoke, and was entertaining secret relations with those who were striving to overthrow the government. Successive Cortes seemed to take pleasure in exacerbating the hostility of the clergy, whose influence over the mass of the people was unbounded. Much of this legislation was, no doubt, salutary in itself, but at the moment it was dangerous, and the blows succeeded each other so rapidly that the sufferers might well regard it as systematic persecution. August 31, 1820, a law organizing the National Army exempted from service only such clerics as were actually in holy orders. One of September 26th subjected all clerics, secular and regular, to secular jurisdiction, for offenses incurring corporal punishment. Within a week, another decree suppressed a large portion of the monastic orders, and the mendicants who were left were subjected to the bishops, and consolidated into houses of not less than twelve inmates, and this was followed by other special decrees of suppression. The property of the suppressed houses was applied to the credito publico, and when Fernando refused his signature, a popular tumult was organized, which frightened him into acquiescence. October 26th, it was ordered that dispensations for marriage within prohibited degrees should be issued without charge to those applying in forma pauperis, thus cutting off a large source of income. When bands of insurgent royalists began to make their appearance, and were joined or led by priests, the bishops were ordered April 20, 1821, to report what steps they had taken to punish them, and within eight days to issue edicts requiring their flocks to obey the law. Then, on June 29th, without papal authority, a contribution of 30 million reals was levied on the clergy, and on the same day the tithes were reduced one-half, while allowing some compensation in the removal of certain imposts. The clergy, not unnaturally, promoted disaffection, and to check this, decrees of November 1, 1822, authorized the government at discretion to transfer from one place to another all parish priests and ecclesiastics, the cost of maintenance of those thus deported being thrown upon the bishops. In fact, the irreconcilable claims of state and church rendered hostility inevitable it was impossible for the latter to understand that when it entered politics and became a political factor it had to be treated like other political bodies the theocracy of the middle ages had so long enjoyed power without responsibility that its immunity became part of latin doctrine elsewhere the impracticability of this had been demonstrated but in spain the Church has never ceased to struggle for the maintenance of medievalism, or has understood that sedition in the pulpit should not be treated differently from sedition in the tribune. It refused to recognize that self-preservation is the first law of governments as of individuals, and that they cannot allow artificial privileges to work their destruction. The theory of the liberals was that external ecclesiastical discipline was subject to the civil authority, while internal discipline was reserved to the Church. The Church asserted that in all things it ruled itself, and that any secular interference was a laying of profane hands on the ark. 
the gauge of battle was virtually thrown by Veremundo Arias, Archbishop of Valencia, who, on October 20, 1820, addressed to the Cortes a long manifesto upholding all the extreme claims of the Church and denying the distinction between external and internal discipline. On November 10th, he was arrested, and on the 24th was put on board ship and sent to France. This was the commencement of a persecution in which many bishops suffered. Alvarez de Palma of Granada was set aside and replaced by the liberal archpriest Vinegas. Uriz y la Faga of Pampeluna was summoned to Madrid, but, on the road, was rescued by royalists and conveyed to France. Blas Beltran of Coria was banished. The bishop-elect of Santa Marta, Colombia, received his sentence of exile on his deathbed in Plasencia. Cienfuegos of Cadiz had to fly to save his life. Pablo de Sichar of Barcelona fled and remained absent until 1823. Renteria y Reyes of Lerida was carried under guard to Barcelona, narrowly escaped execution, and was detained in Malaga until 1823. Ramon Stroch y Vidal of Viche was imprisoned in Barcelona, then sent to Tarragona and, on the road under a pretext, was made to descend and was shot with his attendant. Others who were exiled were Jaime Creus of Tarragona, Cervuelo de la Fuente of Oviedo, Rafael de Velez of Ceuta, and Castillon y Salas of Tarazona. It is true that the worst of these acts were committed by mobs or irresponsible parties in the growing disorders of the times, but they remained unrebuked and unpunished. A government which thus treated its clergy was not likely to maintain friendly relations with the Holy See. One of the earliest measures of the new government was an act of August 17, 1820, suppressing the Jesuits. Pius VII met this with a letter of September 16th to Fernando, deploring the perils that threatened religion and the church and reciting the obnoxious measures taken, for which he had ordered his nuncio to make reclamation, but without effect. Relations were not improved when, April 21, 1821, a decree suppressed all payments, whether in money or other equivalent, for papal bulls for archbishops, bishops, matrimonial dispensations, and other rescripts, in lieu of which the paltry annual sum of 9,000 silver dollars was offered. This was unwise, but still more so was the sending to Rome as ambassador of Joaquin Lorenzo Villanueva towards the close of 1822, when the intervention of the Holy Alliance was impending. At Turin, he was met by a papal order forbidding him to come further, and asking the ministry to appoint someone else. Evaristo San Miguel, the Secretary of State, insisted. The papal foreign secretary replied that the opinions expressed by Villanueva in the Cartas de Don Roque Leal and in the Cortes were such that the Holy See could never receive him. To this the answer was to send the nuncio his passports with orders to leave Spain. The rupture with Rome was complete, and in the eyes of pious Spaniards, the government had justified the clerical definition of the Constitution as heresy. The clerical temper thus stimulated is fairly exhibited in a little pamphlet by Padre Miguel Canto, parish priest of Calosa de Segura, celebrating the downfall of constitutionalism. He is fairly drunk with joy and consigns the liberals to the bottomless pit for eternity with vigorous delight. That the civil power should dare to assume any control over the externals of the church fills him with astonishment and rage, all the greater in view of the suffering which it inflicted, especially on the regulars. Canto tells us that the fabric of his church had enjoyed a revenue of 4,000 pesos, and that it was reduced to such poverty that he had not wherewith to provide wafers and wine for the sacrament or oil for the lamps. Yet the resources of the Spanish church were such that, 
it still had ample funds for political uses. When, in October 1823, after his release by the French, Fernando traveled from Cadiz to Madrid, he received involuntary offerings from the chapters of Toledo, Seville, Granada, Jaén, and Cuenca, 11,970,000 reals in silver, although the land was in a condition of complete exhaustion. It is not difficult to believe that the pulpit and the confessional were energetically used to inflame and organize the disaffection that rapidly succeeded to the enthusiasm for the Constitution. The new administration was no more efficient than the old. Ministries, hampered with the underhand intrigues of the king, perpetually guarding against eager rivals and speedily engrossed with suppressing the armed resistance springing up on every hand, had little opportunity of rectifying the abuses which had made Fernando unpopular. To the people at large, the only visible result of the revolution was that the liberals in turn were persecuting the serviles. The nobles, moreover, were alienated by the suppression of mayorazgos and vinculaciones, or entails and perpetual charges on lands, a reform which had long been urged by statesmen such as Jovellanos. Willing and receptive listeners to clerical invective were abundant, and movements to overthrow the government speedily began taking shape. Before the year 1820 was out, in Galicia there was organized a junta apostolica, and in Burgos there was a crazy conspiracy of some frails and a general. Soon wandering bands of insurgents sprang up, among whom members of the clergy were conspicuous, as though it was a holy war. Suppressed in one place, they appeared in another, waging a guerrilla warfare like that against Napoleon. The land was torn with faction, and liberals and royalists seemed to emulate each other in contributing to its ruin. Early in July, 1822, the royal guards, with the secret connivance of the king, endeavored to gain possession of Madrid. After a sanguinary conflict in the streets, they were defeated, when Fernando, from a balcony of his palace, stimulated the nationals in pursuit of the flying wretches. Civil broils are apt to be pitiless, but in Spain they assumed a ferocity not often witnessed elsewhere. If the royalists in Catalonia massacred in cold blood the garrison of the Seo de Urgel, a liberal noyade in Coruña dispatched fifty-one political prisoners, many of them ecclesiastics and persons of distinction. The revolt was constantly assuming proportions more alarming, especially in Catalonia, where it had the almost unanimous support of the peasantry. The insurrectionary bands coalesced into a force of five thousand men, styling itself the Army of the Faith, which, on June 21, 1822, captured the Seo de Urgel and made it their stronghold. There, on August 15th, was organized a royalist regency, composed of Creus, the exiled archbishop of Tarragona, the baron of Eroles, a soldier of some reputation, and the marquis of Mata Florida. The counter-revolution thus adopted a public and official character. The regency assumed to speak for the king, held in durance by the Jacobins. In fact, as early as June 1st, he had authorized Mata Florida to organize it, and was in constant communication with it through one of the officials of the court. It obtained quasi-recognition abroad. It negotiated a loan of eight million with the Parisian capitalist Ouvra, and, with the support of Pius VII, it opened negotiations with Austria and Russia, offering surrenders of territory in exchange for aid. End of section 79. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 80 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 1, Part 12, Conclusion, Decadence and Extinction. Spain was rapidly drifting into anarchy. The government was too weak to suppress disorder, whether committed by friends or foes. Compromise between the factions was not to be hoped for, and even patriots could see that the only path to order lay through intervention from abroad. That this was impending became more and more evident. The example of Spain had been followed by Naples and Portugal, and then by Piedmont, enforcing on their sovereigns constitutions like that of 1812. The Holy Alliance took the alarm. The Congresses of Tropau in 1820 and of Laybach in 1821 ordered armed intervention, and the new institutions of Naples and Piedmont were readily overthrown. In May 1821, communications from Russia to Spain and a Russian circular to the courts of Europe openly expressed dissatisfaction at the success of armed rebellion, with scarcely veiled threats of action in case the Cortes should prove disobedient to the monarch, and the conflict with the royal guard in July 1822 gave the foreign ministers in Madrid a pretext for warnings which were diplomatically veiled threats of intervention. Preparations for it were already on foot in France. An epidemic of yellow fever in Barcelona served as an excuse for establishing a cordon sanitaire on the border, gradually strengthened until it became an army of observation, and in reality a support for the Catalan insurgents, as Mina found when he conducted a successful campaign, which in the beginning of 1823 forced the Regency to take refuge in France. The Congress of Verona met in the autumn of 1822. The Urgell Regency sent there the Count de España as its representative to urge that Spain should be restored to the condition prior to March 9, 1820. The government sent no envoy, relying on the friendly aid of England represented by the Duke of Wellington. Without his knowledge, the Allied powers signed on November 22nd a secret treaty in which they declared against the sovereignty of the people, representative government and the freedom of the press, and in favor of the clergy as an instrument for enforcing the passive obedience of the subject, and each signatory pledged itself to a subsidy of twenty millions of francs annually to France, to which was assigned the duty of suppressing these destructive principles in Spain and Portugal and of restoring the peninsula to the conditions prior to 1820. Even yet, intervention was not certain, for France was not eager for the task, and there were some negotiations looking to modifications of the Constitution, but the liberals would not listen to such suggestions. Chateaubriand, however, that curious compound of idealism, bombast, and vanity, who as French foreign minister and representative at Verona, takes to himself all the credit for the enterprise, is especially careful to point out that its real object was the restoration of France to the hegemony of the continent, after the abasement of the restoration by foreign bayonets, an object which he assumes was fully accomplished. Early in January 1823, four notes from the Allies were presented collectively, offering, in more or less offensive fashion, the alternative of a return to absolutism or invasion. These portentous communications were received with the utmost nonchalance. On the night of their reception, Secretary of State San Miguel carried them to the Grand Orient and drew up his replies, in which Fernando is said to have cunningly stimulated defiance to banded Europe. Whatever might be the decision of France, San Miguel said, Spain would tranquilly follow the path of duty and justice, its rule of conduct would be firm adhesion to the Constitution of 1812, and refusal to recognize the right of intervention on any side. These would be dignified and resolute words in a united nation facing a coalition, but 
under the circumstances they were mere idle vaporing the government in fact was barely able to make head against the insurrection save in catalonia navarre biscay and aragon were in open civil war with forces equally balanced in murcia the famous robber jaime alfonso was posing as the defender of the faith in castile the cura merino and el rojo de valderas were levying war in andalusia zaldivar held his own in spite of repeated defeats in toledo and cuenza joaquin silo and the cura atanasio were maintaining the rebellion in Siguenza, the insurrection of cuesta was organizing and was soon to break out in short the whole of spain was in convulsion the only explanation of the attitude of the liberals is that they were living in a fool's paradise and seem to have welcomed intervention in the belief that it would kindle national feeling and restore national unity hallucination was carried to the point that they anticipated a popular rising like that of eighteen o eight that the forty thousand insurgents in arms would turn against the invader even that the french troops would abandon their standards for those of spain and that england which had calmly seen the constitution overthrown in eighteen fourteen would provoke a war with all europe in its defense they closed their eyes to the fact that in eighteen o eight the clergy aroused the masses against the french and were now their warmest allies eager to revenge systematic persecution that the throne was secretly undermining them and that they were without resources for the treasury was exhausted the army scarce existed save on paper the magazines were empty and the party in power was rent into bitterly opposing factions a kind of delirium seized the deputies when san miguel on january ninth laid the correspondence before the cortes and his replies were clamorously approved without distinction of party yet this effervescence soon subsided a decisive victory gained by the insurgents at brihuega not far from madrid on january twenty fourth threw the capital into a tremor and on february sixteenth the cortes adopted a decree looking to the transfer of the government in case of necessity new cortes opened their sessions march first and their first thought was to place themselves in safety carrying with them fernando both as a hostage and as necessary to the assumption that the government of spain traveled with them resistance on his part postponed the move until march twentieth when the exodus to seville took place there they remained until june when the approach of the french necessitated a further flight and on the ninth cadiz was selected as the place of refuge this time fernando resolutely refused to fly from his liberators and as coercion of the monarch was incompatible with the theory that he was still governing it was assumed that he was incapacitated by reason of a temporary delirium he was deposed and a regency was appointed which ordered the transfer to cadiz on the twelfth the king and royal family left seville the cortes adjourned to meet in cadiz june eighteenth in four days fernando was declared to be again in his right mind and the regency resigned the spectacle of a flying government dragging with it a captive king whom it recognized as still actively reigning was worse than ludicrous it gave to fernando a claim on the sympathy which he had forfeited and served as an incentive and an excuse for cruel reprisals meanwhile the army of invasion had been gathering on the border under the duke of angouleme nephew of louis the fourteenth from bayonne on april second he issued a manifesto to the effect that he did not come to make war but to liberate a captive king to restore the altar and the throne to release the priesthood from exile and the whole people from a domination that was preparing the destruction of spain on april seventh the army crossed the bidasoa consisting of ninety one thousand men of whom thirty five thousand were spanish royalists its discipline was perfect and its conduct admirable 
everywhere it was received as a liberator with cries of viva el rey absoluto viva la religión y la inquisición resistance was impossible and although five armies had been organized none worthy of mention was attempted except in catalonia where the indomitable mina prolonged the useless struggle until november and at cadiz where the so-called government was battling for existence siege was laid there on june twenty third and was prolonged until october first when fernando was ceremoniously conveyed to the camp of his french deliverers yet if rhetoric could have repelled the invaders they would have been glad to escape from the eloquence which accompanied a solemn declaration of war on april twenty ninth when flores calderon boasted that the breasts of the deputies would make an impenetrable rampart around the constitutional king and his family if the french came as pacifiers they made a mistake in bringing with them a junta provisional of four rabid royalists formally installed at ozarzun april ninth it assumed to be the government and issued a manifesto rescinding all the acts of the revolution and restoring the conditions prior to march seventh eighteen twenty it used its authority in such unsparing proscriptions that even the royalists became alarmed and appealed to de martignac the royal commissioner accompanying angouillem pointing out the evils to be apprehended from such ferocity quarrels within the junta afforded an excuse for superseding it and angouillem on reaching madrid empowered the councils of castile and indias to nominate a regency at the head of which was the duke del infantado this body on june fourth published a manifesto promising to use its power to prevent persecutions and excesses to maintain internal peace execute the laws and make the royal power respected these were fair words belied by acts the whole arrangement had been dictated by secret instructions from fernando and proscription and persecution continued as active as ever the regency confirmed a measure of the junta organizing bodies of so-called royalist volunteers whose duties consisted in arresting and imprisoning all whom greed or malevolence might designate as objects of suspicion in which work they were aided by the mob always ready for violence and rapine in saragossa fifteen hundred persons were dragged to prison by the populace led by priests and frails in navarre the guerrilla chief known as el trapense committed revolting excesses in madrid and cordova the jails were crowded with prisoners this work went on in most of the towns as the national forces retreated the victims being mostly citizens of wealth and position while the pulpits resounded with exhortations to persecution and extermination and the french troops in so far as they could restrained the outrages despite his reluctance to interfere angouillem felt called upon to put an end to the cruelty and impolicy of these persecutions and on his way to cadiz he issued from andohar august eighth a decree forbidding arrests by the spanish authorities without authorization from the commandants of the troops of the districts who were instructed to liberate all political prisoners and to arrest those who contravened these orders while all periodicals were subjected to the inspection of the commandants the foreign ministers however protested against this as an invasion of spanish independence which emboldened the regency to remonstrate in a haughty and insolent manner the royalist volunteers of navarre in a manifesto of august twentieth were prodigal of insults and menaces to the duke a memorial addressed to him august twenty third signed by eguia and a large number of military chiefs and priests stigmatized his effort at pacification as an attempt to perpetuate an impious faction and demanded the restoration of the inquisition wherever there were no french troops the decree was ignored and finally angouillem whether instructed by his court or afraid openly to oppose the regency issued an explanatory order which virtually annulled the decree 
Evidently there was to be no peace for the distracted land. Even the Regency felt it necessary to disclaim responsibility for the horrors enacting on every hand. August 10th, it ordered the prosecution of the rioters, who, at Alcala, Guadalajara, and Torrejon, had committed terrible excesses under pretext of avenging the transfer of the king to Cadiz, and, on August 13th, it commanded the people to restrain their zeal in making arrests, but, while it was powerful to excite passion, it was powerless to enforce order. When in view of the hopelessness of further resistance at Cadiz, Fernando was informed, September 28th, that he was at liberty to seek the French camp, a tumult arose and a demand for guarantees. He summoned the ministers, telling them that he desired to give assurances and ordering José María Calatrava to draw up a decree declaring of his own free will and, on the faith of his royal word, that he would adopt a form of government assuring the happiness of the nation, the personal security, the property and the civil liberty of Spaniards, with complete oblivion of the past. The amnesty was rendered complete with elaborate details, and when it was presented to him for signature on the 30th, he said that, to remove all doubts, he would make some changes with his own hand, which he accordingly did, rendering some of the clauses clearer and more emphatic. When, on the next day, he was received by Angoulême, he shut himself up with the Duke del Infantado and Victor Damien Saez, his former confessor, whom he appointed universal minister, and, before the colloquy was over, there was drawn up and signed a decree of two articles— the first declared null and void all acts since March 7, 1820. The second confirmed the proscriptions of the Junta of Ozarzun and the Regency. Printed copies of this, together with that of the day before, were circulated to the no small perplexity of all concerned. Then General Bourmont, the French commander, learned that Ferdinand had passed secret sentence of death on some prominent liberals there present, whereupon they were conveyed on naval vessels to Gibraltar and saved from his sanguinary vengeance. This was but a foretaste of the wrath to come. Proscriptive and oppressive measures followed each other, and the persecution inaugurated by the Regency was sharpened and systematized. End of section 80. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 81 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 1, Part 13, Conclusion. Decadence and Extinction Ten Years of Reaction The French had already discovered that they had raised a demon whom they could not exorcise. They had restored unconditionally to absolute power a prince who was utterly faithless, whom no promises could bind, who cared only for the gratification of his passions, and who was surrounded by vindictive counsellors, eager for the blood and spoils of their countrymen. The prisons were crowded to repletion, and the untamed ferocity of the multitude, stimulated by the pulpit, was let loose upon defenseless victims. It was a scandal in the face of all Europe, and was felt acutely. Effort was made to repair the mischief, but with scant success. Fernando, on leaving Cadiz, had written to Louis the Eighteenth, expressing his gratitude, and Louis seized the opportunity in his reply to impress on him his own example and that of their ancestor Henry the Fourth as the only means of bringing peace to a distracted land, warning him that a blind despotism weakened instead of strengthening royal power. 
Angouyem had manifested his disapprobation of the decree of October 1st, and a coolness arose between him and Fernando, which went on increasing. They parted October 11th, Angouyem refusing all honors on his homeward journey and leaving Bourmont in command. The French army was gradually reduced, but the last detachments did not leave Spain until November 1827. Secure in this protection, Fernando was deaf to remonstrances. It is true that when the ambassadors of the powers met him in Seville, under their pressure, he issued a decree, October 22nd, holding out expectations of what he would do on reaching Madrid, but promises cost him nothing, and these were as futile as those of September 30th. To emphasize the necessity of conciliation, the French cabinet prevailed upon the Russian ambassador, Pozzo de Borgo, to visit Madrid in the name of the Holy Alliance. He arrived there October 28th and held long conferences with Fernando and Victor Saez urging clemency and a general amnesty, but he met in reply with nothing but vague generalizations. If the welfare of a nation had not been at stake, the reflections of Chateaubriand on the success of his enterprise and his correspondence with Talaru, the French ambassador, might well raise a smile. He was disgusted, he said, with having to do with a monarch who would burn his kingdom in a cigar, and he declared that the sovereigns of today seem specially created to destroy a society ready to perish. In Spain, the political sore is the king, and it is almost impossible to apply a remedy. At first, he assumed that he could dictate a policy, and asserted that he would not tolerate the follies of the king, nor allow France to appear as an accomplice in stupidity and fanaticism. Talaru was to speak as a master. If the ministry was not to his mind, he was to have it changed, the threatened withdrawal of the troops being what would force Fernando to listen to reason. He soon found, however, that behind the ministry was the Camarilla, the real power that could not be dislodged, and that the clergy was also a body to be reckoned with. Chateaubriand's effervescence wore itself out against the impenetrability to reason and argument of Fernando and his advisers, and his demands shrank to asking for a decree of amnesty. It would be badly framed, he knew, but at least it would have the appearance of doing something. After months of urgency, at last Fernando agreed to it. A fairly liberal scheme was drawn up, but after it had been submitted to the revision of the friends of Don Carlos, of the bishops, of the secret Junta de Estado, and of the Council of Castile, its framers could scarce recognize it. While it offered pardon to all participants in the disturbances since 1820 in support of the Constitution, there were fifteen accepted classes, some of them vague and comprehensive. It ordered the discharge of all prisoners not comprised within the exceptions, but this was not obeyed. It ordered the bishops to contribute to bring about union, but few of them did so. It was dated May 1, 1824, but was not published until the 20th, and the interval was employed all over Spain in gathering evidence to bring individuals under the accepted classes, so that they could be arrested simultaneously with the publication of the decree. The prisons were filled with new victims, and the courts were overwhelmed with prosecutions. The courts, moreover, were supplemented with military commissions, whose procedure was informal and summary. The Gaceta de Madrid, between August 24th and October 12, 1824, chronicled 112 executions by shooting or hanging. Whatever scanty favor was shown to liberals in the decree was more than counterbalanced by another of July 1st, granting pardon for all assaults and injuries committed on them or their property except when murder had resulted. The royalist volunteers thus had full license 
and the liberals were virtually outlawed. Proscription and persecution were systematized in a manner without precedent by the compilation of lists of all suspects. During the constitutional period, Fernando had kept a libro verde, noting down the names of all who displeased him, thus marking them for future vengeance. On his restoration to power, a secret junta de Estado, consisting chiefly of ecclesiastics, was formed, whose business it was to gather information against all who were opposed to absolutism. Denunciations were invited from priests and frailes, from enemies and from the lowest class of informers, to whom inviolable secrecy was promised, and all the scandal and false evidence thus accumulated was recorded opposite the name of the party, for use as occasion might require. The list was divided into districts, and copies were sent to the respective intendants of police, who contributed such further names and charges as they could gather from all sources, however vile. Thus every man's liberty and property were at the mercy of secret and irresponsible informers. It was a libro verde on a scale which the Inquisition itself had never imagined, and the system was more thorough and more dangerous to the innocent than that of the Inquisition. Such was the condition of Spain during the terrible ten years from 1823 to 1833, known as the Epoca de Chaperon, Chaperon being the president of the Military Commission of Madrid and notorious for his cruelty. One result of this is well set forth in a singularly outspoken representation addressed by Javier de Burgos to Fernando, January 24, 1826. He had been sent to Paris to negotiate a loan, and he ascribes his failure not so much to the poverty of the land as to the absence of peace, essential to prosperity, and this arose from the successive proscriptions which had desolated Spain. Now, he says, simple police orders deprive of common rights whole classes and subject them to penalties which, in well-ordered countries, can be inflicted only by tribunals. Much is said of the League of European Bankers against Spanish credit, but this has only been made invincible by the efforts of the six or eight thousand proscribed exiles in England, France, and Belgium. A few days ago, the journal which represents commerce and industry said, As for Spain, it continues to fall rapidly into barbarism. It is a second Turkey, only more miserable and worse governed. Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile obtain loans, even though their independence is not recognized, but Spain cannot get a maravedi. It is creditable to Fernando that he took this plain speaking good-naturedly, and subsequently gave the writer the cross of Carlos III, but he was impervious to the good advice. The decrees of the Regency and of Fernando, restoring the conditions prior to March 7, 1820, and invalidating all subsequent acts, seemed necessarily to revive the Inquisition. Its officials, however, hesitated to resume their functions without positive orders, and it was known that the French were opposed to its restoration. Numerous petitions for it were made to Angouillme, but he evaded categorical replies, saying that he would procure the liberation of the king and leave him to determine what would best promote the happiness of the nation. After Fernando's release, felicitations came pouring in, warmly thanking him for his proscriptive measures, and among these were many urging that the Inquisition should be set to work. If at the moment he desired to meet these wishes, he was restrained by the earnest opposition of the Allies, who especially shrank from the responsibility of resuscitating an institution so universally abhorred. As Chateaubriand wrote to Talaru, December 1st, we will not permit our victories to be dishonored by proscriptions or that the fires of the Inquisition be raised as altars to our triumphs. And on December 11th, 
he declared it to be necessary that the royal confessor should not be an inquisitor. Fernando, however, seems already to have questioned whether the Inquisition would really be of service to him politically, and, as religion with him was merely a matter of policy, he preferred to let the question slumber without committing himself. It is related that, once, when a bishop of extreme views was urging upon him the utility which the Inquisition had always been to the crown, he walked across the room to a balcony, and, looking up at the serene sky, exclaimed, "'What a cloud! A great storm is coming!' His intentions, however, were indirectly manifested by a decree of January 1, 1824, which withdrew from the credito publico the administration of the property of the Inquisition and placed it with the Colecto General de Espolios, who was charged to pay the salaries of all the officials of the tribunals. This indicated that there was no intention to restore the institution to activity, and to this Fernando adhered, notwithstanding the urgency which continued. In fact, as the reaction established itself, Fernando could not but recognize that he had nothing to gain from the Inquisition, and might risk something. His one object was unlimited absolutism. Circumstances had enabled him to attain this to a degree which none of his predecessors had enjoyed. The defeat of the liberals was so complete, and the servility of the royalists so great, that he could disregard whatever remnants of the old Spanish institutions had still placed some restraints on the crown. There was no secret made of this. A royal order of October 17, 1824, destroyed at a blow all the municipal self-government of Spain. The ayuntamientos of the towns were no longer to be elective, those in office were to choose their successors in thirds at a time, and the appointees were subjected to revision by the royal audiencias, while in the preamble the object of this was openly stated to be that there should disappear for ever from Spanish soil the most remote idea that sovereignty resided elsewhere than in the royal person, and the people should know that not the slightest alteration would ever be made in the fundamental laws of the monarchy. The only claim of the Inquisition to efficiency, greater than that of the police and royal tribunals, was in its delegated faculties from the Pope, and to a monarch thus resolved to concentrate in his own hands all power, it was naturally distasteful to employ for political ends foreign authority which, nominally at least, was not under his own control. This objection he might have disregarded if he had reason to expect from the Inquisition any special service, but such there was not. While there still was law in Spain, the Inquisition might be useful as being above the law, but now that the law was merely the sic volo sic hubeo, the Inquisition was superfluous, while its secret procedure was more tardy and cumbrous, perhaps even less certain, than that of the military commissions, and the system described above of lists and suspects with evidence gathered from every source by thousands of informers was far more comprehensive in plan and in detail than anything that the inquisitorial organization had ever attempted. The Inquisition thus had nothing to offer, and, careless as was Fernando of the public opinion of Europe, even he could recognize the wisdom of avoiding the odium of re-establishing an institution so generally condemned. To the victims it made little difference whether their judges were called military commissioners or inquisitors. Their offenses were justiciable by either, for the pulpits resounded with the doctrine that all constitutionalists and liberals were Jansenists and heretics, a doctrine justified by a royal order of May 2, 1824, to the bishops, requiring them to celebrate in their diocese missions calling the liberals to repentance. Yet there was a lurking Jansenism in this tacit assumption that the regalias enabled the king to prolong at his pleasure that suppression of the holy office which, in 1813, 
had been proved by learned theologians to be in violation of the canons and of the authority of the Holy See. The clerical party was restless and dissatisfied, the more so because, as Fernando's theory of government was to render his own power secure by promoting discord among his followers, he occasionally favored the moderate royalists against the extremists. The latter were not content, even with the prevailing cruel persecution, and longed for one more searching with the Inquisition as its instrument. The secret organization, known as the Junta Apostolica, or Angel Exterminador, had cast its eyes upon Don Carlos as a leader who could realize their aspirations, for he was completely under priestly influence and belonged to the extreme faction, besides being heir presumptive in the probable case of Fernando dying without issue. Carlos, however, though not a man of strong character, was strictly honorable and was bound to Fernando with ties of a mutual affection which endured to the end. He was quite content to await the chances of succession, but his wife Francisca of Portugal and her sister, the Princess of Beira, widow of the Infante Pedro, were ambitious. His apartments in the royal palace were the center of intrigues in which he did not personally participate, while Fernando, who through his spies was kept informed of them, did not interfere, confiding in his brother's loyalty and his own ability to crush attempts against himself. End of section 81. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 82 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 1, Part 14. Conclusion. Decadence and Extinction. In 1824 and 1825, there were movements and risings of the extremists in various provinces, which indicated concerted action, and were suppressed with more or less facility, except in Catalonia. There, the hidden leaders of the conspiracy found a population discontented with what they deemed the lukewarmness of the government, which they were told was now controlled by Freemasons. The old members of the Army of the Faith, moreover, deemed themselves insufficiently rewarded for their services, and organized under the name of Agraviados, forming the nucleus of a Federación de Realistas Puros, more royalist than the king. Towards the end of 1826, there was circulated a manifesto from the Federation urging the necessity of placing Don Carlos on the throne. Its organization rapidly extended, and April 1, 1827, was appointed for the rising, which was readily suppressed, and a free pardon was granted to the insurgents. The pacification was but temporary. In July, at Manresa, a junta superior was formed, and in August, the tolling of the bells summoned the somatenes, or levies en masse, to arms, when a portion of the troops joined the insurrection, which was soon supreme in Catalonia. A report made, August 27th, by de Hesa, fiscal of the court of Barcelona, states that the war cry of the insurgents was, Long live the Inquisition! Death to the Constitution! death to the negros, death to the police. They were told that the rising was by order of the Pope, and that the king was surrounded by Freemasons. It was supposed to be the work of the clergy, who desired the re-establishment of the Inquisition, and to make themselves all-powerful by working on the fanaticism of the ignorant mountaineers. That the situation was becoming dangerous, is manifested by the only kingly act in Fernando's record, 
for he resolved to visit Catalonia himself after sending the Count de España there with full powers. He reached Tarragona September 28th, being received everywhere with enthusiasm, though there was an abortive project of abducting him by a large body of royalist volunteers assembled as though to do him honor. From Tarragona he issued a proclamation to the effect that those who should not lay down their arms within twenty-four hours must expect no mercy, and that he would deal with their leaders as he saw fit. The secret societies had already issued orders of pacification. Organized resistance was abandoned. Nine of the chiefs were hanged, and the land was speedily at peace. Carlos took no part in the rising, but he knew of the plans and had not opposed them, and the name of Carlists was thereafter used to designate the extreme royalists. It is significant that when Fernando ordered the bishops to exhort their subjects to peace, some of them obeyed, but Pablo de Jesus de Corcuera y Caserta, the prelate of Vich, refused in a letter of October 6th, on the ground that he could not conscientiously do so. Fernando, he said, had not kept his promises. He had assembled a junta to examine all books in circulation, yet poisonous ones, like that of Thomas a Kempis, were allowed to be read. He had ordered the restoration of everything to the conditions prior to March 7, 1820, yet the Inquisition had not been re-established. Other royal shortcomings were pointed out, and in the face of all this, it was impossible for a bishop not to take part in temporal matters. To preach obedience as required would be to compromise the episcopate and to become the instrument of the enemies of God, nor would it avail anything, for it would be impossible to make the people think otherwise. These outspoken sentiments of the fiery bishop explain much that is saddest in modern Spanish history. He was not punished for them, but when the Count de España came to Vich, he summoned the recalcitrant prelate before him and reminded him of the fate of Acuña of Zamora, which might be repeated if it so pleased the Catholic king. After this, there was no further demand for the restoration of the Inquisition, as Fernando's determination was recognized as unalterable. For a while, however, it had not accepted its suppression as final, and it still sought to perform some of its functions in hopes of being again revived. This is demonstrated by the Valencia Register, laboriously and faithfully compiled and brought up to the end of 1824, and the same seems to have been done in Madrid, for in a document of 1817 there is an appended note referring to the Madrid Register of January 31, 1824. As the salaries were continued, an organization was kept up and a show was made of performing some kind of work. The Valencia Register thus contains several cases in which it acted in 1824, though it modestly styles itself Este Tribunal Ecclesiastico, and not santo oficio. Thus, Valero Andreu was accused to it of a blasphemous proposition and was duly sentenced. The criminal court of Valencia regarded it as still functioning, and when in trials there came evidence of matters cognizable by the Inquisition, the proofs would be sent to the tribunal, which would summon the offender and pass judgment on him. The penalty, however, being not more than a reprimand. Three cases of this kind are recorded, the latest being July 3, 1824. We may fairly assume that in some, at least, of the other tribunals, trivial work of this kind was similarly performed. Some papers connected with a quarrel between the officials of the Mallorca Tribunal give us an insight into its internal condition in 1830. Its business consisted in the collection of the censos and other sources of revenue. There were many of these, 
loans to towns and villages as well as to individuals throughout the islands. Payments were apt to be tardy, and the labor of collection was considerable, frequently involving legal proceedings. The inquisitor had disappeared, although from another document we learn that he was named Francisco Antonio Andraca, and that he was drawing his salary elsewhere. The existing head of the tribunal was a juez subdelegado, a representative of the old juez de bienes. There was a treasury and an auditing department with an administrador tesorero, Juan Antonio Togores, who was disabled and represented by his son, José Antonio Togores. The secretary of the secreto was Bartolomé Serra y Benazar, acting as auditor ad interim, whose clerk was Pedro Mascaro, notary of sequestrations. The only other official was the portero, Sebastian Banza. Togores claims that when the buildings were destroyed in 1820, he incurred many enmities by efforts to compel restitution of plundered materials. Among others, a count of Ayamans was sued for purloining building stone. Togores constructed a wall around the site, and the heaps of stone and tiles still lay scattered there. Outside of the enclosure, a couple of small buildings were erected for offices, with a warehouse below for the storage of the rescued materials. One of the charges against him was that he had used the site of the old garden of the senior inquisitor to raise vegetables and flowers for himself. There is impressiveness in this glimpse of the old officials clinging to the ruins of what had once been so formidable. From this quarrel we learn that the central authority of the Inquisition was the general superintendent of the property of the Inquisition, apparently a subordinate of the collector general de Espolios, to whom the assets were confided by the decree of January 1, 1824. In 1830, this general superintendent was an old inquisitor, Valentin Zorilla, and he had as fiscal another inquisitor, Vicente Alonso de Verdejo. The inquisitor general, Jerónimo Cavillón y Salas, bishop of Tarazona, was still drawing his salary of 71,491 reales, 24 maravedis, and did not die until 1835. Of the Suprema, there were but two survivors, the dean Ethenard, and Cristobal Bencomo, Archbishop of Heraclea, who by 1833 had disappeared, leaving Ethenard alone. There was still a relator, a private secretary of the Inquisitor General, a keeper of the archives, and four minor officials. All these, however, were mere pensioners. The active organization consisted of the superintendent and his fiscal, with a treasurer, and receiver general ad interim, Don Angel Abad, whose accounts for 1830 show that he had received by drafts drawn upon the several tribunals from Valencia, 35,000 reals, from Cordova, 26,000, from Barcelona, 28,000, Granada, 60,000, America, 93,417, from Santiago, 52,000, Murcia, 60,000, Mallorca, 50,000, Saragossa, 84,000, Canaries, 112,635. Logroño, Madrid, Cuenca, and Lerena apparently contributed nothing. The sums credited to America and Canaries were probably old balances. The receipts from prebends must have gone directly to the superintendent, for the decree of final extinction in 1834 shows that they were still held for the benefit of the Inquisition. There were other sources of revenue, principally from censos, of which the most notable was one of the Count of Altimira, from whom was collected in 1830 the sum of 272,000 
335 reals, 25 maravedis, being arrearages that seemed to run back to 1818. He was still hereditary alguazil mayor of the Seville Tribunal, in which capacity he was receiving a yearly salary of 4,411 reals, 26 maravedi. The Duke of Medina Celi, as alguazil mayor of the Madrid Tribunal, was still drawing his yearly stipend of a thousand reals and personally signing monthly receipts. There are scattering entries of payments to officials of various tribunals showing that they were gradually thinning out and refugees from the American inquisitions were kept on the payroll. Such was the moribund condition of the Holy Office on the eve of its extinction. While the Inquisition was thus suspended, the more zealous bishops replaced it with so-called juntas de fe, based on the same principles, with secrecy of procedure and exercising jurisdiction in the external as well as internal forum. No record of the proceedings of these anomalous tribunals seems to have been preserved except in the case of Valencia, where the archbishopric was held by Simon Lopez in reward for his defense of the holy office in the Cortes of Cadiz. Almost his earliest act on assuming his new dignity in 1824 was to issue a pastoral confirming the Junta de Fe established by his predecessor Veremundo Arias and empowering it to receive denunciations. He took the presidency with Dr. Miguel Toranza, the former inquisitor of Valencia, as his colleague, Dr. Juan Bautista Falco as fiscal, and Dr. José Royo as secretary. Thus the old tribunal was revived under another name, and it speedily proved that such juntas were more dangerous than those of the Inquisition, as they were not subject to the supervision and control of the Suprema. A poor schoolmaster of Rizafa, named Cayetano Ripoll, had served in the War of Liberation, and had been carried as a prisoner to France, where he became a pervert. He abandoned Christianity for deism, while at the same time he was a living embodiment of the teachings of Christ, sharing his scanty pittance with the needy and constantly repeating, Do not unto others what you would not have done unto you. He did not seek to propagate his beliefs, but he was denounced to the junta by a beata for not taking his scholars to mass, for not making them kneel to the passing viaticum, and for substituting in his school the ejaculation praise be to God instead of Ave Maria Purissima. He was arrested September 29, 1824, and his trial lasted for nearly two years. The testimony confirmed the denunciation and showed that the only religious instruction which he gave his pupils was the Ten Commandments. During his prolonged trial, he made no complaints. He shared his meager prison fare with his fellow prisoners. He openly avowed his convictions, and the repeated efforts of the theologians to convert him were futile. The sentence bore that the tribunal had consulted with the junta de fe and concluded that he be relaxed as a formal and contumacious heretic, which had been confirmed by the archbishop. There was no hypocritical plea for mercy, and the sala de crimen of the audiencia to which he was handed over gave him no hearing or opportunity for defense. Its function was purely ministerial, and he knew nothing of its action until the sentence was announced to him that within twenty-four hours he was to be hanged and burnt, but the burning might be figurative by painting flames on a barrel in which his body should be thrust into unconsecrated ground. He listened to this with the patient resignation that he had exhibited throughout his trial, and his last words on the gibbet, July 26, 1826, were, I die reconciled to God and man. 
This barbarity scandalized all Europe and proved to be the last execution for heresy in Spain. While it gratified the zealots, who were clamoring for the resurrection of the Inquisition, it displeased Fernando, who caused the Audiencia to be notified that the government recognized no such tribunals as the juntas de fe. In spite of this rebuke, the Episcopal juntas continued to exercise an irregular and irresponsible jurisdiction until the sufferers sought from the Holy See the protection denied to them at home. Pius VIII listened to their prayer, whether from motives of humanity or of establishing in Spain the jurisdiction which the Inquisition had sought so sedulously to exclude, and in a constitution of October 5, 1829, he recited the numerous prayers reaching him from those persecuted in Spain for matters of faith, asking that they might have opportunity of appealing from sentences rendered by archbishops and bishops before being subjected to punishment. To save them from the expenses and delays of appeals to Rome, he empowered the tribunal of the Rota, in the papal nunciature, to hear all appeals in matters of faith, even twice, thrice, four or five times in succession, until three concording sentences should be rendered. Fernando was less sensitive than his predecessors as to papal encroachments, and he gave this the force of law by a royal order of February 6, 1830. End of section 82. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 83 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 9, Chapter 1, Part 15, Conclusion, Decadence, and Extinction. Cristina. The death of Queen Amalia, May 17, 1829, was an abundant source of intrigue, for a fourth marriage of Fernando might prove fruitful and thus destroy the prospects of Don Carlos. The efforts of the Carlists to prevent it were vain, and on December 9th, Fernando married his niece, the Neapolitan princess Maria Cristina de Bourbon, whose sister Carlata was the wife of the Infante Francisco de Paula, the second brother of Fernando. There was soon prospect of an heir to the throne, and the uncertainty as to sex rendered it advisable to determine in advance whether the Salic law excluding females from the succession was in force or not. The ancient Spanish law, as expressed in the Partidas, provided for the succession of a daughter in the absence of sons or of children of a son. Under this, Spain had seen the glorious reign of Isabella the Catholic and the unfortunate one of Juana la Loca, and female succession in default of male children was firmly established in the tradition of the nation until 1713, when Maria Luisa of Savoy persuaded her husband Philip V to effect a change. Much pressure was required to bring this about, but a pragmatica agreed to by the Cortes provided that only in the event of the total default of male representatives should the daughters of the last reigning sovereign succeed according to age, and all laws to the contrary were annulled. In 1784, there was talk of revoking this pragmatica, but it was postponed until after the accession of Carlos IV, when the Cortes of 1789 petitioned for the revival of the law of the partidas. The king assented, but to avoid giving offense to reigning houses, whose possible claims to the succession were thus cut off, it was kept a profound secret, although filed away in the archives. This was the position when Fernando, to assure the succession to a possible daughter, by a pragmatica of March 29, 1830, 
ordered that of 1789 to be published, and commanded the literal observance of the law of the partidas. The proceedings of 1789 were freely denounced as fraudulent by the Carlists. They were confident in the support of 200,000 royalist volunteers, and they regarded the new pragmatica as a reason for more energetic organization. In due time, on October 10th, a girl was born, known to history as Isabel II. Carlos believed that his rights had been sacrificed, and, though he refused to snatch at the scepter during his brother's lifetime, he assured his partisans that he would not permit his niece to mount the throne. Fernando's health was rapidly giving way under repeated attacks of gout, and on September 17, 1832, his life was despaired of. The prospect was most critical. Propositions were made to Carlos about sharing the government, but he declared that conscience and honor would not permit him to abandon rights given to him at his birth by God. In the perplexity of the situation, Calomarde, who for ten years had been the king's most trusted minister, represented to Cristina the terrors of the inevitable civil war and the dangers to herself and her children, for she had recently given birth to a second daughter, Maria Luisa Fernanda. She yielded, Fernando assented, and signed a paper annulling the Pragmatica of 1830, which was read to the assembled ministers on the night of September 18th under the strictest injunctions of secrecy, but it was treacherously divulged, and copies were posted about the court. Cristina's servants commenced packing her effects for departure, and Carlos, in his apartments, was saluted as king. Fernando, however, commenced to rally. Many nobles offered their lives to Cristina and formed an association to defend the claims of Isabel. Carlota, who was in Andalusia, hastened to Madrid, reaching it on the 22nd, and being of a determined character, scolded Cristina and threatened Calomarde. It is even said that she cuffed him in the face when, with ready wit, he quoted Calderon. White hands inflict no disgrace. Fernando agreed to recall the decree when she obtained the original and the copies and destroyed them. This only led the followers of Carlos to prepare to assert his claims by force and there was no time to be lost in organizing a party to resist them. This necessitated a reversal of the policy of the last ten years, identified with Calomarde. In fact, the period was often designated as the Epoca de Calomarde. The ministry was dismissed, Calomarde was banished to his native place, and then was ordered to the citadel of Minorca, but he was concealed in a convent from which he escaped to France. Fernando, on October 6th, signed a decree constituting Cristina regent during his illness. The next day, she issued a general pardon of all political prisoners, and on the 15th, a general amnesty, including the exiles who were allowed to return, the only exceptions being those who, at Seville, had voted to replace the king with a regency, and those who had commanded bodies of troops against him, all of whom Fernando obstinately refused to pardon. This complete reversal of policy led to some premature insurrectionary movements by the Carlists, but they were easily suppressed. The declaration of September 18th had been destroyed, but it had not been invalidated. To effect this in the most impressive manner, an assembly was held on December 31st, of all the great officers of the government, representatives of the grandees, and deputations of the provinces, in which Fernando presented a holograph paper, setting forth that advantage had been taken of his desperate illness to threaten him with civil war and induce him to sign a revocation of the pragmatic sanction of March 29, 1830. Now, Convinced of his inability to alter the immemorial customs of the land, he pronounced the nullity of the declaration which had been snatched from him by surprise. Then he signed and rubricated the paper, 
All present were asked whether they had understood its purport, and the next day, January 1, 1833, the proceedings of the Cortes of 1789 and their confirmation by Carlos IV were published. The next step was the assembling of Cortes to take the oath of allegiance to Isabel, and for this, summons were issued April 4th, appointing June 20th. Carlos was got out of the way by inducing Dom Miguel of Portugal to invite him, but when Fernando desired to remove him still further to Italy, a long and very curious correspondence ensued between the brothers, couched in the most affectionate terms in which Carlos evaded obedience. He was the only absent member of the royal family when the Cortes met, where all, including bishops, grandees, nobles, and the procurators of the cities duly took the oath of allegiance. The whole kingdom followed the example, and the Biscayans under the historic oak of Garnica spontaneously recognized Isabel as the heiress of Biscay. Yet sparks of rebellion manifested themselves in one place after another, and there were symptoms of insubordination in the army, showing that the Carlist organization was at work and was awaiting only the death of Fernando. By the beginning of September, he was scarce more than a living corpse, and on the 29th the end came. The obsequies were held on October 3rd, the leaden coffin having a glass plate through which the face could be seen and verified. The Duke of Alagon, as a captain of the bodyguard, commanded silence, and in a loud voice exclaimed, Senor, Senor, Senor. As there was no reply, he added, since his majesty does not answer, he is truly dead. Despite the leaden coffin, the stench was such that several persons fainted. It might be said that his malignant influence lasted until the grave covered him, or perhaps the truth is more fully expressed by Benito Perez Galdos. That king, who deceived his parents, his masters, his friends, his ministers, his partisans, his enemies, his four wives, his people, his allies, all the world, in fact, deceived also death, who thought to make us happy in delivering us from such a devil, for he left us his brother and his daughter, who kindled a fearful war, and the legacy of misery and scandal is yet unexhausted. End of section 83. Recording by Linda Johnson.